this mic working? Paul, Ryan, are we, are we good? Okay. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, there's some working group. Uh, we have a, I didn't prepare an introductory uh, slide deck today, but just to remind you, we all saw our code of conduct, conduct on the screen yesterday. Be nice. Let's have a nice collegial collaborative uh, discussion today. Uh, share the air. Be constructive in your comments and questions. Um, so we have, uh, let's see, one, two, about five talks before break, and then uh, another five after break. The collection of ocean BGC oriented talks to start us off, and then some uh, sort of climate analysis things, and then we'll wrap up with a couple of uh, model development kind of things uh, right before lunch with some time for discussion at the end. And um, so I think we can go ahead and get started. And Mike, you're up. I get this screen up there. Do you know? Oh, hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, Mike Levy. I'm a software engineer in the oceanography section. I'm going to be talking today about getting it uh, uh, running the normal I've also been getting a lot of help from up here in Gustavo in the oceanography section, as well as uh, Andrew Shao, um, who's at HPE now, but got there by way of GFDL and University of Victoria and um, Environment Canada also. And I found the, the first uh, typo in my slides when I was going through them this morning. I should also acknowledge all the help we've been getting from the GFDL group. So thank you, Alistair, Marshall, and Bob. Um, I'm going to go through a little bit of background in the current state of where things stand um, in, in the marble driver for MOM6. And then I'll, I'll show how we've been like measuring, I guess, the, how, the, the progress we've been making just by doing comparisons with with pop using the marble marble code. If if there's time, uh, hopefully we'll we'll be able to talk a little bit about um, the Mom6 solo driver as well. This is like a, a really neat feature that, that Mom6 provides the ability to run outside of the CSM um, infrastructure and just run at a single column. And we're starting to investigate that. And then I'll tell you all those things again, I guess. All right, so just a, a little bit of, of background. I'm not 100% sure about this first date, but I think around 2011-ish, Lionel announced that POP2 development was, was ending, that they were moving to, to MPAS as, as the ocean model of the future. And so um, the CSM community needed to start thinking about what was going to come next. And this was right after the CCSM4 and CSM1 releases. And I think it was already kind of targeting CSM3 would be, so, so CSM2 would use POP2, even though development was, wasn't going to be coming from Lano anymore.
haven't been doing this. Um, well, I haven't spent the entire four year period on this. I've, I've probably put in about a year of, of work over the last four years. Um, in August of 2020, I, I gave an update at, I guess it was the MOM6 webinar that replaced OMWG when the winter meetings got canceled. And it was an awesome talk. I'm sure you all remember it, so I don't need to, to rehash it. But, but basically, we had Mom, Marble was being built and Mom6 was asking it what tracers were there and it was reading initial condition. And then it was just uh, passively affecting stuff around. It wasn't actually doing anything inside of Marble. So in those last three years, um, I feel like we, Marble is now fully functional. Like um, it's, it's, on, it's not available in the CSM beta tag yet. It's still living on, on a branch. And then I'll get into the next few things I have to do before we, we merge it in. But we're actually calling the Marble code to get pendency terms and surface flexes. Um, Um, and then we're getting all the forcing fields that, that Marble is requesting. And most of those are coming from the CSM mediator. Um, a couple of them are just being, being read in from, from files. Um, and just recently, we've got full support for, for CO2 coupling. So we can, we can set CO2 to a, to a uh, constant. the full thing. Centimeters, grams, and seconds, we want the output units to be, and I guess the, the input units to be, uh, meters, kilograms, and seconds. And this will just make the, the diagnostics a lot cleaner. Like it'd be really confusing if all of the mom native diagnostics are in MKS and then you see like an animal per centimeter cubed in a, in a marble term. Um, I also am like a month behind on the mom six developments. So, so Gusavo's put in a, an updated two thirds degree grid and, and I haven't generated any forcing files for, for that yet. Um, we also have a, a list of things that we know aren't working exactly the way we want them, but but I think it's less urgent to get these in for, for the initial commit. These are things we'll tackle once once the code is available. Um, yeah, so so this is the, the basic setup of, of our comparisons. We, we run 20 years of a, a what we call a G-comp set, so that's the active ocean or ice the, or the forced ocean sea ice run with a, a data atmosphere. Um, we're, we're, Marble is configured to run in the, the 4P2Z mode. If I, th I think Kristen mentioned this at the panel in the morning, and she definitely mentioned it on her poster and at her talk in the, the um, in, in the afternoon session, but, but it's four phytoplankton and, and two zooplankton. Um, and then Keith has put together this, this useful diagnostic package that just looks at time series of, of various global and regional means and integrals. And it compare like it,
I mean, it's, it's been really useful to look at. Then the next step will be to, to take a closer look at spatial distributions. And I, I've got a couple of maps that we next step together. So this is the output that, that Heath's package generates. Um, I just put up um, net primary productivity. Because it's, it's got this cool feature where, where Kristen told me like, oh, we expect these values to be between 45 and 60 petagrams per year. And so that, that is the values on the y-axis. Um, pop is in orange and mom is in blue. And they're not exactly the same because they're not exactly the same model, but they're both in this expected range and, and they're, they're pretty close. And, and really their, their pattern over time, their responses to forcing over time are, are similar. And then on the right, we have the um, contribution 10 PP from Diatom. It'll be fun to, to put up some maps. We, we haven't studied these in, in depth at all. Um, so, so the left is pop and the right is mom. And the top is just surface chlorophyll and the bottom is surface alkalinity. And it, it, look, looking at them, I, I don't know if it shows up on the big screen. Um, mom seems to be like a little bit better resolved and that that's probably a combination of it's a slightly higher resolution. It's two thirds degree versus one degree. And I'm sure that the, the horizontal mixing and all that stuff is completely different between the two models. Um, I did circle a, a few regions where I just noticed differences. And again, we, we haven't looked at this to, to see if this is just differences in, in the physics or if these are things that we should be worried about and try to fix. So just briefly about the single column configuration. Two minutes, right? Um, that into the interface layer of CSM. So mom interface is CSM talking to mom. So now you can check out CSM and build the version of mom that would go into CSM, but in the standalone configuration. And I'm working on a um, single column marble directory where we, we pull forcing from the global model at um, set seven sites that I chose based on the initial tuning of, of the biogeochemistry way back in, in 2002. Um, and this is pretty configurable. And so like we can add additional sites as, as they come up. Um, I, I've heard from collaborators that are interested in looking at stuff on the continental shelf. And I mean, we just need to put in a longitude and longitude and it'll, it'll pull in the forcing we need to run a column there. Um, here's a, a list of some of the things that Obvious question looking at the slide is like, wait, why are you showing SS team salinity? This is supposed to be a talk about marble. And we, we need to get um, restoring for the marble tracers in. We, we've got some drift because this is a, a single column mode and we're just missing that, that global influence. Right, so the music is playing. I'll put that slide up and, and let you read it and take questions. If you're in the room, please use the, the mic back there. Anybody online? Gustavo? Uh, Gustavo is thanking you for giving an awesome talk. <laughs> yes. You can come up here, Gustavo. Thank you so much, Mike. It's amazing what you have done. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what's needed for using marble in a regional configuration, MOM6? Oh, that, that's a good question. I, I know for sure 
that you'll need to use the tools for generating like initial conditions and enforcing files. And it should be pretty easy to map those to regional uh, maps instead of the global map. I I don't know what would be the boundary of the region. Keith, do you, do I, I put the Keith on the spot? No, I, I, I would guess that you'd probably need something at the boundary though, right? Yes, so. but, but I think I think that's the only tool we would need to make that doesn't exist right now. And a quick question. The, um... You quickly showed that the marble overhead over the physics model is about 6x to norm 6. How does that compare to the overhead for pop? Oh, yeah, I actually meant to, to mention that. So I think in pop it's about 3 or 4x. And yeah, I, I hope so. But um, also, I'm not sure. In, in pop, we saved a little bit because we don't call marble in the halo cells. And, and I haven't looked closely at what I've done in mom six like that. See if this works. Oh, is that not what I want to do? Sorry. <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a paper that we published uh, uh, with uh, several people in the room, uh, Nikki and Mike, or co-authors, Matt Long, uh, and, and others. Uh, and um, this was about the immediate and long-lasting impa impacts of Mount Pinatubo eruption on oxygen and carbon inventories. Uh, I don't have time to talk about oxygen, so I'm only gonna focus on the carbon part, but I'm happy to talk about uh, oxygen offline later today. Okay, so the, the big picture question, stepping back, like how do we quantify the ocean carbon sink? We know the ocean is where about 38% of all of, uh, equivalent of all fossil emissions is gone, and integrated over the industrial era, it is where, uh, you know, it's the only net sink for carbon besides the atmosphere. And we know the, uh, the, uh, the if we look on the right hand, that the, the anthropogenic sink is really effectively Henry's Law operating at the global scale. You add carbon to the headspace above the water, Water, it, uh, it invades the ocean, and, but this is set on top of a very vigorous background natural cycle that includes the biological pump and, of course, uh, the ocean circulation is critical here. And so um, the, the ocean uh, community has worked really hard over recent years to disentangle the, the natural and anthropogenic components of the ocean carbon sink. And we've really settled on three different methods with which we can constrain the magnitude of the ocean carbon sink. So we have interior observations and the products derived from them. These are hydrographic sections, such as the one shown here for DIC in the Atlantic. Uh, and this allows us on decadal timescales to give us closure of the global carbon budget and is, of course, critical for validation, critical for the initial conditions that Mike is putting into the model, for example. We also have models. This is a regional model in, that my group is using just as an example, but of course, for the global sink, we'd use a global model. Uh, this gives us air sea fluxes, mechanisms, and allows us to make projections, of course. And then the third thing is uh, surface ocean uh, observations, particularly the partial pressure of CO2. And from these, we can use machine learning to fill in the gaps to uh, extrapolate from about 2% average to 100% to make monthly air sea fluxes. So these are the methods that the ocean carbon cycle community has used to develop a kind of a constraint on the ocean carbon sink. And shown in this plot is just how they agree at the kind of at the current, the current 
Uh, and we can see that for the mean sink, uh, for the period that the interior observations are available, for example, uh, we and the other pr uh, products, the models in the green and the observationally based products in the blue, we have good agreement. So this is a key place where we close the global carbon budget because that's very difficult to do directly, uh, particularly on the land. So the ocean is a really critical anchor to allowing us to say how much went in the atmosphere, how much went in the ocean, how much um, uh, should have gone into the land and um, and to, to balance the global carbon budget. And on top of this, uh, for the two methods that we have time series, the blue, the products, and the high gas models in green, we see a lot of coherence in the variability uh, of, of, uh, of the sink. So we actually have a joint understanding of what the main main um, features of the variability are in the ocean carbon sink. And now we're working on uh, on explaining them and reducing the uncertainty in them. So a key one I want to talk about today is this uh, uptake pulse that occurred in 91, uh, right after the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. And the question you know, we asked in the, in the study we've done here is, how much was this, um, this uptake pulse a forced response to the eruption of Mount Pinatubo? And then also the spatial distribution of that response. And we see this, uh, and also, if we look regionally, very importantly, in one of these observations-based products for using data and machine learning that we've developed in my group, uh, it, this is, gives us 60 years of monthly one-by-one -one air CCO2 fluxes. And if we look on the right-hand side at basin scale anomalies in the flux, we see a lot of coherence in the flux anomalies between the Pacific Ocean and the Southern Ocean, and relatively muted variability occurring in the Atlantic and Indian. And if I put on top of there some key volcanic eruptions, um, El Chichon and Mount Pinatubo in particular, you can see sort of enticingly the idea that there maybe there's some, some relationship between these large uh, eruptions and these uptake pulses by the ocean. And so that's what we're going to uh, pursue here. We're going to ask how much could an externally forced impact of Mount Pinatubo be responsible for these ocean carbon fluxes. And we're going to do this with experiments with the CSM Large Ensemble. So the experiment design here is we took the original CSM lens. We actually had to run it on the new machine to give it uh, the exact uh, agreement uh, with uh, the, um, what we were going to do with, without Pinatubo. We ran it from. Um, we ran it over uh, just the period 90 forward. Uh, and it, for the, to take out Mount Pinatubo, well, luckily we had this uh, relatively simple forcing uh, for our air, volcanic aerosol mass mixing ratio in, in lens that we could simply, uh, that was, that's the blue peak there on the right hand side, that was the default forcing. And so for the no Pinatubo, we simply replaced that aerosol mass mixing ratio with the previous five years to give us, you know, the world as if Mount Pinatubo had not erupted, right. according to CSM. Um, and so what did we find? Uh, this is the CSM minus the no Pinatubo, the average. We had 29 members of each uh, in the ensemble. And these are global mean profiles. And so we see uh, temperature here, oxygen, and DIC, or dissolved inorganic carbon. The stippling, uh, it means that it's not significant at 95% given the, the, the spread of the ensemble. So we see a lot of significant global responses, right? So we see in temperature for uh, about four years, we see a significant response in the upper ocean down to 150 meters, going up to negative 0.2 degrees. Um, and we see also that the, this anomaly actually propagates into the ocean and actually is significant all the way to the end of the simulation, which is at 2025. Um, so there's these interior uh, uh, negative heat flux anomalies actually are uh, persistent uh, through to present in theory. Um, oxygen similarly has this very uh, a uh, strong uptake pulse anomaly that then propagates into the deeper ocean and is persistent. It's sort of a permanent uh, re reduction in the amount of deoxygenation happening in the ocean. And in D DIC, we see uh, an upper ocean um, slightly delayed in time to about year four or so, um, uh, or year, um, uh, the, actually it's the second year afterwards. Um, but we see this strong uptake pulse occurring uh, in uh, DIC, additional carbon in the ocean, it's a little more surface intensified, which I'll show you is in part because it has a strong ectoral Pacific component. Um, and, and so we do see uh, significant perturbations globally. 
If we look at the air sea carbon flux uh, time series here, where the blue is with Pinatubo and the red is without, uh, on the right hand side, we see both of the time series and the individual members. Uh, and on the, on the right, you see the, the difference there of the two, uh, where the bold uh, is uh, the, the, the significant uh, outside the variance. And you can see for uh, at least uh, two or three years after the eruption, we see this strong forced uh, flux anomaly that integrated over the globe adds up to about 0.3 petagrams of carbon per year um, uh, in 92 at its maximum. Uh, and um, and this is this the magnitude of this anomaly is actually basically this quite, quite comparable to what we see in the observations and in the hindcast models. So this suggests what we actually observed in the real world is a, a forced response to uh, the Mount Pinatubo eruption causing a net kind of uh, uptake pulse of carbon into the ocean at about 0.3 petagrams of carbon per year. Okay, so what about the spatial distribution of this response? So this is uh, now the, uh, we're showing here the upper ocean 0 to 250 DIC anomaly. So that's a column integral anomaly. Uh, and again, the stippling means it's not significant. So really only focus on the, uh, the colored parts. Here, red would mean more carbon in the ocean, blue would mean less carbon in the ocean. So we really don't see a significant response in the first year, what we call year zero, which is uh, you know, because the aerosols are sort of spreading and across the globe and it takes a while for the full response to, uh, to, to occur. So really the uh, uh, anomaly starts to become more evident in year one. And there we see the beginning of a forced uh, El Nino that actually begins to become more uh, prominent in the following years, which uh, I, I tried to update the slides, but uh, didn't happen. So <laughs> I can show you the year two and three later if you want. Um, uh, anyway, so we see the beginning of an El Nino in the Equatorial Pacific, which be, which leads to some of the uh, uh, retention of carbon in the ocean uh, it, there in the Equatorial Pacific. And also we see these uptake anomalies in the North Pacific, particularly starting in that year one there uh, and, and it persisting beyond. So we see in the thermocline of the North Pacific in particular, we see this enhanced carbon uh, accumulation occurring. Um, but we do not see a, a significant force response in the Southern Ocean, which was something that we had hypothesized uh, might occur given uh, the, 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 the observation-based products um, such as this one here. So if we look back at this point, uh, we see that uh, the, the response of the ocean of, of a, a, um, more, um, and okay, sorry, I should say, this is the uh, upper ocean uh, DIC content. This is the air sea flux. Now negative is from, uh, is, is going into the ocean. So sorry for the sign convention there that we use. Uh, but uh, here we see more carbon in the ocean uh, after the eruption uh, in the Pacific. Uh, and we also see more carbon in the ocean at that time. But with the CSM, we do not find that there's an external a pattern uh, uh, that suggests an external, uh, strong external response occurring in the Southern Ocean. We really see it northern intensified and in the equatorial Pacific. So uh, whether that is, you know, CSM not doing everything right, that's certainly a possibility, uh, but we, we've tried to uh, play with the forcing a bit and didn't find uh, strong evidence for that. Uh, and so we think that it probably is some sort of an internal response, uh, perhaps kicked off by the tendency to uh, uh, force El Nino occurring in the equatorial Pacific, and then maybe propagation uh, by, by a teleconnection to the Southern Ocean is what we're exploring now. So we're exploring internal variability with this 60-year uh, product that we've developed and physical reanalyses. Okay, well, that's, uh, Frank gave me the, the nod, and those are the conclusions. Uh, happy to talk, to answer your questions. Uh, we find a forced SSD cooling of about 0.2 degrees C, uh, which is consistent with observations, uh, and also this strong ocean heat content anomalies uh, that persist, uh, and a uh, forced increase of the uh, global ocean carbon sink of about 0.3 petagrams of carbon per year, which is consistent with the magnitude of observed anomalies in 92, 93. The interior oxygen is enhanced, and that's a temporary hiatus of the deoxygenation trend. Again, I'm happy to show you those slides uh, later today if you'd like. And regionally, we find the north, northern high latitudes and the eastern equatorial Pacific are really the regions of the largest force response, uh, as opposed to the southern ocean. So that remains um, uh, a, 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 a question. How do we explain the southern ocean component that also seems to be tied with uh, timing-wise with some of these eruptions? Thank you, and I'd be happy to take your questions.
Yeah, we, we looked for that quite a bit, actually. We did a lot of segregation trying to find, uh, yeah, no, we really didn't find any significant response. And we also, the other thing we did that, uh, since I have a moment to say is, we found that the aerosol forcing actually, the, the mass mixing ratio was a bit underestimated with Pinatubo in lens actually, compared to kind of observational reanalysis subsequent. So we actually tried to enhance that to say, what if we'd hit it harder in the lens itself with more aerosols in the Southern Ocean? Uh, and it really also didn't show a significant response, even if we sort of amped up the aerosol uh, map. This is just a time series, I know, but uh, if we enhanced the, um, the, the distribution in the Southern Ocean. So we tried that too, and no, we really didn't find it. Yeah. Well, the CO the CO two is uh, is prescribed, right? So we didn't have a, a C an interactive CO two in this. Uh, it was it was prescribed. Uh, so um, I would think that any uh, we that's a good question. We didn't. Uh, I don't think of I don't think of why that would occur. For example, in the Southern Ocean, but not in the um, in in like only in the Southern Ocean, but not in the Northern Oceans, right? Like we do see this significant thermal enhancement of mixed layers with the cooling of SST, ventilation of the thermocline. Um, uh, yeah, so, so I, I, don't, I don't think of a mechanism, but of course there's always more to look at. And oh, I should say that these runs are available. Um, Mike can tell you where they are. <laughs> and uh, you know, happy to have other people look at other things. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting patterns here uh, to, to look at these, uh, these simulations. Oh yeah, uh, that wasn't even a question when we started this ex this uh, project. Actually, it's amazing how CDR has just uh, exploded in ocean biogeochemistry. Um, you know, we we do see what I've interpreted this sort of um, at about uh, ninety five to ninety six, where we see um, that that with Pinatubo you go in kind of in the opposite direction, right? And that's actually significant. I've interpreted that essentially as in the context of the atmosphere is rising, right? The PCO2 in the atmosphere is rising rapidly, which is the dominant driver of the sink. So essentially, if you take this gulp early on, a big gulp early, you have more DIC in the surface ocean. So you don't need, the, but to meet the atmospheric kind of trend, the delta is reduced, so you have a lesser flux there. So I, but, and I do think that, it, going back to the CDR question, of course, that's on a much smaller scale. Um, any CDR effect that takes extra carbon into the ocean needs to be discounted by the fact that this is reducing the delta PCO2 and reducing the ocean sink going forward. So, you know, exactly how much that discount is, I don't know uh, exactly, but there needs to be a discounting on it because if we drive more in artificially, it means less is going to go in naturally, quote unquote. Yeah. So I guess, uh, are we going to drive here or is Is that working? Yes, can you hear me? Not yet. Um, 
Okay. Okay. Yes. Oh, the external people can hear us? You can't. Okay. Does everyone ever get let's get their laptops out and put their headphones in? <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me now? <laughs> Does it work? Um, does it work now? Okay, I'll start. Okay, my name is Gabriela Negrete Garcia, and in this presentation, I will introduce the size-based um, plankton ecological traits model, which I will refer to as marble spectra throughout the talk. This model is designed to represent a diverse plankton community while remaining computationally tractable and is a critical tool for understanding the processes that shape marine plankton communities, their impact on biogeochemical bio cycles, and the feedbacks between community structure and function. Phytoplankton communities are important since they are the major producers in the ocean, contributing approximately 50% uh, of global primary productivity. They also produce about 50% of the oxygen that we breathe and act as breathing blocks for the marine food web. This figure shows um, the influence that phytoplankton communities have on bottom-up processes such as nutrients, temperature, and light, and their dependence on top-down processes like grazing by zooplankton and higher traffic levels. 
They determine the exchange of carbon from the surface ocean, atmosphere, and ocean depths through key community functions, such as the export of carbon from the ocean surface, the transfer of energy and organic matter to higher traffic levels, and the drawdown of nutrients essential for primate production. Therefore, understanding how the changes in these bottom-up processes affect growth is essential to understand the consequences in marine food web dynamics and elemental cycling. With ongoing environmental change and relatively few observations available about the marine ecosystem, marine plankton models allow us to study changes in the plankton communities that result from changes in the couple system. These are not new, however, and they have varied a lot throughout the years. So there's some um, nutrient phytoplankton zooplankton models that tend to simplify taxonomic trophic and size diversity into three uniform trophic levels. However, when combined into ocean circulation models, they can provide large scale estimates of carbon fluxes, although they lack functional diversity within phytoplankton and zooplankton communities. Intermediate complexity marine ecosystem models are excellent at introducing trade diversity by incorporating several plankton functional types, highlighting the distinct roles of these types of bio, um, in biogeochemical cycles, though they still neglect the finer scale diversity within each functional group. And lastly, there are models that can capture a larger array of phytoplankton trade diversity by including a larger amount of phytoplankton and zooplankton. Yet, these are not easily embedded in global circulation models where they can provide more possible estimates of phytoplankton community dynamics across broader, broader spatio-temporal scales. So here we use the Marine Biogeochemistry Library, which is the biogeochemistry component within CSM2, but we expand the number of phytoplankton and zooplankton types and functional groups using allometric, allometric scaling techniques. Marble spectra uh, in, uh, includes nine phytoplankton groups uh, belonging to four different functional types. There's one picoplankton, one diazotroph. There's four different sizes of mixed phytoplankton, and within them, the, we include implicit calcifiers, and there's three different diatoms of different size. Um, as for zooplankton, there's two microzooplankton and four mesozooplankton, and we're able to expand, um, extend more size classes by using allometric scaling relationships that allow us to scale physiological traits where organism size, such as metabolism, population growth rate, light affinity, um, and many others. For this presentation, I'm only going to show the, the half saturation constants for nutrient uptake that have been shown to be related to cell size, such that this value increases with increasing size. Um, this is because smaller cells have higher rates of nutrient uptake per unit biomass and therefore lower half saturation constants due to their higher surface to volume ratios compared to larger cells. Uh, the only exception is diazotrophs. They are the um, they are tend to not be very good at if, um, if not very efficient on er, in organic nutrient uptake, and they often occur as large colonies where their surface to volume considerations imply higher half saturation constants relatively to smaller phytoplankton um, and diatomic groups. For zooplankton, here I am showing ingestion. Um, ingestion rates are calculated as a function of prey carbon concentrations, where here is the maximum ingestion rates, and they, these decrease with increasing body my, mass, indicating the slowdown in metabolism with increasing body size. The half um, saturation coefficient regulates ingestion efficiency at low biomass and is independent of biomass. So plankton linear mortality represents the basal respiration rate and decreases with biomass. And the zooplankton quadratic mortality increases um, with biomass and represents loss due to unresolved predation by higher trophic levels. Since the largest zooplankton doesn't have its own predators, we increase the quadratic mortality in order to account for that. Um, ingestion rates are also modified by the feeding kernel, which represents the probability of a given predator ingesting prey of a given size. And this probability is represented by a modified Laplace distribution centered at a mean predator to prey size ratio, where that's kind of the optimal uh, size that zooplankton like to feed on. And this probability increases as this ratio increases with larger zooplankton having a wider window. 
So some results here, um, Marble Spectra is able to capture the biography of plankton communities and be consistent with past satellite observed outputs. So here I'm comparing the percent of total chlorophyll uh, contributed by different aggregated size classes of phytoplankton. And this is compared with those from satellite derived size classes from Hirata et al. 2011. And so you can see that the small phytoplankton dominate oligotrophic regions, and that is consistent with Hirata. Medium phytoplankton dominate coastal and productive regions, and large phytoplankton dominate polar regions. Aside from looking at chlorophyll and biomass directly, we can understand the overall dominance of certain phytoplankton size classes by using the slope of the size abundance relationship, which is a general descriptor of community size structure. This relationship between phytoplankton abundance and cell volume follows a power law relationship where N is the cell density, alpha is the intercept, beta is the exponent, and V is the volume. And differences in the intercept represent differences in the abundance, whereas differences in the exponent show changes in the balance of small versus large phytoplankton. So if we see a steeper slope or more negative slope, we see a higher dominance of smaller cells. And then if we see a less negative slope, um, we see a higher, this would represent a higher representation of larger phytoplankton. So we can plot this um, globally, and we can see that mar marble spectra allows us to, to have a general idea of the community size structure. Uh, where oligotrophic regions of the ocean tend to have more negative slopes, which show or represent a higher contribution of smaller cells, which is what we would expect. And then this is compared to polar and coastal regions where the slope is less negative, showing a contribution of larger cells. Additionally, we can compare the, the slope of the size abundance relationship with the PU ratio, which is the fraction of depth integrated NPP exported at sinking particles at 100 meters. And we see a positive relationship between the slope of the size abundance relationship and the export efficiency. And so this is important because it tells us that generally locations that are dominated by smaller phytoplankton tend to have lower export than locations that are dominated by higher phytoplankton. Additionally, we can look at uh, the factors most limiting phytoplankton growth, um, where here I'm showing temperature in blue, iron in orange, phosphate in purple, nitrate in green, and silicate in pink. Um, in the y-axis, I have the different functional groups, and these tend to increase with size in the x-axis. And overall here, you can see that larger phytoplankton tend to be more limited by nutrient concentrations due to their higher half-saturation constants. So this is another ability that marble spectra allows, allows us to look at. And lastly, we can look at the seasonal succession of phytoplankton communities, which is tied to local nutrient delivery, temperature, light availability, and grazing pressure. Here, I'm showing the number of phytoplankton present at each grid cell, calculated by averaging the number of phytoplankton contributing to more than 1% of the total biomass. Um, and we can see that generally there's more phytoplankton present in polar, uh, polar regions than oligotrophic regions. Then we can further look at different regions of the ocean. So here, we can look at the subtropical North Pacific, and we see that picoplankton tend to be dominating most of the year. And so there's a low phytoplankton succession, which could be uh, tied to strong grazing pressure from small microzooplankton and low nutrient delivery. Meanwhile, we can look at another region like the subpolar North Atlantic, this region shows a spring bloom dominated by the small phytoplankton and then the small mixed phytoplankton group, and then a fall bloom with the small diatoms. Here, the balance between high nutrient availability and strong grazing pressure could explain um, larger phytoplankton succession in this region. And so in summary, um, marble spectra can simulate seasonal and regional changes in plankton phenology and succession and their roles in ecosystem functioning and biogeochemical processes. And the incorporation of marble spectra and CSM2 enables mechanistic projections of how phytoplankton communities are responding to seasonal and interannual changes in the environment, as well as how they might respond to future environmental change. Thank you so much.
And sorry, I can't hear either room. But if there are any questions, I'm happy to um, respond to any emails. Oh, cool. I can hear now. Wait, I can't hear anymore. Um, is there? Okay. Hi. Hi, Gabby. Nice to see you. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, like, kind of, what are the what are the next steps with the model? What are you exploring now in terms of uh, like the next science questions you're asking? Because there's obviously so much potential here. Yeah. So I've been using Marble Spectra to look at the Arctic Ocean and look at how phytoplankton communities are changing seasonally and interannually. And I've also actually been able to run this model further, further into the future under three different climate scenarios um, to be able to understand how these phytoplankton communities are also changing under climate change. And all of this um, will be available because there's so many questions that you could be asking um, and it's a re really exciting work. Okay, any other questions? I did see there are some things in a chat, is that? It's just about the sound. Okay, yeah. okay. Okay, we good? Okay, thanks again, Gabby. Thank you so much. Okay, sorry for the... Now, I think. Yeah. Maybe not so much. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Is this you right here? Yes. I want to apologize for the questions, but what I would ask if you guys would like to talk to. They just don't know. They don't understand that this is a big problem and that most of the people here have things in their way. So we need to get the proper support. Sorry, I Okay, I think, are you all set? Uh, screen.
I'll be talking to you about North Atlantic Ocean and CESM low and high resolution simulations compared to observational benchmarks. And I'd like to thank my advisor, Elizabeth Maroon, as well as Steve Yeager for all his help. I'd also like to give a shout out to Jan Eric Tesdell, Graham McKillcrest, and John Crasting as well. So to start, global climate models have long-standing interrelated biases in the North Atlantic. For example, a misplaced Gulf Stream detachment and North Atlantic current, too much or a misplaced deep water formation zones, too much deep water transport at the Labrador Sea, as well as a widespread and AMOC strength. So out of all of these, the misplaced North Atlantic current is probably the most noticeable because of the large effects it has on sea surface temperature. So if we look at the alternative based sea surface height compared to the model based sea surface height from the CESM FOSSE simulation, and we use the sea surface height to back out where the North Atlantic current would be, you can see that in the observations, you have this northwest corner feature that's not present in the model. And because the North Atlantic current separates warmer and saltier subtropical water from colder and fresher subpolar water, uh, any misplacements in the current is going to cause there to be sea surface temperature errors. And that's what we see in the, both the fully coupled and the FOSSE CESM simulations. So then if we look at the high-res FOSSE simulation, you can see that the North Atlantic current pathway is a little bit improved. Um, and you have that northwest corner feature, but it's shifted too far to the east. And so that's why we still see these sea surface temperature errors in the high-res model. And so the goal of this study is to use surface buoyancy force water mass transformation as a method to connect sea surface biases to circulation in both the low-res and high-res CESM. And so what is water mass transformation? Um, I could go on for days about what this is, but I'll start with just it's the amount of water changing from one density to another. And so the way that density is changing is through surface heat and fresh water fluxes. And together, those create a density flux. And so water mass transformation is just the sum of all those density fluxes within a certain density class multiplied by the area of that density class. Um, so an example of this is, say we have this density flux field with the isopycnal outcrops overlaid, and we want to know what the water mass transformation is within this certain density class. So we'll just sum up all the fluxes in that density class and then multiply it by the area of that density class. And if the water mass transformation is positive, that means that density is density class, so a, a heavier density. And that causes cross isopycnal circulation. And so how is water mass transformation connected to overturning circulation? So the natural way to think about overturning circulation is in density coordinates. Uh, water traveling poleward, increasing in density, and then eventually sinking and returning at depth. And so if water mass transformation is just the amount of seawater changing from one density to another, we can say that a returning circulation is roughly equal to water mass transformation. And since water mass transformation is dependent on surface buoyancy forcing from the surface fluxes, we can say that overturning circulation is balanced by surface buoyancy forcing. And so surface biases are connected to biases and overturning circulation through water mass transformation. So if there's any differences in the heat fluxes or freshwater fluxes or the density field, that's going to cause differences in the overturning circulation. And an example of this would be, say we have that North Atlantic current bias, which causes errors in the sea surface temperature and salinity, um, which would then create errors in the density class area and surface heat flux biases, and then that causes biases in the circulation and water mass transformation. Um, but it's kind of a chicken and the egg problem where we don't know if it's a circulation biases causing sea surface biases or if it's sea surface biases causing circulation. So I guess we can just say that they're connected. And also I'd like to thank uh, Jan Eric and Graham and John again for the uh, XWT package. This is what I use to calculate water mass transformation and it's been a huge help in my research. So the questions I'd like to address today are how does low res and high res water mass transformation compare to observation based water mass transformation and how are surface biases connected to water mass transformation biases? So to address these questions, I use model output from the low res and high res fully coupled CESM simulation, as well as the FOSSE, OMIP-1, and OMIP-2 simulations. To calculate the biases, I use HAD-ISST and EN4. And then 
I use the CES uncoupler to produce an observation-based water mass transformation data set. And I'll go over that a little more here. So the observational water mass transformation, I use the CESM ACOM set uh, following the method from Large and Jaeger 2009. And so what the ACOM set is, is we have these sea ice, atmosphere, and ocean and river runoff that are all data models. And then the land, land ice, wave are all sub model components. And if I just force the model with the core V2 forcing or the JRA 55 DO forcing, and couple that with the HAD ISST and sea ice data, I'll get surface fluxes, and then I use those surface fluxes to calculate water mass transformation. So the first question is, how does the low-res versus high-res water mass transformation compare to observational water mass transformation? So I calculate water mass transformation in the subpolar North Atlantic, which is just the sum of these regions here. And uh, on the x-axis, we have the water mass transformation in spear drips and the density class that that transformation is calculated at. And you can see here we have the observed. The J water mass transformation is definitely weaker than the core water mass transformation. And that has to do, uh, to do with the surface heat fluxes. Um, because I use the same salinity and temperature to calculate both the water mass transformation for the core and JRA, they're going to have the same density field. So the only difference between this is going to between the two data sets is going to be due to the surface heat fluxes. And so now looking at the low res CESM simulations compared to the observations, you can see that in the heavier density classes, there is definitely a lot more or a lot stronger water mass transformation than the observed. And an important feature like that I like to point out is this double peak feature that we see in the observations, but we, or we see in the model, but you don't see in the observations. And so now looking at the high res CESM model, you can see that in the heavier density classes, the strength of the water mass transformation definitely matches a lot better. Uh, and then going down into the lighter density classes, in the subtropical region, you can see that the high-res CESM has more water mass transformation in that region. And I'd also like to point out again this, that the high-res model still has that double peak feature that you don't see in the, the observations. And so to get a better understanding of the differences of water mass transformation in the subpolar North Atlantic, it's best to break down water mass transformation into its different regions. We have the Labrador Sea region, Subpolar Dry region, Erminger Sea, Norwegian Sea, and the North Atlantic Current region. And because of time, I'm just going to focus on the Labrador Sea region, but you can see there's obvious differences between the models and the observed water mass transformation in all the different regions. So starting with just the Labrador Sea region, you can see that the observed water mass transformation is a lot weaker and almost close to zero for this region compared to the models. The high res matches the observed a little bit better, but there's still stronger water mass transformation in that region. Um, but that's why we have this double peak feature in the subpolar North Atlantic water mass transformation that we don't see in the observed. So going on to question two, how are surface biases connected to biases in water mass transformation? So if we think back again of how water mass transformation is calculated, it's basically just a function of the surface fluxes and the density field, but surface freshwater flux is definitely a lot weaker or smaller than the heat flux. And so we can basically say that the water mass transformation is just a function of surface heat fluxes in the, the density field. And so again, looking at differences in the Labrador Sea region, I flipped the plot for easier comparison. First, with the density bias, we can see that in this region, there's definitely a heavy density bias, um, except maybe in the historical low-res simulation. So then if you look at the area of the um, isopycnal outcrops or the density class area, um, you can see that in the models, it shifted towards heavier, the peak in areas shifted towards heavier density classes, which makes sense because there is a heavy density bias in that region. And there's also more area um, in the density classes in that region. So then looking at just the surface heat fluxes for the Labrador Sea region, you can see that all the models have a more negative surface heat flux, which means more cooling in that region than the, the observed. I'm just using the JRA here. And the average surface heat flux in the 
the density classes in that region, you can see that the model have uh, more negative uh, surface heat flux in that region, so more cooling. So more cooling plus larger uh, outcrop area or density class area is going to equate to more water mass transformation in that region, which is exactly what we see in the Labrador Sea region. And so to summarize, we have used the CESM ACOM set simulations to create an observation-based water, water mass transformation benchmark. And compared to low res, the high res has better water mass transformation in the lab sea, but has too much water mass transformation in the northern edge of the subtropics. And then errors in both surface density, but mostly surface heat flux lead to water mass transformation errors. And I would also like to mention that this work is part of the MD, an MD of MDTF pod, and there's going to be more observation-based water, water mass transformation testing to come, and eventually these data sets and model ones will be available um, uh, to the community. Okay, how about that? Oh, Justin, here you go. Oh, this button, yeah. Okay, thank you, Toad. It was a uh, very impressive talk. I, I wondered if you had any thoughts why the surface heat fluxes have such a large error. Uh, have you thought of decomposing into the components like the radiative and yeah so this is very tether. preliminary so i haven't had the chance to decompose all of the surface fluxes um, into the different components um, but yeah i i do want to look into that further thank you others yeah i had a quick question about uh time scales yes. i'm not it wasn't clear what what sort of averaging period data yes. you were using and you know, when you run the A comp set to get the observations, presumably you're using like three hourly yeah. data. Whereas with the model, I'm guessing maybe monthly means and whether covariances of outcrop area and fluxes might come in and change the results if you're using higher frequency output, especially for the eddy resolving model. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I forgot to mention that um, for the core forcing, it's six hourly. For the JRA, it's three hourly. Um, and so, yeah, I haven't looked at like how that's going to impact like the variance and everything, um, and what the output looks like compared to the model. Um, but that, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, it seems that you could, you know, decimate the observations to monthly means and redo yeah. the calculation, see what sort of error. Yeah, I do. Oh, yeah, and I do a climatological mean too. This is like a fourteen-year mean of water mass transformation as well. But yeah, the models I'm just using monthly mean. Yeah. More questions in the room? Any show up online? Okay, well, thanks, Deidre. And I think one more talk before the break. Uh, who can? Morning. Um, I'm going to talk about North Atlantic Ocean responses to um, the observed NAO surface heat flux imposing three CMIP6 class uh, climate models. Um, let me first um, acknowledge my uh, collaborators here Johan Ruprik Robert from uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, Arsai Zhao and John Lobson from NCAS, uh, Uni University of Reading, and Steve Yeager from NCAR. Um, so uh, let me first start with the, um, the introduction and the uh, motivation of this study. Uh, so it is well known that the uh, 
there's pronounced uh, decade of variability in the uh, subpolar North Atlantic. Um, so um, this, um, um, yeah, for example, uh, when there's, um, the, 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 there's many hypotheses for uh, to explain uh, this de decade of variability, but leading hypothesis uh, involves uh, the North Atlantic oscillations. For example, there, when there's a, a positive North Atlantic oscilla oscillation, there's a, a strong heat uh, release from the ocean that drives deep water formation, uh, which then enhances the AMOC and Sopola gyre that brings uh, Sopola. Uh, yeah, um, the warm and salty water from the subtropic to uh, subpolar North Atlantic. So um, often the relationship between North Atlantic oscillation and AMOC uh, is measured by correlation or regression. For example, the, um, this plot shows the um, correlation between these two from uh, about 20 uh, four social model, the left panel A, um, and you can see this uh, strong um, robust correlation between these two variable. But while when the same model is using a uh, couple co configuration, then um, the, the relationship between two variable is uh, weak. Then uh, why this uh, relationship relationship is weak in couple uh, models? Uh, it can be um, due to different representation of surface buoyancy, uh, heat fluxes associated with NAO or different efficacy of NAO buoyancy forcing for driving ocean response due to different mean state. For example, this uh, study by Hyo Jung Kim shows the, uh, the relationship between uh, strengths of NAO among link and mean stratification represented by mixed depths. You can see strong um, uh, correlation between uh, these two variable, uh, which is then the, the mean stratification is uh, highly correlated with the surface uh, heat flux over the uh, Sopola North Atlantic. So it's hard to uh, constrain the, uh, the uh, background state of the model, but it is relatively easy to constrain uh, surface, the, uh, the representation of uh, NAO in each model. You can do this by imposing uh, observed NAO heat flux over the Sopola North Atlantic in the uh, ensemble simulation. Then if you take the ensemble average, that would be the uh, response to this forcing. Uh, this technique has been used uh, uh, in study by, for example, uh, Tom Dervers and by me. Um, but uh, that was done only in a single model context. So we're going to do this in the multi-model context. So we, we're going to impose a neo forcing entry uh, climate model that, that will allow for assessing the robust responses and the different differences arising from different background states. So this is the first thing we uh, imposed. Um, this is obtained by regressing ERF5 surface heat flux, heat fluxes onto observed um, NAO index, index station based in, in NAO index. Uh, we're gonna apply two standard deviation of this forcing to this uh, three climate models, ESM2, HM, uh, low rest version, and ECR3P um, over the uh, Sopla North Atlantic for 10 years, winter only, and uh, we have run for additional 10 to 20 years, uh, depending on uh, models, without the forcing. So we have two um, both positive NAO, uh, negative NAO cases. Um, yeah, and the ensemble member depends on model, 20 to 25 members. And we're going to focus on the link between the surface water mass transformation, AMOG and Sopolar North Atlantic Ocean temperature responses, as represented by ensemble mean differences. Uh, so Tedra already uh, gave good introduction to water mass transformation. Uh, so I'm going to use the same uh, formulation. And the uh, freshwater flux uh, response is uh, very small. Um, because we impose uh, heat flux forcing, we can decompose the Q uh, heat surface heat flux into heat flux from coupler uh, and heat flux uh, forcing. And heat flux forcing depends on CI's concentration. Um, so this is this shows the uh, the water mass transformation response uh, over the uh, first uh, 10 year when uh, forcing is applied, uh, integrated over uh, entire Sopala North Atlantic domain, north of 45 north. Um, as you can see, the uh, water mass transformation response take place over a similar density range 
uh, but the amplitude is about twice, uh, more than twice uh, in CSM2 than other two models. In the uh, eastern part of the solar gyre, uh, water mass transformation uh, response takes place uh, in a lighter density. And in the western part, as you can see, uh, uh, much of the total response takes place in the western uh, solar gyre. Um, I want to note that uh, this happens regardless of uh, climatological, climatological water mass uh, transformation country by different location across models. For example, LAPC is dominated by LAPC, uh, no, CSM2 is dominated by LAPC, uh, GC3 is dominated by Armin, um, Armin, I, I for, yeah, forgot, but um, and the uh, water mass transformation response uh, in the Nordic Sea and Arctic Sea is our minor. And um, the yellow line shows the water mass transformation only due to by imposed forcing. And surprisingly, the uh, water mass transformation response directly driven by NAO uh, forcing is uh, small. And this uh, uh, heat flux from coupler itself uh, difference of that is uh, small, which means that water mass transformation response is largely induced by the um, changes in outcropping area. So this is uh, outcropping area uh, difference. As you can see, uh, the, the red line show the solid red line shows the um, the response of uh, outcropping changes in outcropping area in the western um, subpolar gyre. As you can see, this the the response of outcropping area mirrors water mass transformation pattern. And um, the, the bottom uh, panel shows the, um, the spatial map of uh, surface density. So the black contour is the climatological uh, surface density. I'm only showing uh, three contours here, 36.8 to 36.4. And red line shows the um, same density uh, for the positive NAO case, so there's expansion of uh, cropping area, for example, uh, 36.8 from black line to here red. So when this um, uh, outcropping area is uh, expanded, then the, the area is exposed to background surface heat flux, uh, which is stronger in CSM2 than in other two model. That's why we see stronger response. Uh, for the same forcing in CSM2 than other two models. Um, so this schematic kind of uh, summarize what's really happening uh, in response to forcing. So we can imagine uh, Western Sopola, North Atlantic section, uh, south to north, uh, meridional section, where the uh, surface density outcropping sigma one, two under uh, climatological Q. So when uh, forcing is applied, then um, Forcing cools and makes the surface dense, then the uh, isopic node expanded. Um, so the area of the sigma two layer uh, becomes larger than the, this layer exposed to more uh, a, a climatolo climatological surface forcing. And um, this sigma three layer, which is not, um, which does not um, outcropping with under climatological forcing now exposed to uh, yeah, surface uh, climatological surface heat flux. So water mass transformation um, was zero uh, without forcing. Now uh, we have a water mass transformation in this layer. So more uh, exposure to surface cl climatological surface uh, forcing further expands this layer. So there's more expansion of this area. So there's a uh, um, feedback between surface heat flux and the outcropping area. And again, because Q is larger in CSM2, water mass transformation is larger. Um, we further uh, confirm this uh, role of uh, uh, cropping area and surface heat flux by uh, recomputing water mass transformation uh, using um, uh, climatological or surface density flux, uh, which is shown by this green line here. As you can see, much of this total water mass transformation is um, explained by only uh, changes in outcropping area. So now I'm moving on to uh, AMOC uh, response, uh, consistent with uh, water mass transformation response. We can see a spin up of um, 
uh, lower denser AMA uh, limb in the subpolar latitude during the first decade when forcing is applied. Uh, there's not much uh, anomalies uh, going on in the upper limb when, uh, where the water, uh, lighter water is transformed in uh, uh, denser water. Um, and the response uh, anomalies in CSM2 is about twice larger than other uh, two models consist of one, uh, with water mass transformation. And uh, later, um, when the uh, anomaly propagates uh, southward, then you can see the uh, upper limb response. That's because um, the, um, the anomalous dense water at the back southward and accumulate new desired boundary west of uh, mid, mid Atlantic Ridge that generate uh, SSH anomaly through um, uh, start steric effects, then uh, there's a um, SSH gradient um, is placed uh, near the gyre boundary. Um, this is a SSH uh, gradient uh, contour. Uh, the shading here is SSH gradient in each model. Then uh, the, by geostropy, this gradient drive the meridian of flow. The contour shows the uh, upper 500 meter uh, meridian of velocity from each model. Uh, that uh, projects onto the uh, North Atlantic currents in each model. So the anomalous North Atlantic current then bring warm and salty uh, tropical water into the subpolar North Atlantic. This mechanism uh, is consistent with that found by uh, Yeager, uh, Steve Yeager from two papers, 20, 2021, uh, from both low and high res uh, CSM1. So consistent with this response, we see delayed um, uh, warming in the subpolar North, Atl North Atlantic, as you can see uh, from the second decade average here, um, while there is a cooling uh, in the first decade because direct uh, surface cooling by the NAO forcing. And then, um, yeah, this warming uh, penetrate into the Nordic Sea uh, in the later decade that drive the sea ice response. And the, I want to uh, emphasize this, uh, the the, the consistency of the spatial pattern across this model uh, that uh, can be found in the salinity, uh, upper ocean salinity as well. Okay, this is summary. Um, so uh, in response to NAO surface flux forcing identically imposed in three CMIP6 class uh, models, we found consistent mechanism and patterns of um, North Atlantic Ocean response uh, Dense water formation, AMA, K content in the subpolar North Atlantic, but different amplitude of this uh, response. Uh, anomalous dense water formation mainly occurs in the western uh, subpolar North Atlantic, um, and changes in isopical outcropping area and associated exposure to the background surface heat fluxes are the key for the ocean response. Uh, weak response directly driven by the imposed uh, forcing. The uh, different background state, uh, especially surface CFOX, can explain the uh, intermodal amplitude difference and um, the delay subpolar North, North Atlantic warming due to the slow advection of anomalous dense waters and associate adjustment of upper um, AMOC. Before we go to questions, let me correct myself. There is one more talk before the break, so don't run out. <laughs> um, questions in the room? Justin. Yeah, we'll repeat the question. So um, repeat the question, okay. just reflecting so, on the previous talk about the differences in water mass transformation between lower and higher resolution models, do you expect these results to um, carry over to a higher resolution simulation? So I would expect qualitatively similar response because you can see uh, the similar uh, response in, in three models regardless of the mean, different mean state. Um, uh, but I, I would expect dif, dif, the, the amplitude would be different. And actually, we're going to um, test that question. Um, Steve's going to run the high res uh, same uh, experiment 
with CSM, yeah, iOS version. Nice. Uh, quick question. Uh, do you have any hypotheses about what physics differences in the three different models lead to such a much larger response in CESM2? Um, well, I think it's related to um, different background state, but I guess your question is what kind of physics drive um, or what parameterization, what differences in the parameterizations or the resolutions or other aspects of the model configuration lead to, you know, an amplitude of response which is twice as high in CSM2? Um, so the resolution is compatible between these three models, uh, about one degree for all models. Um, yeah, I, did, I don't know whether this, the different background studies related to different physics of the models or um, something else. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a clear question. Okay. Yeah. Um, final talk before the break for real is uh, our former NCAR colleague, Yu Hang Tseng, now at National Taiwan University, who's also going to be talking about AMAC. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. And uh, it's uh, my great pleasure to come back here again after a long pandemic uh, for the last four, three or four years. And this work actually is uh, in collaboration with my uh, postdoc and the students. And I hope to gather some more com uh, comments and feedbacks from, from these meetings. So I just came here. And uh, Actually, ocean is very important comp component, as you all know, in the Earth system model, and particularly all MIP simulation is a very important uh, endorsed uh, MIP within the CMS 6, which can be used to evaluate the systematic bias of the ocean models. And as Susie knows that all 2020's papers actually uh, compares the model compo compares uh, the model performance within several ocean climbing models using the OMI2 simulation. And OMI2 actually is forced by the JIA Google simulation, as all of you, you already know. Yesterday, Gokhan mentioned stress the, the importance of AMAC. And also the last two talks also are related to AMAC. So we know AMAC is so important because it's transport, transport, significant heat from the mid latitude, uh, from the trop, tropic to the mid latitude and high latitude. And in the most reanalysis data recently actually show quite reasonable transport in, in the recent years, except SODA and ORA S4. Both of them actually are showing very weak MR transport compared with other reanalysis data set. However, all of these uh, reanalysis data show quite consistent uh, trend. So they're showing quite uh, in, in decreasing trends after year 2000s and also increasing trends after 2010s. And uh, in the Susino's uh, 2020 papers, they compare the MR transport in only two simulations. Actually, most models actually show non-increasing trends after 2010s. Surprisingly, this is very interesting, except the high comp ocean models. Okay, so this prompt us, motivates to see what happens. In the Susino's uh, papers, they emphasize maybe, maybe, maybe the atmosphere thing has some issues at all. But indeed, this high comes not alone. Okay, it's, it is not the only model showing the, the, the increasing trends during the last 10 years. In uh, my recent work, uh, in, uh, when we published uh, another paper using the OMI-1, comparing OMI-1 OMI and OMI-2 model simulations, we show similar, similar increasing trends after 2010s. And actually, the signals look quite robust within the last three cycles. The third one to five, they are all showing increasing trends in the last 10 years. So, in that work, in that work, we further look at in what happens. 
And uh, so we look furthermore at the, the landmark viability during the last 60 years. And we can see in, in terms of OMID-1 and OMID-2 model simulation, we can see quite uh, dramatic uh, decreasing trends before 1917 and the increasing trends in the 1980 to around like the uh, uh, 1990, and then in uh, around like after 20 years, 2000s, then quite significant dra dra drop of the, the AMAC transport, then the AMAC recover again after the year 2010s. So it seems the, the model can capture the AMAC viability pretty well. So we further intend further can conduct several numerical sensitivity studies, right? By comparing by with increasing the increasing the vertical vertical the mixing vertical mixing particularly uh, we increase the, the VDC turns for salinity at the top thirty meters, can make it ten times larger. So the red lines actually is control simulation, which showing quite good uh, increasing trends, but if we increase the vertical mixings for the top surface layers, the, 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 the AMA transport can actually decrease dramatically within several years. And in that study, we further look at the density and the temperature salinity distribution at certain levels. Indeed, this is, these are the, the, the plus comparing the high, high, higher uh, vertical mixing and comparing higher vertical mixing and the low vertical mixing case. Indeed, in the high vertical mixing case, we can get much uh, fresh, uh, uh, fresher and also much uh, lighter and uh, density distribution. This can be seen from actually the, the, due to the main major difference from the salinities. So in the low vertical mixing case, we, have, we can see the salinity maxima in these areas per compare with here. But uh, the, the salinity maxima actually is absent in the high vertical mixing cases. And it seems the higher vertical mixing cases, it can reduce reduce the, the, the density, so density is, is lighter, and uh, so also the, the Nmax is weakened after this change. So we further think, okay, what may control, control the Nmax variability? So indeed, Gokan actually, and also in the last two, two talks, we, 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 we know that uh, the strength of Nmax is primarily driven by the density flux, surface density flux, by two components, the temperature components and the salinity components. Indeed, for the long-term, long-term salinities, uh, AMAC variabilities we just found is mainly driven by the density components. This is correct, density flux. And the density flux is indeed controlled by this green lines. It's the thermal components as uh, 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 evidence in the last two, two talks also. And the salinity doesn't actually play quite important roles. And so, the, the A mark is, uh, is con controlled by the, the density flux, and density flux is also controlled by thermal, uh, thermal effects. And the recent increase in A mark is primarily controlled by the surface cooling in the high latitudes of North Atlantic. So this is also can be seen by some previous work supporting by some observation data. And so we consider is. Can this be used for other models? So I further use PUP, PUP model results to do the same experiments by reducing the VDC to one tenth of VDC for the top 30 meter salinities. And uh, I reduce the, 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 uh, the, the vertical mixings by using the masking, the masking in a uh, building within the pop models. So for the whole areas of North Atlantic, including, including the Arctic regions and Labrador seas. And indeed, the, actually the AMA can recover successful, successfully by reducing this VDC for that certain regions. Particularly, I separate, I using the masking to separate into the Labrador Sea, North Atlantic and Arctic regions, oh, sorry. And uh, it seems like the Arctic regions actually dominate this change. The big change is controlled by that, but not the Labrador Seas or North Atlantic regions. So 
I further dig into the details of KPP part. And I found this one part in sections within a KPP there are some sensitivity study to, to change, to reduce the background free disease. And so I, I communicate with Gokan what this is. And so I try to reduce the background values okay, from 0 0.17 to a smaller number, so even zero. Indeed, you can see reducing background VDC can has a very similar impact on this. So that implies the surface kind of the surface, uh, uh, oh, sorry, the, the background uh, additive viscosity may play some roles in, the, in changing the AMAX strength. So if we look at the, the horizontal distributions of the density and also the temperature salinity distribution, indeed, if we come, this is the difference comparing with the pop two simulations and the, the lower mixed vertical mixing cases. Indeed, the, the lower the, the lower simulation, lower vertical mixing simulation, we has much heavier than saltier. Okay, so when we compare the difference between pop two and the, the, the low low vertical mixing case is much fresher, fresher and also match uh, 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 lighters. And so in this, in a high uh, higher vertical mix, vertical mixing, okay, the, the um, uh, AMAX strength may be possibly quite weaker. So in general, basically, both team time and pop two may actually show reasonable AMR transport after year 2010. So we can see the recovery if we reduce the vertical mixings. And the particular better AMR variability requires smaller additivity within KPP for Arctic similarities only. And I very want to know that the recent increase in AMAC actually primarily actually control by the surface cooling in the high latitude of all North Atlantic. But the question is, can small additivity really generate accurate Arctic stratification? So I hope maybe we can collaborate with uh, people in NCAR so to work even using MOB MON6 to look at this into uh, to, to details more. Thank you very much. Okay, questions in the room? Um, interesting talk. It was looking a little funny to me that you had to change uh, diffusivity for salinity alone. Yeah. It just makes me wonder. And I think in the beginning you mentioned you changed it only in the top. Few only ways. the top 30 meter. So right, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah, I, from my experiments, I changed to temperature. But temperature actually doesn't have a big impact on the AMAC transport. And uh, also, I changed tr trying to increase uh, and also reduce it through the whole domain. The, the most uh, critical part is the top 30 meters steps. So I don't know if that can give you some hints what happens. Maybe. So my question is, so what you've done is reduce the downward freshwater transport in the top two layers or three layers of the model. Is there a freshwater surface flux bias in the forcing? There is, however, in, in our AMAC simulation, I know we have salinity restoring. I don't know if that mattered because I, I don't know. I really don't know. Right. Yeah. So I also don't know, but that was basically what I was trying to think of is whether you're compensating for a bias at the surface. Maybe it's a question for the room. Could be, could be, could be. Okay, any other questions? I didn't see anything online. Okay, we're a few minutes behind, but let's try to resume at 1030 as scheduled.
Oh yeah, if we could uh, get it in PowerPoint, I think it is. Is this the next one? Yeah, I just pulled it up. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say. Oh, it already got I hid those MIDI controls. You know, the ones that oh, yeah, kept popping right. up. Yeah, you I, did do that. I went ahead and just hit them because I, I kept, like, I move them over to this and they pop right back up. Thank like, you for doing that. I'm just hiding it, yeah. Very much appreciated. <laughs> no problem. All set? All right.
Check one two, check one two, check one two. Check one two, one two, one two, check one two, check, check, check one two, check one two, one two, one two. It sounds horrible. Check one, two, one, two, check. Check one, two, check.
Pauline. So first, we calculate the wind stress between the positive and the negative PDO phase. The difference shows that anomalously southeasterly uh, winds are prevalent along the North East Pacific coast. And then, so here we uh, we we, we uh, investigate the physical mechanism starting from the difference in the surface wind stress. Based on the difference of the surface wind stress, so we calculate the variation of the Ekman pumping uh, in the Northeast Pacific. So the blue part indicates the downward Ekman pumping anomaly compared to the compared to the negative PDO, so the positive PDO. Uh, it can produce this anomalously downward Ekman pumping along the northeast Pacific coast, and this uh, and and it is it will uh, suppress the coastal upwelling, and it can uh, it can reduce the upwelling of the uh, lower cold water, so it can enhancing the rising of the SST, and. and on the other hand, so we want to look at the variation of the surface heat flux uh, as shown in the figure D. So this is a difference in the net surface heat flux between the positive and the negative PDO groups. So the red color indicates the downward net heat flux. The result indicates that during the positive PDO time period, so more heat in the atmosphere, it can observed at the ocean surface along the Northeast Pacific coast which has a positive effect on the increase of the SST. Next, we quantified and compared the impact of the PDO on the on, on marine heat waves. And like these two equations shows here, uh, we first calculated the average of the uh, three metrics for all of the ensemble members. Then we can got the difference between the positive groups with the uh, average one. Then we, next, we can calculate the ratio. Uh, which can uh, represent the effect of the positive and negative PDO on the marine heat waves. The results show that positive PDO, so it can increase the marine heat wave duration, annual frequency and intensity by about 40, uh, 43%, uh, 42% and 10%. And also the negative PDO, so it can decrease, have a different decrease impact on the marine heat wave three metrics here. So here is a short conclusion. So during this study, so we found that during the past decades, marine heat wave along the Northeast Pacific coast has become much more longer, stronger, and more frequent in the positive PDO phase. And this is mainly due to the suppression of the cold coastal upwelling and also the enhanced net surface heat flux. And also we quantified the um, PDO effect on marine heat wave in this region. So the positive PDO, so it can increase the three marine heat wave uh, metrics and the negative PDO, so it have a de decrease effect on that. So all of these results uh, it are uh, accept uh, accepted by the Journal Communication or Set Environment last month. So uh, thanks for your attention. So I would like to answer any questions. Thank you very much for an interesting talk. I think we have time for maybe one quick question. I'm not seeing one online, um, one in the room, so maybe we can get closer to being back on track. Our next talk is John Pasula. Thank you again, Chung Ling, and can you uh, stop sharing the screen? Great, thank you. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, this is work that I've been doing over the past several years with collaborators from NRL. Uh, the work is funded by BOEM, um, and it uh, uh, has the ultimate goal of looking at climate change in the Gulf of Mexico and trying to quantify uh, force changes in the Gulf um, over the next uh, two or three decades. So our time frame here is out to 2050. 
Uh, the broader goal of my talk today, actually, is we have several groups within CGD who are looking at the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this is kind of an initial effort to describe what we've done so far, and then also to start the conversations between the groups uh, to collaborate, because back to the analogy of the, the cat and the dog from yesterday, um, there's a tension between trying to get the fine scale features of the Gulf simulated in a model uh, and also having the uh, computational resources to resolve an ensemble into the future to get the climate change signal. Um, and so there are different ways of doing that. I think we all are taking slightly different approaches to doing that. And uh, these conversations, I think, will really help our science collectively. Uh, so just quickly, like I say, the goal, uh, the goal of our work is to produce the most accurate and detailed simulations possible of the goal. Um, with a modeling that's uh, capable, the design that's capable of taking the CESM2 force response and including that in the model. Uh, so this outlines some of the challenges that we have in doing this. On the left, you can see a high comp simulation, a snapshot that highlights some of the key features of the Gulf that we're trying to reproduce. Uh, and, and these features are actually central to the climate change questions that we're posing. I'll talk about that in a second. But uh, you see the loop current extending into the Gulf here. Um, you know, these strong gradients between the Caribbean, this is the uh, first height, strong gradients between the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. This is highly variable. This is a uh, very chaotic current that stands into the Gulf at some times and it withdraws at other times. Sheds eddies that propagate to the west. The Gulf, of course, has a very warm mixed layer that interacts with tropical cyclones, so it's a key part of uh, rapid intensification of cyclones uh, that hit the uh, uh, both Mexico coastline and the U.S. coastline. Uh, and then there, you know, you have river outflow from the Mississippi, lots of nutrients are carried by that river outflow and you get these dead zones along the uh, uh, U.S. coastline. And, and those are ventilated by eddies that are shed from the loop current. And so you have these interactions of all these fine scale features. Uh, some features aren't even shown in that figure. You have uh, the coastal shelves that extend out um, several hundred kilometers in some cases from the actual coastline and a lot of detailed um, coastal structure and bathymetry in the Gulf. And so how do you resolve those things while uh, projecting an ensemble forward into the 21st century? Uh, computationally, it's very difficult. This is what CESM shows. So we obviously see the scale discrepancy and you know, none of the interesting features that we care about in the Gulf are actually in the, the default resolution of CESM2. Uh, you might ask, well, maybe IHAS can get at some of these features a bit better and it can. But you still have the, the challenge of, of having an ensemble to resolve kind of these transient local features. Um, and you need quite a large ensemble to do that, and we don't yet have that with IHES. Uh, so the science questions of this work are really how will the socioeconomically critical features of the Gulf uh, respond to climate change? We have many different features that we're interested in. Um, and what we've done in this work is create a 125th degree boundary force simulation of the Gulf of Mexico uh, using the HICOM model. Uh, we have a baseline simulation from 94 to 2020 that we're using to evaluate the capabilities of the model. We're not assimilating data in the ocean interior by design. We have to leave that pre-running. Um, and then we're looking at, you know, what kind of variability in teleconnections are suggested by this model. Um, and then ultimately, uh, how does the model respond to climate change? Uh, what we find, at least in this initial work, is that really the detailed features, uh, features of the Gulf are well reproduced um, by HICOM. Uh, we're diagnosing them with the GLORIES data set. So we have the GLORIES reanalysis, 1 12th degree, relatively coarse actually compared to the model, uh, but still actually very, very useful for um, uh, resolving some of the, these features and, um, and longer than some of the, the data sets that we used to assess the Gulf in the past. So I think some new work can come out of the uh, assessment of the Gulf with GLORIES, but then also, of course, the model will be very helpful and some things you can't get from the observation. Um, so we're actually looking at the heat budget in the Gulf of Mexico. In the HICOM simulation, we can assess the transports into the Gulf and out uh, and how they're connected to things like El Nino and the Caribbean low-level jet. And that's really the focus of this paper, but ultimately we're going to uh, climate change experiment. Um, so in the, this is the CESM workshop, and a lot of the background for this work has actually been motivated by CESM and the large ensemble. This is the trend over the altimeter era, so back since 93, of ocean heat content globally um, in the CSM1 large ensemble on the left and the CSM2 large ensemble on the right. And what you see is the Gulf of Mexico is really this hot spot of climate change. Some of the largest increases in upper ocean heat content have occurred 
in the Gulf of Mexico, and of course, this has implications for storms, sea level rise, and uh, ecosystems throughout the Gulf. So certainly, this is a, an area that um, we care about from a global perspective, and from the U.S. Uh, agency perspective, it's really a, uh, a key hotspot. Now, we know we need large ensembles to resolve the force response. You may not appreciate how imperative large ensembles are from a very regional, uh, transient, uh, short-term perspective. So global mean temperatures on the left get a sense, you know, large ensembles are useful to resolve this overall envelope of uh, variability into the future, but maybe not essential, especially if you're looking over a long time period. Um, there's a realm of variability there that it gives you some noise, but it's not obscuring the signal. But if you look at the Gulf of Mexico, and that's the surface temperature of the Gulf of Mexico on the right here, uh, in the context of the overall spread of the ensemble, if you want to characterize a shift in the PDF at any one point, you really need a large ensemble with lots of members. And so when you think back to the IHESP example, now how many members are we going to have of IHESP characterize the shifting PDF over time? It's quite a challenge on these local levels, and even more so if you look at individual areas along the Gulf Coast, like the dead zones uh, off the Mississippi. So that's the challenge that we're faced with. And that's why we're adopting a somewhat different perspective. Um, we're looking at the glories reanalysis for the observations to assess our baseline simulation that's 112 degree monthly data on 50 levels. And that's forced by ERA interim at the surface and assimilating data really throughout the column and at the surface through altimetry. Uh, the model we're using is the HICOM model. We have a free running interior. Um, we're regressing, and I'll discuss the model just, uh, structure in a bit. But uh, it's, it's a regional model. So we're 125th degree, basically in the Gulf of Mexico and a little bit beyond. Uh, we have 12 hourly output, 41 levels, um, and it resolves a lot of these features pretty well. This is the model design. So we have two sets of simulations. We have a baseline simulation from 94 to 2020, and then we have an ensemble of projections. The focus here really is on the baseline, but I show both here and the structure of them because I want to give you a sense as to where we're going with this experiment. Um, we're forced at the boundaries, the lateral boundaries, by global HICOM. Um, eventually, we're going to put the CESM trends on top of that uh, boundary forcing in our projections. Um, we have a free running ocean interior. At the surface, we're using ERA 5 forcing hourly quarter degree. We're relaxing SFP and SFS to see them. And we have river runoff that's specified. And then ultimately, you know, we have the baseline simulation from 94 to 2020, but we want this ensemble out to the future. And at least 10 members would be desirable. Uh, you know, for producing a 20 or 30 member ensemble, this may be the only way computationally to do that um, because it's much less expensive than running a global IHAS or even a nested uh, grid configuration. Uh, so, just quickly to give you a sense of the uh, simulation here and how well we're doing, Flores is on the left at sea level height, and the vectors are the upper ocean current. Uh, you can see the temporal evolution month by month of uh, the loop current, and it sheds these eddies that propagate to the west. And then our high comp simulations on the right. So we have ERA-5 winds that are giving us kind of a strong coherence between the observations and the model. Uh, but we're doing pretty well at simulating many of these features. You know, on a large scale, you have these gradients between the Caribbean and the Gulf. We also have the loop current kind of penetrating into the Gulf, setting the eddies, and they propagate to the west. Um, you also see the Florida current to the uh, east of Florida. And we're getting overall the basic structure right, even individual eddies that are important. So right before Hurricane Katrina, for example, with this eddy that shed, and uh, we resolved that pretty well. That's it. So this is, you know, Katrina passed over this warm poor eddy. The, the high sea level reflects the ocean heat content in the upper 200 meters. And uh, that really led to a rapid intensification of Katrina before it made landfall. So. Overall, without assimilating any data in the interior of the model, we're still getting the basic features uh, that are observed, which is promising. Um, we also kind of can make some sense of this overall chaotic current and what is it shed, the annual cycle to it. And one of the fields I've been finding so far looking at glories and also in HICOM, this is just HICOM here shown. A sea level height on the left, that is upper ocean divergence of the current on the right. Um, just kind of basically, you can see this, this climatological peak around this time of year in the, uh, in the Gulf of the loop current ridge. And you see the currents that go around the ridge, it's, it's quasi geostrophic, so you have this accumulation of mass in the center, this uh, high ridge in, in the uh, uh, loop current area, and the currents that go around it. Associated with that loop current ridge is a uh, convergence of upper ocean currents, 
So there's a secondary circulation implied here where mass is accumulating at the loose current ridge and basically mixing to depth within the gulf and ventilating the lower areas of the gulf. And so a key science question is how is that going to change uh, with climate change? And uh, the fact that we can reproduce what we see in the observations well is promising. The other aspect of this is what teleconnections exist to the, uh, uh, to the energy budget of the gulf. The top uh, 10 series can see the transport through the Yucatan Channel and out the Florida Strait, uh, both sea and mass, and those are strongly connected to NSEX. So during strong El Nino events, you can see a new 2.4 index below. Um, you can see that you have this increase in transport into the Gulf, and then a decrease generally during La Nina. Uh, that's associated with the uh, intensification of the loop current ridge, so the full gradient between the Caribbean and the Gulf itself uh, gets stronger. The current ridge gets stronger, and the currents that surround that get stronger. So that's what you see in the bottom panel here, the meridional velocity uh, being uh, intensified by the influence of ENSO. Uh, I think I'm short on time, so I'll just skip through to my conclusion. Um, so we have this high resolution boundary force simulation. It seems to reproduce what we see in Glorious. Uh, and we get this, you know, these basic features of the Gulf of Mexico well be produced in the simulation. We get the seasonal collapse of the loop current ridge. Um, there are also connections to the Caribbean low level jet that I don't have time to go through right now. These teleconnections are important and certainly part of the story of, of low frequency variability within the Gulf. And then ultimately where we're going is to get a 10 member ensemble um, through 2050 with this modeling configuration. Like I say, it's a lot more efficient to run than a full global IHAS for a nested grid resolution. Um, uh, configuration. So that's going to give us a chance to really produce uh, an ensemble that lets us characterize the shifting PDF uh, under climate change. And that's ultimately where we hope to go with this. There may be some weaknesses. We're not getting the feedback. We're not getting any coupling to the atmosphere. Uh, there's some blind spots in, the, in this approach as well. And, and certainly comparisons between IHAS, uh, the HICOM simulation here, some of these nested regional refinement uh, approaches, I think, would be ultimately very useful in understanding climate change as well. Leave it there. Uh, by the way, we're having a, uh, a lunch afterwards today for people who are working on Gulf of Mexico uh, and climate change issues. So join us, Salvo and some others. Thank you very much. We do have two minutes for questions. Um, if anyone wants to ask one, please come up here. Delta. Yes, so we, we do evaluate salinity. Yeah. Sorry, the, the question was whether we evaluated uh, salinity in our simulation. Uh, and so, yes, we, we do look at the salinity uh, in the model. You get this really you know, broad fresh zone along the North American coast associated with the Mississippi River runoff. Uh, we do fairly well um, at reproducing that. We are relaxing sea surface salinity to observation. I don't consider that to be a very you know, rigorous test of our model uh, at the very surface level. Um, when we go to depth, uh, the observations actually disagree with each other a bit. Um, it's a challenge, but uh, we, we do fairly well um, with salinity overall. Um, we, we do make assumptions using CESM about how Mississippi runoff changes under climate change. We see about a 10% strengthening of the Mississippi for every degree of warming in the climate system. So that's what we're using for our climate. Right. So the, the question was that with IAHS being extended to 10 members, will that be sufficient to nail down climate change signals? Um, the answer is that we don't know. We don't know. I mean, in my mind, we have two major, uh, physically, well, two major things that are going on in the Gulf of climate change. We have a slowdown of the western boundary current in the Atlantic, and that means a slowdown of the loop current flow. So how do the dynamics of the loop current shift as you slow down to, to the overall western boundary current? Uh, we don't know what the answer to that is and how large the signal will be. Ultimately, detecting changes in a large ensemble depends on the signal from noise. 
you probably have a better sense of the noise than you have of the signal at this point for those kind of things. So Bohm wants to know, will changes in the loop current affect ventilation of dead zones? And how will it affect the energy industry off the U.S. coast? Um, so we don't know how large those changes will be, and therefore we don't know how many members we need to resolve them. And that will be uh, uh, you know, one of the science questions itself. Hi, I'm presenting, right? Did you say something? Do you hear me? Am I presenting now? You can see you and you can see your screen. You can see my screen? Should I start or not? I don't know. Okay. So oh, I start then. Uh, hello, everyone. It's uh, 
it's a work uh, devoted devoted to uh, parameterization of mesoscale ladies. So we in this work we uh, try to implement uh, new data driven machine learning parameterization to to realistic ocean model, which is MOM six. It is a combined talk based on works of me, who is Pavel Perijogin and Chen Zhan. And uh, so uh, we uh, we are working with with mesoscale parameterization. Here you can see uh, simulation in MOM6 ocean model at different resolutions. On the left, we have eddy permitting resolution, and on the right, we have high uh, resolution simulation. They are very different in terms of how they represent eddies. And in particular, we are interested in mesoscale eddies, which emerge on the radius of uh, deformation. Uh, given by Rosby, it is 10 to 100 kilometers. And uh, we're interested in improving of uh, representation of resolved uh, mesoscale ladies and parameterizing impact of unresolved mesoscale ladies. And we are working in the gray zone when the grid resolution of the ocean model is approximately equal to the Rosby radius of deformation. Um, at this regime, there are only few numerical points for, for given mesoscale edges, so it's difficult to simulate them on a given computational grid. Uh, another one difficulty with uh, simulation of mesoscale edges comes from the complicated energetics. Uh, so uh, here I show some diagram of how energy uh, flows from the forcing towards the dissipation. Uh, so we believe that the uh, injection of energy from external forcing uh, comes to the reservoir of available potential energy. Uh, then following the forward cascade of available potential energy, it goes to the small scales where near the deformation radius, it, it is converted to kinetic energy and mesoscale a, a disemerge. And uh, after that, they are enlarging uh, due to the inverse uh, energy cascades, cascade process. Uh, the, the simulation of mesoscale edges in a gray zone means that this conversion of, of available to kinetic uh, energy uh, approximately corresponds to a grid resolution and partially unresolved on a numerical grid. And mesoscale uh, parameterization attempts to improve this uh, energetics uh, with two conventional uh, approaches. One is a removal of any potential energy. It, it is given by a buoyancy force and an example of such parameterization is Gent McWilliams. And another one, more new parameterization, it's a, a kinetic energy backscatter. It's devoted to improving the inverse uh, kinetic energy cascade. And we believe that backscatter parameterization should correspond to uh, momentum forcing. So in this work, we are considering momentum forcing. Uh, here, I, I give an equation for, for momentum. And on the right-hand right side, you can see the S term. It is a subgrid momentum forcing. Uh, it is computed, can be computed from a high resolution simulation. Uh, here, uh, the over bar stands for the spatial filtering. Uh, we can diagnose this field and it will be a nonlinear contribution of unresolved edges into the uh, resolved dynamics. And we believe that uh, filtered solution can be represented uh, in a coarse resolution model. Uh, the first parameterization, which is data driven, uh, is um, was proposed in Guiamin Zan work. Uh, it is based on a CM 2.6 uh, global data and the model which maps uh, the resolved velocity fields to a subgrid forcing field uh, is parameterized with a machine learning model, which is uh, CNN. CNN stands for the Convolutional Neural Network. <clears throat> Another one parameterization is based, based on a symbolic regression approach and was diagnosed in Zana Bolton uh, work. Uh, so it's, it was diagnosed in MIT GCM data. Uh, and it is based, symbolic regression means that we want to express our subgrid contribution with some interpretable expression based on algebraic operations, derivatives, and so on. Uh, so we introduce uh, a 
derivatives of velocity gradient field, which is uh, vorticity, sharing, uh, strain, and so on. And uh, based on these quantities, uh, we can propose some algebraic expression for the momentum flux. Uh, the parameterization of subgrid mesoscale eddies, which was discovered in this work, consists of two parts. First, it is a deviatoric stress, uh, which has a zero uh, trace. And another one is hydrostatic stress, which is uh, the trace part of the parameterization. Uh, so this parameterization have a uh, high offline skill. In particular, they are able to predict an instantaneous momentum fluxes due to unresolved mesoscale eddies. It is in contrast to conventional parameterization of mesoscale eddies, which parameterize only mean effect of subgrid eddies. Uh, and uh, another one good point is that due to this prediction of instantaneous snapshots, we also can uh, simulate the mean energetic effect of subgrid edges on the mean flow. In particular, we can uh, simulate the uh, small scale dissipation of kinetic energy and large scale uh, backscattering of kinetic energy. And in this venue, uh, we can improve the uh, balance of kinetic energy in the system. Uh, but uh, this, all, this we know only about offline results, right? When we evaluate the skill on the properly uh, simulated turbulence fields, but now we want to evaluate the online skill uh, in realistic ocean models. Uh, and the model where we implement these two parameterizations uh, is MOM6 ocean model. Uh, we first try in double gyre configuration. So here on the movie, you can see this configuration. It is a, a wind driven uh, flow uh, where energy is dissipated by the bottom drag. Uh, so you can see some snapshots uh, of the flow. Uh, when we uh, implement CNN parameterization, that is, we modify the right-hand side of momentum equation, we see that the uh, the eddy filaments are different compared to the coarse resolution model. And the uh, same is happening when we implement singular regression parameterization. Uh, so here I should say that uh, the turbulent eddies, which we observe in coarse grain simulations, they're too complicated and it is difficult to capture similar eddies on a coarse grid. Uh, but what is important uh, is that we can influence on the mean flow with subgrid parameterizations. Uh, so the mean uh, sea surface height represents gastrophic circulation in the model, and we see that there is large error in this characteristic. In particular, there is a person instant eddy near the uh, boundary. And uh, once we implement CNN model, this uh, circulation is improved and RMSC in sea surface height, it decreases 40%. And uh, for simple regression parameterization, uh, this metric, uh, this RMSC drops more than twice. As a comparison, I also show uh, improvement due to well-known backscatter parameterization, which is uh, Jensen held. And here you can see that uh, symbolic regression has better RMSC. Uh, we uh, compared these parameterizations for, for a range of resolutions from one over two degree to one over eight degree. And uh, we see that for most of the resolutions, uh, both parameterizations are able to improve uh, time averaged uh, sea surface height. Uh, in particular, uh, the symbolic regression model can be used with a single symbolic uh, with, with a single scaling coefficient in front of the parameterization uh, for a range of resolution, and it outperforms a conventional Jensen held parameterization. Uh, current research on in our group is developed to, to try to, to 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 try these parameterizations in more realistic. Uh, configurations. For example, it is a never world two configuration of mom six ocean model. You can uh, see a decent high resolution simulation, which is cross grained to one over four degree model. This is the simulation in one over four degree model without additional momentum parameterization. So it's very different. It is way less energetic. This the color field shows the local kinetic energy. Uh, and then uh, 
this shows what happens when we introduce a single leak regression parameterization. So uh, flow becomes more energetic and uh, the energy is increased in regions where we do expect the, this is a, a southern part of the domain. And uh, also uh, it allows to increase kinetic energy 2.5 times. It's, it's quite large. Uh, and uh, I would like to mention some challenges in implementation of this model. So for CNN, it is of course a Fortran Python barrier. So we do it with for Pi and uh, other method. Uh, also, I would like to say that there, there, there is a need for a posteriori tuning of parameterizations. For CNN, there was tuning of vertical profile with single leak regression. I added some additional filter to improve physical and numerical properties. And finally, there are issues with computational cost because CNN requires GPUs for abordable uh, runtime and for single leak regression, this additional filters can increase runtime. Uh, and so I go to the conclusions. First, we implemented two data-driven mesoscale parameterizations, which are discovered from high-resolution data, and we implement and evaluated it in MOM6 ocean model. Uh, both subgrees parameterizations can improve the mean flow quantified by average sea surface height. Uh, and impact in more realistic configurations, such as never world two is more evident by eye. And uh, finally, parameterizations are adequate for global models like CSM and GFDL. And we will try global runs as soon as possible. And our results can be found in paper, CNN, and some of Yeah, you can see two papers in preparation. Thanks, I'm I ready for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Pavel, thank you very much. Um, I apologize for the technical difficulties, but we could hear you. So thank you for that. Um, I think given our technical difficulties, we should probably just not even attempt to do questions at this point. Not, not because, you know, just because of the technical difficulties. So thank you again. Uh, if you want to stop screen sharing, we're going to move on to the next speaker. Thanks. Which is Helen Berg, are you here? There you are. And Alan's going to talk to us about ocean data simulation. And I'm just going to make sure that everyone all like it here. We do have break in the schedule before lunch. So we'll still make it to lunch on time. You're good to go. Uh, good to go in the room. Can somebody online give us a chat to, to see if you can hear us to the screen? I can't see the chat. I got, I got the chat. Board. Are we heard it? Nobody saying anything. <laughs> Oh, yep. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Helen. I'm a software engineer uh, with the DAS team. Uh, and I'm going to talk about ocean data simulation with DAS. Cool. Uh, just some terminology. Um, DAS is a group of people, and then DAS is the software where we produce. Uh, so there's eight of us at the moment, uh, five scientists, two software engineers, and uh, and a student software engineer working with us. Uh, we're actually hiring another student this fall, um, so if you're interested, come and chat to me. Um, the team are giving various talks in uh, CSM, so uh, check them out for chapters in the breaks. 
Um, and CSM and DAR is a collaborative effort. Um, so we have the CDD team as well, making this happen. Uh, and DAM is the bridge between these two groups. Uh, lightning slide here for ensemble data assimilation. Um, what is it? Uh, we do a bunch of uh, model runs to get a statistical distribution. We have observations um, with associated error. Um, and then we combine those to get an improved estimate of, of what's actually happening. Um, it's used um, real time weather forecasting and it's also used for things like observation system simulation experiments. So if you've got an extremely expensive piece of equipment and you want to deploy it and you want to know where to put it to get the most bang for your buck, uh, you can use ensemble data assimilation. Um, so DART is software for doing ensemble data assimilation. Uh, we work with all sorts of models. Check us out if you can forecast it and you can measure it. You can use DART. Um, so using DART with CESM is not new. Uh, there's a lot of existing work with CSM and DART since forever. Um, right, so CAM2 with DART was a plenary presentation in 2003 at this very workshop. Um, right to the present, um, where we have um, this DART CAM 6 tree analysis product, uh, which is available as a cloud optimized data set uh, for the machine learning folks out there. Um, and happening right now, this week um, is the accelerated scientific discovery project on high resolution ocean deer. Um, so this project's using darts with an 80 member ensemble of POP2 uh, and they're looking at the eddy parameterizing and eddy resolving cases. So this is gnarly. Um, for those not familiar with ASD, uh, there's a group of projects, I think it's about six, uh, that get selected to run on the new machine Duratio. Uh, before anyone else. Uh, so monster projects, uh, brand new machine. So fun, fun, fun. Uh, talk to Ben, who's at the back there, if you're interested in this, or Ian, I guess, as well. Um, and the new stuff, we have a Dart interface for MOM6 uh, in preparation for CSM3. Um, Alper's uh, done a bunch of work on the multi-instance MOM6. Uh, so this is actually available in this tag if you want to play with it. Um, we've got um, a Dart interface for, for Marble get, being worked on this summer. So this is a Cypark student, uh, Robin, who may or may not be online. Um, so Cypox is summer internships in parallel computing. So that's something we have in Sizzle. Um, and it's all about uh, parameter estimation. So they're gonna, they're gonna have a look at how to do that for biogeochemistry with Dart. Um, I'd like to sidestep here a bit and talk about the philosophy of Dart. So in, in data assimilation, you're at the interface between models and observations. Uh, so a design choice in Dart is the separation of observations, physical quantities, and forecast models, right? So observations, what you're measuring, uh, uh, so how you measure is the observation, uh, physical quantities, what you're actually measuring. So it might be something like temperature. Um, and then the forecast model um, is, is what is gonna provide the value of the physical quantity at the location of the observation. So what does this mean? It means you can mix and match models and observations really easily. So if you have a new ocean model, you can take advantage of all the existing forward operators people have done. Um, so switch ocean obs out, pop, mom six, roms, single column marble, full mom six with marble, it doesn't matter, switch them out. Uh, and the other thing you can switch out is the algorithms. So one of the new algorithm developments in Dart is assimilation with bounded quantities. Um, so this is things like ice, right? You can't have negative ice, you can't have negative trace, traces. Um, so I'll just split between these two slides. Um, and the Dart can update the model uh, and respect the bounds, so like the physical bit, um, and the statistical distribution. So this is super cool. Uh, no one else can do this. Um, so if you want to chat to us, Jeff in the back there for more details. Oh, and this is actually, it works with uh, bimodal stuff as well. Um, so there's a lot of work going on with Dart and CSM and various other models. Um, there's a group in KAUST doing ocean biogeochemistry uh, with Dart. MIT DCM on the Red Sea. They use Rocoto to manage their workflows. Um, there's a group in Italy. Uh, they're actually doing real time, I think, with CSM Dart uh, with their own workflow. Uh, there's people exploring Silk. Um, we've got people doing WARF with radiances. Um, and they're writing their own workflows in Python. There's this giant Kilo Cam project, which is super large ensemble. Super large, like a thousand members is the goal. And so they have to be resilient to failures. They have to run model instances separately. They can't use the multi-instance. 
they're kind of optimizing for getting the jobs through the queue, um, storing all the runs in the database so they can restart the fail ones. Um, so it's great, right? There's lots going on, uh, but it, it could be better. You know, everyone's doing their own stuff. And the real time are always going to do their own stuff. Like it's, it's different requirements. Uh, but for science with CESM, uh, we should have like an out of the box assimilation setup. Um, so we want to integrate Dart better with CESM. So people don't have to home grow their workflows. Uh, I'm a software engineer. So I've talked about this from the, you know, the redundancy angle. So setting up your code shouldn't be the hardest part of your science, right? Um, but there's real scientific motivation here. Um, so this is Dan's, Dan's plan. Um, so what we want to do is leverage observational constraints, so improved model development, process representation, and quantify Earth system predictability. So this lines up with NCAR strategic priorities. <clears throat> so um, yeah, like uh, from a community development standpoint, um, we want to build a CSM community around data assimilation. Um, and observational constraints for climate modeling and research. Um, so we've got this collaborative effort going. Um, so we want to leverage like what's in CSM and what's awesome about CSM and this coupled stuff, and this complex processes and DART um, and deliver like a new facility where it's super easy, set up your assimilation, switch on assimilation in whatever component you want, um, multiple laying the groundwork so people can start having a look at strongly coupled DA. Um, so in CES terminology, CESM terminology, we want to have a dark concept. Um, so what's tricky? Like, why hasn't anyone done this? Um, one thing is time. I put this in because I feel like this isn't obvious. And it's, it's a pain. Um, so observations are always real time. Uh, models aren't necessarily right. Like they might not have leap years. Uh, the calendar's different. The base date's different. The time's different. Um, so as the CLM folks say, data assimilation is confronting models with observations. And uh, we use ensembles, right? So it's a, it's a group of model runs. And how many, like what's a big number, what's typical? Um, so for weather and climate, it's typically 80. Um, well, there's people out there, right, such as the, the Kilo Camp folks who'd like to run a thousand, right, which is huge. Um, but maybe that's not huge for single column models, and maybe there's interest there, and a thousand isn't a big number. Uh, there's a guy from Google, um, and they're doing like a giant ensemble with a bunch of VMs. Um, so there's all sorts of stuff to, to think about with the infrastructure. Um, what are we doing with all these ensemble members? Um, so let's say we have an observation here. We want to know what the model thinks the observation should be. Um, we do that for every ensemble member. Um, so we get a distribution of the, the forward operators across the ensemble. Um, and maybe it's not just an ocean ensemble, we've got you know, a similar in atmosphere, land, sea ice, whatever. Um, and this across the ensemble is not typically what a mediator is set up to do. Um, so a mediator, you're thinking about communication between components, um, you know, not com communication between different runs of the model. Although looking at other people's slides, that's what you do afterwards in the analysis. So maybe it would be cooler if the mediator did do that. Um, but yeah, data assimilation across the ensemble. Uh, and it gets worse, right? Uh, so when you assimilate, you localize uh, the impact of observations. So you don't want spurious correlations. You know a measurement in Boulder is not affected by like what's going on in the South Pole. Um, so you localize a bit tight. Uh, for a model, you want physically close, like physically local state close on the machine. So close physically, close in memory. But for data assimilation, you want a load balance. So you want all processes involved in this calculation. So you want to spread physically close to it out as much as possible. Um, so you're, you're fighting each other there. Um, anyway, this is where we are. Um, Alper's got MUM6 multi-instance going. Uh, we've got MUM6 interface for Dart. Uh, currently setting up a Seam interface for Dart. Um, so that is like the mechanic mechanistically you can just set dart up like any other component manage external csm setup uh, the normal way and then switch on your assimilation we have dart scripting at the moment so more workflows um, if you don't want to play with it before this infrastructure is done obviously mom6 is targeted for csm3 and we're a work in progress but it, early users are good for us particularly data assimilation so shoot me an email if you're interested uh, we've also got a wealth treasure trove of existing observations on Cheyenne, on Glade, and Duratio. 
Um, <coughs> and these are ready for ingestion to CESM. Uh, at the moment, people have to do that themselves. So part of this, this building, this seam, uh, data assimilation structure is to just streamline that so people can set up, grab their observations for where they want and get going. Um, so that's going to remove a big, a big roadblock for people. Um, all right, I guess I'll finish up a little bit early. Um, so if I've convinced you that there's some interesting software stuff to do here in data assimilation, reach out. This is my email at the bottom. Uh, Dart will get the whole team if you're thinking about using uh, data assimilation in your research. Um, and most of us are here at the CSM meeting, so it's a super good opportunity to chat. That's all I've got. Easy. <laughs> Thanks for the update. Looking forward to, to using it. Good morning, everybody. I'm Gustavo Marquez, and I'm going to talk about the progress for the CSM the Ocean model, and we'll close together with Elena Hamashakova. So we'll do half of the talk, Elena will do the second half. So this work has been done in collaboration with a lot of people. I'm going to see the names below. There's many others that because the space are not included here. So I'm sorry if your name is not here. I want to acknowledge everyone for, for helping with this. Okay. As Gokan mentioned yesterday briefly, we have come up with new configurations and also revised our workhorse to third degree configuration. So for the workhorse, the, the, the way we revise, we, there was a few details that we would like to correct. For example, shifted the zone of velocity point to be in the equator. Also revised the topography and let's see masking. In particular, we removed any single points within the coastline that are particularly a problem in the sea ice model that she uses a big grid and sea ice was accumulating on these points. So we got rid of those as much as we could and, and it seems like it has improved. Um, we also changed the domain size to optimize the domain decomposition on, on our computers. So as part of, of this task, so this was basically at the end of 2022, beginning of 2023, huge thanks to Frank Bai and Fred Krastusha for, for helping out. We came up with a new two-thirds degree grid and also came up with a set of additional grids, edit per meeting, one quarter resolution, uh, edit resolving 112, and ultra high 132nd. And the way we are envisioning to maintain and distribute these, these grids or you know, configurations is through via yeah, GitHub and um, um, Jupyter Books. So the, these Jupyter Books that are, are being built as we speak is still a work in progress will contain from the grid generation to the, the files that are used for parameterization, et cetera, to, all the way to the observations regraded to that grid for post-processing. So I will spend some time talking about the quarter degree edit per meeting configuration that we put together. There's a lot of details here, I don't expect you to read all, all of this. So the, the important part is we, this is a new domain uh, where it also refers to the gray zone resolving some of the mesoscale, but it's still unclear how much mesoscale parameterization is needed. So there's a whole climate process team devoted to understanding how to represent mesoscale at ease in, in this type of resolution. We um, are using NCAR physics for the vertical, and then for the horizontal, we do have the mixed layer at ease parameterization from Fox Camper et al. However, we started with zero or no mesoscale parameterizations. So this is in, in our control. That's following what uh, GFGL has done in OM4. We do have biharmonic dissipation via Smagorinsky and also some, some background 
again, following what was done in Order 4 at Croft et al. 2019. Uh, so we, ex we to validate or, or test you know, this, this new configuration, we performed a set of forced simulations with the GRA forcing. This is the control I'm showing sea surface velocity. Again, as a reminder, there is no mesoscale parameterization here. If you're used to look at uh, one degree models, you know, the story here is much different. There's a lot of variability. You can see that Agulhas rings are somehow represented. You also see a better representation in the Western boundary currents in Southern Ocean. Um, and um, I'm going to show some other cases where we turn on backscatter schemes. So backscatter schemes that you reinject kinetic energy back into the system with the hope that that will backscatter, will pr propagate backward and, and feed into the, to the system. It, it does, when we add these backscatters, we can, I don't show here the time series, but the, the ocean gets more energetic. We, we can diagnose that. But just looking at the animation here on, on the right compared to the left, so this is a moderate amount of backscatter, I would say. The variability gets stronger. You can see the velocities are larger. But also, like if you pay attention, the loop current was being well represented, or better represented, I should say, in the control where it was shedding eddies. And here, the, the eddy doesn't propagate anymore. So it's indication that we, it, it's still a lot to be learned. Now, the next case, bottom left, this is with a strong backscatter. So it gets even worse, like the, now the, the eddies, even though they're stronger, they also die much quicker. For example, the, the loop current, uh, sorry, the Agulhas current rings, like they, they die much quicker compared to the, the control case. And finally, this last case is we are using backscatter plus GM. And uh, what happens is the, when we add GM, there's the eddy killing effect. So you, you, we don't see, you reduce the variability. Actually, we don't see an increase in, in the total energy in this case. So this, there's a lot to be done here. This is just to kind of advertise that um, too much backscatter only leads to analytic flow. Backscatter per GM leads to this eddy killing. And uh, we have, uh, or Ian will have um, a postdoc coming as part of the CPT on eddy energy and transport working and take over on, on this. So stay tuned for future talks about that. Um, just to talk a little bit more about this quarter degree resolution, I'm showing the winter mean mixed layer depth using the density criteria. Top left is the control. So this is average between years 30 and 35. So you know, normally we run longer to, to do this kind of uh, validations. It's relatively short run. Um, and on the top right is the climatology from the Boyer 2004. So the control has too much convection in the Labrador Sea to begin with. When we turn on the backscatter, you know, things get slightly shifted. So now like you still see a lot of convections in the Labrador Sea also on the tip of, of Greenland, south tip of Greenland, there's some large values as well um, relative to the observations. Um, and this is the, the bottom right is now GM plus backscatter. Seems like we shut off the convection in the Labrador Sea, which is not good. But on the other hand, if you look at the southern hemisphere, convection is better represented, winter mean mixed layer depth is better represented compared to the observations than the other two cases on the left. In terms of global temperature drift, which is something that we are always trying to reduce the, this, uh, the global temperature bias, the top left is the control. And then all the other cases are the different flavors of, of backscatters that we tried. I'm not gonna go into details of all of them. The bottom line is in all cases, we see an overall reduction in, in the temperature bias, which is promising. Changing gears now, talking about regional applications within CSM, we now have two configurations that are running with the same code base as the global model. On the left is the Eastern Tropical Pacific. So this is a one kilometer resolution given by MPAS atmosphere at three kilometers. 
This work has been led by Scott Bachman. We are looking at a surface temperature field. And on the right is the Caribbean Sea and Gulf of Mexico. This is a 112 resolution driven by GRA at the moment, which is a quarter degree. And the goal is to use large ensemble future projections to inform um, how the water properties will change in this region. And this work is being led by Giovanni Seho, which is in the room here in the back. And again, those two configurations are examples of actionable science applications that we can now do with CSN NOM6. Um, we also have the option to run standalone NOM6 simulations, and Mike talked about this in the morning. So these, the, there were a few people that expressed interest in running ocean only simulations within our you know, NCAL computers, and they were not super familiar on, on how to get set up. And Mike put this together so we can now, if you download CSM with MOM6 as part of it, you can run ocean only configurations through using CSM infrastructure. So it will really facilitate to users, you know, if, if you're interested in these idealized experiments. We've added 21 examples at the moment. I'm losing some of them on the right. You can go and check it out on the, on the page if you want. But we are happy to add more. With the exception is if, if there's data that needs to be like NCDF files that are needed, it will become um, more complicated. But a lot of these examples do not require any uh, data sets to, to be run. And now I'm going to switch to Elena. All right. Um, so changing gears a little bit, um, this is more on the diagnostic side of things. So I've been working on developing a new diagnostics workflow uh, for MOM6 primarily, but also applicable to any other CSM components. Um, so the goals of this new workflow are that it's based on Jupyter notebooks. Uh, the goal of that is to make them easily shareable and annotatable since you can add explanatory text. And we also wanna be able to support running Python scripts as diagnostics so that things are more easily back compatible. Uh, we want this framework to be flexible, so you can either run it out of the box in a set configuration or customize it to whatever particular analyses you're interested in. We want it to be catalog friendly so that you can uh, access data more simply without digging around in a bunch of tabs. And we want multiple options for computational resources so you can be running it through different machines. Uh, the package, the working net title is NBSquid, which stands for Notebook Based Super Customizable Infrastructure for Diagnostics. And it's currently live on GitHub, so you can mess around with it if you want. I'll provide some links at the end. So the way that this workflow looks is the inputs are parameters and data catalog or multiple data catalog that live in a single config.yaml file. Parameters that you might be passing into diagnostics include things like what dates you want to run some calculation on, what latitude you want to calculate something at, what variable you're plotting, etc. Those get passed into um, a set of Jupyter notebooks, which you can uh, execute automatically. I just have a couple examples of different things that you might be calculating as diagnostics there. So those all get run automatically by my infrastructure. And um, the final step of the process is you can render all of those as a Jupyter book, which is a rendered HTML version of notebooks that just creates a bunch of static HTML files that you can share with somebody or even host online so that you can send somebody a quick link to the diagnostics for whatever run that you just did. Uh, so how this compares to how we've previously been doing MOM6 diagnostics, um, the way that mostly Gustavo developed. Um, in the current workflow, the diagnostic functions live in uh, the MOM6 tools GitHub repo. Uh, that creates a series of Python scripts that are configured by a YAML file where you're putting in like paths, case route, that sort of thing and get submitted via bash script through QSub, which is a workflow that most of you guys are probably familiar with. Um, that creates output net CDF files that get displayed through notebooks um, that live in the MOM6 solutions repo. So what I'm currently working on, um, along with Gustavo and a number of other people, is converting those that diagnostic code to be compatible with this workflow so that we have a more flexible workflow to work with. This is an example of what one of those Jupyter books might look like with just a couple of mom sex diagnostics that I've been playing with. Um, so along the left here, you have um, 
a list of what diagnostics have been run. I was just experimenting with a couple of them. Um, have an example of a plot in the middle and on the right, all of the different things that are in that particular notebook. So with these, you can parameterize cells, you can change what's going on in them automatically, and you can add um, lots of explanatory text so that anybody you're sharing the diagnostics with knows what's going on. Um, so yeah, these are the links to all of the materials about this. Most of them are currently works in progress, but you're welcome to check them out. And um, I'm going to be giving a more in-depth talk about uh, this on the technical side of things in the software engineering working group tomorrow. So come to that if you'd like. So you're running these quarter degree without any ready uh, in there. And there's nothing on the right hand side of the uh, tracer equations. So what advection scheme are you using? And is it too diffusive? We are using a, is a product, quasi total order PPM. This wise parabolic method. Uh, so it's uh, diffusive, yeah. The hope is that when you add energy via backscatter, that and the, by resolving that in the transport, you will improve the, the tracer distribution. But after I presented this at the CPT in a meeting a month or so ago, it was discussed that we, we need to start thinking about ready as well in these simulations. So we will probably, so a, a group within the CPG will probably try with ready as well. So are there any other options for the advection schemes in MOM6? For Tracer, yes. There are a few other ones, even a higher order. I think it's um, um, not, there's even like a fifth order one. Uh, I'm not sure like this, if it's ready to be in, in production. Um, so the short answer is there's many options for tracer advection scheme. The momentum, my understanding is that we have only one at the moment. I'll, I'll also can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, it's thumbs up. So yeah. General discussion. Uh, so the meeting, this session adjourns at 12.15. We have 20 minutes if we have something to talk about. Just uh, sort of set the, maybe the stage for some discussion. As, as Gokhan mentioned, we're sort of targeting a, uh, you know, a complete but not final CESM3 release about a little more than a year from now, late summer 24. Um, you can see we're, we're converging to something that looks really exciting in a number of dimensions um, with the ocean component and the coupled simulations we're achieving with MOM6. I think we're really um, in a pretty good place in terms of where we are. Um, but our working group and our section, the oceanography section in particular, um, is going to be a real challenge for us over the next year because the retirements and departures, we're working with a very depleted workforce um, and we're spread very thin. And as you can see, you know, in order to keep pace with the CPT, we're working in this eddy permitting regime, we're trying to get the workhorse model going, we're trying to get the PGC going. So it's, it's, you know, I'm just putting it out there. That's going to be very challenging for us to, uh, 
you know, keep pace in all those dimensions over the next year. Um, so we're gonna have to make choices about what we prioritize. Um, people are very stressed right now. We can't maintain this level of stress in our workforce any longer. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think we have a little bit of, um, you know, it's a challenge in itself, but the, the sort of model, development model that GOCON presented the other day where we, you know, we work intensively in a component model, uh, the different component models working intensively, not just in their own component, but doing coupled runs focused on their component and then come together every four or six months or something like that gives us some space to sort of pace our, our workhorse model development. I think there are a couple of things that we've had on our menu for a long time now that we really want to finish getting in, like the EBM, vertically varying ready, a couple of those things that we sort of see a path to get those finished in the, in the coming year. And my hope is that that will give us a, you know, a, a non -eddy, a eddy parameterized workhorse model that will be as good or better than pop, but maybe not as good as we, we think we can make it. And certainly, you know, we, we're ne it's never as good as we think we can make it. But anyway, um, but at the same time, you know, this, uh, the gray zone is an exciting area and, and gives us the opportunity to look at things where we have seen um, very promising results when we go to 10th degree, you know, can we achieve some of those aspects of ocean atmosphere interaction and variability in that, those processes that are captured in the 10th degree model at a lower cost and be able to represent those modes of variability. So those, I think those two places are where we're really gonna emphasize our efforts with the resources we have we do have these other, you know, even higher resolution cases. We may do some proof of concepts, you know, with basically running the 12th degree, this more or less the same sort of parameterizations we used in the 10th degree pop, see what those, the quality of those solutions look like. We are still keeping both the Z star and hybrid vertical coordinates in play. Um, I think everything that Gustavo just showed at quarter degree has been Z star um, and the two thirds you know, we, we do see in terms of mean bias, we're still seeing better performance in the hybrid cases. Um, and that, um, but there's additional degrees of freedom that can go off the rails there. So um, it's gonna be an intensive year, but um, we have to pace ourselves. And um, I think that's sort of the summary where I see us as a working group and as a section. Um, so um, open it up for any comments questions, um, encouragement, <laughs> sympathy, whatever. Freezing over the Labrador Sea. <laughs> yeah, we just started, started rerunning the fully couple simulations a few weeks ago. The, the first try, um, there was the the TOA imbalance was really large in the model first, relatively quick. And then on the second try, there was a bug in, in the coupler where shore wave was not being passed to the ocean. So that froze even quicker. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where we are right now. And we, we might start a new run um, over the coming weeks or so. So the, the atmosphere component is, is doing most of the work at this time to retune TOA in F cases. And um, the hope is like within a week or so, we will then do an X for the couple simulation. Frank, do you think that it's necessary to have the estuary box model in there to try and help this uh, problem? The question was whether we thought it was necessary to have the EBM in the model to get past this. And 
it probably helped a little bit in pop um, with the same sort of bias. So um, whether we get the full EBM in or just do something a little more ad hoc where we mix riverine fresh water deeper into the water column um, remains to be seen. The, the latter is the easier thing to implement. We might try that first rather than having the full blown exchange flow representation. My plan was when I can find some time to do development work myself, was actually use Giovanni's uh, Caribbean Gulf of Mexico configuration for developing the EBM and MOM6, uh, testing it on the Amazon outflow. So that's that was my plan. I do want to get it in. I sort of see the path to put it in. Um, it is a completely different implementation than it was in POP because we have a natural boundary condition on fresh water versus salt, a virtual salt box. Other questions, comments? All right. Well, thanks, everyone. And then we'll see you at the, the winter working group meeting. And we'll see if lunch is ready.
putting it into cheesecake here. Almost there, folks. He has this presentation in a different folder for you in the future. Do you see her? Number one, we know. Make sure that there we go. Thanks everyone, thanks for your patience. Welcome to Earth System Prediction Working Group. Um, I'm gonna give a very brief update on behalf of fellow co-chairs, Yaga Richter and Kathy Pejon. Um, um, first, just a reminder to um, be respectful during our session today. And here's uh, an overview of the agenda, if you haven't seen it yet. Um, we have 20 minute talks, so pretty leisurely pace, hopefully. Uh, four talks before the break and then five after. We've got about 10 minutes at the end for open discussion. Um, so it's not a whole lot of time, but I'm hoping that uh, we can uh, interact during the break and after the session uh, for, um, for further discussion. Um, the main topic, of discussion is going to be um, runs, uh, simulations that we need to, to complete this year uh, as part of our uh, working group allocation. Before we get there, I just want to highlight we also have a couple posters. They're both still up there on the second floor, one from Mary Beth Arcodia and another from Kevin Rader. So check those out. And, and so this is um, <clears throat> something that we can discuss maybe after all the talks. We've, we've got an allocation and we've used um, a pretty small percentage of our year one allocation at this point. We were given 22 million core hours on Cheyenne. Uh, we've used uh, roughly four and a half million at this point. Um, we wrote up uh, the, in the in the CSL proposal, a number of uh, development and production experiments. Um, we can go through these. Uh, I think some of the, the big expensive experiments that we're still planning to complete in year one are uh, the P6, which is the extension of the CSM2 decadal prediction uh, ensemble. So we currently have a 10 member ensemble. We're planning to increase that to 15. So that will um, eat up about 8 million core hours to complete that. And then P7, which is um, the Clavar Tropical Basin Interaction uh, Pacemaker, uh, Hindcast pa Pacemaker Experiments. Um, I presented on that in the Winter Working Group, and so we're planning to uh, kind of push forward with those, uh, uh, restoring the SSTs in, in different basins, uh, and that will um, cost about 4 million core hours. So um, if, we, if we manage to do all that, then we, we'll, uh, 
largely um, use up all of our production. Um, but I guess this is just an advertisement that if you have an idea and you would like to use the ESP working group allocation to, uh, to run an experiment, please come and talk to us. We, we can probably accommodate you. And with that, um, let's get straight to the talk. So the first speaker is Aaron Towler. And how do I switch? Can you show me? All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining. My name is Erin Towler. Um, here talking a little bit about seasonal predictability of weather type frequencies over the contiguous US. And I do want to acknowledge some of my collaborators listed here. Um, so I guess the question that we're asking, uh, just to actually recast the title, is how well do seasonal forecast models predict some of these large-scale weather patterns over the contiguous United States. And I'm not the only person thinking about this. Just to put this into a little bit of context, we don't have, um, this isn't a really long talk, so I can't go too much into the literature. Um, but you might be familiar with recent work by Marina, Maria Molina, who looked at sub-seasonal predictability. She looked at four northern hemisphere weather regimes using the CESM2 weekly hindcasts from uh, the Richter et al. paper. And then similarly, um, or not, or in another study that is related to this, Steve Yeager um, provided this broad overview of the prediction skill for the CESM2. This was the different, this was the, um, with the lead times ranging from one month to two years. And it's this latter that us, that I'm going to be looking at uh, in detail today. Um, so for this project, we identified some recurring large scale atmospheric patterns, which we call weather types. Um, these are identified using a clustering approach. Um, this is from a paper by Andy Prine, who identified these 12 different weather type patterns over the contiguous US based on these three large scale variables, sea level pressure, precipitable water, and winds. Um, I won't go too much into them, but just to give you a, a sense, here's two different weather types. This is what's called weather type six, weather type seven in this paper. Um, and these are associated with um, precipitation. And you can just see this. That's an anomaly map for precipitation there, just to give you a sense, even though these clustering algorithms are based, based on these large scale predictors, they're also associated with precipitation, which is what we care about often in society, right? So um, what we did in this project is we reproduced those historical CONUS weather types. Those were used with ERA-5, so we just reproduced them using ERA interim. Um, and again, this is just to show you these were developed um, by Mingi, also here at NCAR, who uh, these are just the, again, those precipitation maps that are associated with the um, ERA interim. So in the second step, we applied the same weather type clustering algorithm, but this time to the seasonal hindcasts. We used two different data sets. We used the ECMWF, um, the European Center. This is their IFS version 5 that we downloaded from the Cop Copernicus Climate Change Service. And then, of interest to this group, we use the SMILE data set um, from detailed in Steve's paper, uh, the seasonal to multi-year large ensemble using the CESM2. So again, we had to find some overlapping periods. We were able to do this on 1993 to 2019. So it was about 26 years, and we did each season. Um, and then again, just to kind of think us through, for each of the models, we, went, use, we used the ensemble average um, and we assigned the days to each weather type category for both SMILE and ECMWF. And again, this is just an example of the precipitation maps that were associated with it from SMILE. Um, so now, what we wanted to do to understand the predictability is we wanted to do some verification. Um, so for this, we looked at the frequencies. We focused on the lead one forecast. Um, this is similar to what Steve did in his paper where, so for example, what I call a lead one forecast is if it's issued in November, it's for the December, January, February time frame. Um, and so here is one of the results. So this is the result for December, January, February. So this is over the season for each model. Um, the red bar is the ERA interim. The green bar is the ECMWF and the blue bar is the SMILE. And this is predicting the 
average number of days so over the 26 year period. So we can look at one at a time here. Um, so for example, weather type one is the most common in ERA interim. And you can see that both SMILE and ECMWF under predicting it a little bit. Um, or again, if you look at weather type four, you can see that SMILE and ECMWF are overestimating the frequency. And so on, again, we could look at all of them, weather type 11, ECMWF is doing a little very similarly and SMILE's maybe over predicting a little bit. Um, similarly, we can look at summer. So this is June, July, August. So this is issued in May. And we can see that neither forecast model is doing all that well. Um, for example, if you look at weather type 12, which is the most frequent, um, we're not, you know, both models are under predicting it. Um, so that was looking at average number predicted over the 26 years. We can also look at it year to year. So the colors are the same in this. The red is the, the ERA interim. The green is the ECMWF and the blue is the SMILE. So now each, the box plots are comprised of each 20, of the 26 years. So 26 values go into each of the box plots. Um, and I think what we see is, you know, we get a very similar pattern, right, for weather type one, for example, the median is being underestimated, but we're also seeing that we're having, a, the box plots are more narrow, which means they're underestimating the variability, that year to year variability. Um, again, we're using the ensemble average for these, so that could be part of the reason um, in this particular result. So if folks have other thoughts on that, happy to talk about it. Um, but this is sort of the result and similar for, um, this is the June, July, August. So in this, we're sort of eyeballing it, right? We're, I'm saying to you, oh, these look pretty good. This one looks, you know, it's pretty similar. It's a little bigger. Um, well, what I wanted to do is I wanted to do this, you know, we, there's lots of different evaluation metrics that you can identify, but um, we wanted to look at the frequency of the weather patterns that were predicted. And uh, luckily here, if you guys know Eric Gilliland, I got to chat with him and he said, oh, I have this great statistic for you. And it's called the power divergence statistic. And basically what it does is it tells you if your um, distribution of ob observed and expected frequencies are from statistically from the same distribution or if they can be um, statistically determined to be from different distributions. And so this is the equation. Equations I know are hard to look at in presentations, but I'll take you through it and it'll be painless, I promise. Um, so we have a user selected parameter, that's the lambda. We have a number of categories, these are K. So let's say we had all 12 categories, we would have K equal 12. I think you saw for summer there are only four categories, so you know it can change with the season. Then we just have the number of days observed and the number of days forecasted. And basically we want this to be as close to zero as possible. Um, so in this case, they would say that the frequencies match perfectly, and the bigger scores are worse. Um, and again, if we want to put this into a statistically rigorous framework, what we do is we can compare it with the test statistic from the chi-square distribution. And so again, we would have a value for that for the particular degrees of freedom. In this case, it would be 11. Um, and also we can, we can vary lambda, and we've done all that, but I'm not gonna show that to you today. We're just gonna show you results from lambda being equal to one. So using this statistic, we can go ahead and verify, um, again, first, if you remember, I showed you two. One was the results for the average number of days in each weather type. For this, we'll calculate a single power divergence statistic, which looks like this. So you can see the, the gold line across, that's that test statistic. We want it to be below this. If, it's, if our value is below this, it means that the frequencies are not different um, statistically in terms of this chi-square distribution. Um, you can see both of them are below it. So, so again, for the average number of years, this is one metric that would tell you that the frequency distributions are not different between the observed and expected. That means it's good. Um, and again, we can look at this for June, July, August. Um, so December, January, February is what I just showed you. And now for June, July, August, now we can see they're both above the line, right? So this is bad, right? We want them to both be below the line um, to be statistically similar. We can do the same thing for the, um, the year to year variability where we saw um, the number of days predicted per year in the 26, day, 26 years. Um, again, now we can see this, so now we get a power divergence statistic for every year. So now the power divergence statistic is also a box plot and again, we want them all to be under, and you can see it's about 50% of the time it's under. So again, maybe a bit of a coin toss. So 50% of the time uh, our distribution is different, and 50% of the time our distribution would be statistically the same as what has been observed. So again, the year-to-year -year variability is clearly a little bit harder to get. 
Um, if we compare it to the June, July, August, now the median is always over that test statistic line, which is, again, not as, not as good. Um, so one of the things that we did for this, um, you know, when we started, we had those weather types set. I showed you the paper that Andreas had developed. But we said, well, what if, could we develop a more targeted approach? You know, here we're looking at weather types for the entire CONUS, all days of the year. Um, you know, can we, can we do this more targeted and will we get more predictability? Um, and so, again, in another project that I'm working on, this is for the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, we developed what specifically for the U.S. Southwest. So again, before we're whole CONUS, now we're zooming in, um, taking a look at how scale affects this. Um, and we looked for the summer or warm season. So again, you can see now, uh, I've zoomed into the Southwest of the United States. Uh, we're looking at Arizona West, Arizona East, New Mexico North, and New Mexico South. Those are color coded there. Um, and you can see this is just the precipitation for those different seasons, uh, or across the, the warm season, that's the monsoon season. season. Just to show you this is a, a time of year that matters for these areas, that's why we did it. Um, again, for each one, now we also have weather types. I showed you those original ones. Now we have weather types for each of those regions, and there's only three, remember there used to be 12. Now when we start a little more targeted, we look at a particular season, now we're just getting three. Um, that's the monsoon one, for example, again, the one we care about. I'm not going to go into the details of these. Um, so again, we can go through the same exercise, right? So now I'm going to just show you results for the Arizona West, but all the regions are pretty similar. So now we're looking at that June, July, August season that we didn't do well at with the CONUS. Um, so now we can see, I would say again, when we're eyeballing things, for the average number of years predicted, both models are doing really well. Um, which I think is encouraging for a, su a summer prediction. Um, and again, you can see both test statistics are below the line. I know that line is hard, but trust me, they're both below the threshold, and that's actually true for all four of the regions. And in this case, smiles consistently lower than ECMW, but both are good. And uh, again, we can do the year by year. Like now we're looking at the year to year variability. Again, you can see there's maybe a slight underestimation of variability again for each of the different weather types, but maybe not as bad as for the CONUS, except for uh, like dry looks maybe a little bit more similar in terms of variability, but the other ones are maybe a little bit too narrow. So again, similar results for the variability. Um, and again, we can look at that power divergence statistic. Um, so now we're more on par with what the, June, the, the winter predictability was for the CONUS. Um, but again, we're still just running at that 50%. Um, I'm, I, I wanted to say we picked this power divergence statistic, but I wanted to point out that um, I've been lucky to be part of these recent stakeholder workshops. These are um, talking about co-producing some usable S2S forecasts. There's two nice papers that are out. So um, this is something that, and there was just a third that I was able to participate in to try and think about how these can be verified in a way that is maybe a bit more fit for purpose. I don't know if stakeholders will understand power divergence statistic besides it's this is good, this is bad. Um, so anyway, this is just some food for thought and a little advertisement for a couple of these papers as we're thinking through this. Um, and this brings me to kind of the end. Um, I wanted to, you know, I think that SMILE is really on par with the ECMWF, which is an operational product. Um, I think the other thing that we found from this is that the CONUS-wide weather types um, work for the winter, but we really need this more targeted approach for the summer. Um, again, the low variability maybe is because we're taking the ensemble average and models are often also under dispersive. Um, a couple next steps, like I said, we're, we're thinking through some ways to improve the usability of this. The folks I'm working with in the Southwest US, it's the U US Bureau of Reclamation, you know, so they have some ideas. Uh, and this is, again, this is a real applied project in, for, for that particular um, application in the Southwest. Uh, also, we have done some process exploration to make sure we're getting this right for the right reasons. You know, are the teleconnections there? Um, are the wave patterns that make sense there? So we have done a little bit of that. Um, for the ECMWF, we have not done that for SMILE yet. Um, and then again, you know, I was showing you there's only like 50% of the years where we're doing well and 50% where we're not. So what kind of years are we doing well? Are they the wetter years? Are they the drier years? Um, so that's something that we're going to be looking at next. And with that, I'm done. So thank you. Questions for Aaron? Can you go to the mic? I think the mic in the back works. Okay. Sorry, I was 
wasn't expecting that. Um, thank you, that was a really interesting uh, presentation. And I really like how you highlighted, especially here on the last slide, the need to increase usability by providing an explanation as to why you're getting the empirical adequacy in the model that you're seeing. And I guess what I'm wondering is, what have you found most difficult in terms of translating about the model's adequacy and what is justified in terms of um, interpretable and then usable within like a decision-making context um, with this kind of co-production process that you're engaged in? Yeah, thanks, Monica. So this is, I'm, I'm showing you a snippet of the research. The Southwest project is part of a larger project where we are directly working with them. So one of the things uh, that isn't useful to them is when I say, here are the number of weather type days. Oh, you're going to have, you know, 35 and you usually have 30. And they're like, well, what does that mean? So one of the things that we did is we, we actually did an empirical translation to precipitation and the probability of having, like seasonal forecasts are, probability of being the upper tercile, the middle tercile, and the lower tercile. So again, it took one extra step of translation. Um, so that was one thing. Um, I think you're right, though, there is a bit of a credibility thing. So we've just added the smile. Actually, this was a great outgrowth from some conversations I had um, with Yaga and Steve. Um, so we haven't looked at the, you know, the processes behind it, but we did do that for ECMWF. And again, it does seem like they're getting things right. You know, the, the wave patterns, they're not perfect, but you can see that they're at least there. They're sort of in the right kind of spots. You can see that it's getting the, it got the La Nina pattern um, from last year because we had a really we did an experimental forecast with them last year um, and then the last thing I would say is kind of putting it into their hands so we actually developed like a collab notebook that they can run on their own just experimentally so that they can do it themselves a little bit um, to to have a little bit more ownership and so yeah it's it's you know but I would also welcome you know other other ideas to keep to keep that engagement going but that's my initial answer we still have time for more questions if anyone has any sanjeev yeah my question was uh, so you saw difference between the djf and the jj and you thought why jj was not doing very good yeah, so I think for the CONUS, again, you know, we, we hypothesize that, you know, doing a CONUS-wide examination of, uh, you know, some of those, yeah, doing CONUS-wide, you know, there's different things that contribute, especially in the U.S. Southwest, the monsoon being one, um, which does have a more of a synoptic pattern. So some of those winter patterns, I think, are a bit more synoptic, and they can be captured by these large-scale patterns. Um, whereas some of the convective rainfall of summer is probably much more difficult. And so maybe if we applied this targeted approach to other places that don't have those, you know, where it's more local scale, it might be a little bit more difficult. Um, we haven't tried targeting it in other regimes. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's kind of that larger scale um, uh, influence on the winter season that probably made it a little easier to capture. And then in the summer, because of the monsoon, you know, because we were focusing right there on these small regions, it was um, had a little bit more predictability. So, yeah. Thank you. So, Aaron, I'll ask one. Um, are you going to look at longer lead times? Is that in your plans? So, actually, it's another good question. So, uh, it would be good. We have not. Um, I guess we were. Yeah, we were starting here. Um, but I know that the CESM2 doesn't do every month. Um, so a very, the, the people who are, I'm working with at the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, they are water managers and their you know, spring forecasts are really important to them. So this would be like a May 1st forecast for June, July, and August. Um, I know they would be really interested in like an April forecast. Um, so yeah, for, for this particular application, I do think that longer lead times would be good. Although I'm not sure how skillful they would be. For ECMWF, we did look out three months in advance, actually. We looked at the March to April. Actually, no, sorry, we looked at the April, starting in April. Um, but yeah, it wasn't available for the smile. Um, but yeah, we did for a couple months earlier. So. Yeah. Our next speaker is Danny Dew.
Um, well, thanks for having me today. Um, I'm Danny, and I'm currently a fourth year PhD student at CU Boulder. Um, in terms of global warming, you might be thinking that um, more extreme floodings, droughts, um, heat waves, and hurricanes might occur on the global warming, and therefore it might be more challenging in the future for the subseasonal to seasonal forecast. However, today I'm going to introduce a potential opportunity for the S2S forecast, which is the potential increase in MGO predictability on the global warming. The MGO, the mid engineering oscillation, it is characterized by the eastward propagating signals of large scale deep convection and circulation in the tropics, which is well visualized by this animation. So here, the blue color denotes more rainfall corresponding to the active MGO convection, while the red color denotes less rainfall corresponding to the MGO suppressed convection. And when we are studying um, MGO, it is that the real-time multivariate MGO index, the RMMI, is commonly used to monitor the MGO activity. And it's basically computed using the empirical orthogonal function analysis on the following three combined fields in the tropics. The daily zonal wind at 850 millibar, the daily zonal wind at 200 millibar, and, daily, and the daily outgoing level radiation, which is a good proxy of deep convection in the tropics. After doing the EOF analysis, we'll obtain two EOF modes with their um, corresponding to principal component time series and their arm one and arm two respectively and in this figure we'll be able to see that the first year of pattern corresponds to the active mgo convection over the maritime continent and the second year of pattern corresponds to the act the, the the compressed the, the suppressed mgo convection um, over the indian ocean and with Arm 1 and Arm 2 will be able to determine the amplitude and location of the MGL active convection. Here in this MGL phase diagram, with Arm 1 being the x-axis and Arm 2 being the y-axis, the larger the Euclidean distance, a point is away from the origin, the larger the MGL amplitude is. And uh, with RM1 and RM2, the entire phase diagram is divided into eight phases, with each of them correspond to some um, geophysical locations in the real world. For example, phase two and phase three would correspond to the Indian Ocean, and phase four and phase five would correspond to the maritime continent. We know that MGL is changing on the global warming. Existing studies have shown that the MGL duration over the Indian Ocean is decreasing while the um, duration over the Indo-Pacific maritime continent in is increasing due to the expansion of the Indo-Pacific warm pool. And we also know that the um, in a warming climate, the MGO amplitude is tending to be larger. So with changes in both the MGO propagation and the MGO amplitude, we ask the question, is there a systematic change in MGO predictability on the global warming as well? So the common practice in estimating the MGO predictability is to use the model ensemble forecast. So when we are talking about the prediction skill, we are comparing the model forecast with the observation. And in terms of predictability, we are comparing one realization in the models with the rest of the ensemble members so that we know how quickly the ensemble members diverge from each other with a small perturbation in the initial condition. And here the metric we use is the bivariate anomaly correlation coefficient, ACC, as a function of forecast lead day. And we define the predictability as the first forecast lead day when the ACC value drop, drops below 0.6. And we use this method to analyze the signal forecast in ECMWF CSF 20 century uh, seasonal forecast, and we use a 30 year window with one initialization in November per year and 51 ensemble members. The predictability time series of the past century in these seasonal forecasts is shown as the black curve in this figure. And there is, like, obviously, there is a significant increasing trend. 
And since the predictability of the MGL here is approximately uh, 40 days, so we also plot out the ACC time series. Uh, we also plot out the ACC uh, at forecast lead of 40 days. And the ACC time series ha also have an increasing trend, which is consistent with the predictability time series. Now that we know that during the past century, there's this increasing trend, um, we want to ask the question whether or not this kind of increasing is caused by global warming. However, the current method, it's computationally expensive. And also, given the existing forecast, we cannot determine whether or not this kind of increase is caused by global warming, because now, like here in these forecasts, the internal variability is entangling with the um, external forcing. Therefore, we seek this alternative method to analyze the predictability, which is the weighted permutation entropy. The weighted permutation entropy, the WPE, it can, it can quantify the randomness of a time series and therefore uh, indirectly tell us the predictability of the time series. Basically, the lower the WPE, the higher the predictability, because the lower the randomness is, the higher the predictability is. And I'll spend some time on this slide using a simple example of this very short time series. So given this time series, if we want to calculate the WPE, the first step would be to choose the length and the time delay of the embedding vector. And if we pick the length of three and a time delay of one time step, the embedding vector would look like this, consisting of xt, xt plus one, and xt plus two for any possible t values in your time series. And the second step would be to categorize the embedding vector into each ordinal permutations um, by the order of each element in your um, embedding vector. So with three elements, we know there would be six possible um, orders. There would be six possible permutations of its order as shown in the left. So the first embedding vector in our time series would be one, two, three, and because the elements in this embedding vector is sequentially increasing, it would correspond to the first permutation of its order. And the second embedding vector, two, three, four, similarly, it also corresponds to the first permutation. And then comes to the three, uh, comes to the third embedding vector. We know like here, two is smallest, three is the second smallest, and four is largest. So it would be categorized as this um, permutation as one, two, zero. And similarly, we can categorize all of these embedding vectors in our time series into the permutations. And after doing this, we'll take the third step, which is to weight the probability distribution function of the permutations by the variance of each embedding vector using these formulas. And the last step would just be uh, following the entropy formula to calculate the weighted permutation entropy. And we apply this weighted permutation entropy to the four MGL related time series, the RM1, RM2, the MGL amplitude, and the MGL propagation computed from the coupled era 20th century reanalysis. And we decide to use a length of three for our embedding vector. So there would be six there would be six permutations for their order, and we uh, try different tau values as shown in different panels, so that we can tell like how robust how robust our uh, results are. And in all of these um, subplots, we'll be able to see that for the weighted permutation entropy over the past century, there are the significant decreasing trend. And remember that the lower the weighted permutation entropy, the higher the predictability. So the decreasing trend here can actually be translated into the increasing trend for the MGL predictability. And here we show that using this new, uh, using this relatively new method, the results are very consistent with the results from the traditional method. 
And using this method, we can further ask the question, is this increasing MGL predictability caused by global warming, or is it just part of the internal variability? And uh, the data we use to address this question is the CSM2 model realizations, because CSM2 have has a good realize uh, has a good representation for the MGL structure and MGL propagation. And we analyze the control run of 1,200 years. And the control run is driven by the pre-industry forcing. So it's free from global warming. And we also analyze the historical run with 10 ensemble members from CSM2 and three ensemble members from CSM2 Wacom. And those are the runs from 1850 to 2014. And these runs are under historical warming. And we also further analyze the SSP 5A5 future projection with three ensemble members from CSM2 and five from CSM2 Wacom. And those runs are from 2015 to, tw uh, to 2100. And these runs are under more severe global warming. So the first step is to compute the WPE time series on like in each run. And the second step is to estimate the spread of the WPE slope. So whether or not the predictability is increasing from the control run. In that way, we'll be able to see the internal variability of the change in the MGL predictability. And the third step would be to compare the historical run or the SSB 585 run with the control run to see what kind of a role is the external forcing playing. And on this slide, we compare the historical runs with the control runs. So different panels correspond to the results from uh, the ARM1 time series, the ARM2 time series, the MGL amplitude, and the MGL propagation. And um, the different columns are just corresponding to um, the time delay parameter we choose. And these plots visualize the distribution of the weighted permutation entropy slope. Uh, so the blue bars here are the spread of the WP slope estimated from the control run, and we can understand them as the internal variability. As we can see, the mean of those spread, as denoted by the vertical blue line, I'm not sure if you can see it clearly, they're approximately at zero. And this is what, what this is what we want to see because the neutral, the, the internal variability will be very neutral. And the dots and the triangles here are just the weighted permutation entropy uh, slope fitted from each historical round ensemble members with, uh, with their mean categorized, uh, with their mean characterized by this vertical red line. So for ARM1, ARM2, and MJ amplitude, um, we can see the dots and triangles, they're basically within the spread. However, the mean is biased to the negative side. So like a negative WP slope would be the increasing MGL predictability. However, for propagation, like the dots and triangles are within the spread, within the spread and the mean value is not biased. This might suggest that the increasing MGL predictability in propagation is still the internal variability, not driven by the external forcing, but it is also more likely that the effect of the global warming has yet to emerge, like the signal is not di distinguishable from the noises in the historical run. That's why we further analyze the future projection. And now in this slide, you'll be able to see that the dots and triangles, they're very distinguishable from the blue bars. So indeed, the global warming is playing a role here for the increasing MGL predictability. So um, the physical mechanism behind the increasing MGL predictability under global warming might be very complicated. But here we try to give a simple mathematical explanation of why this is happening. And the WPE calculation, it's actually just care about the weighted probability distribution of different permutations, right? And think about that. If you have one per one dominant permutation in all of your permutations. And if this kind of permutation is becoming more and more dominant, 
then the randomness of your time series would be reduced and the predictability of your time series would increase. So in this MGL case, for ARM1, ARM2, and the MGL amplitude, the dominant patterns are just the oscillation patterns, the sequential increasing permutation and the sequential decreasing permutation. And for the MGL propagation, it's the eastward propagation that is the dominant pattern. And all of these dominant patterns are becoming more dominant that can explain the increasing MGL predictability on the global warming. And we can also using we can also use mathematical ways to attribute um, the change in WPE as a function time to the different permutations. And in this budget plot, we'll be able to see that how each permutation contributes to the WPE. And it's indeed that for ARM1, ARM2, and MGL amplitude, it's the oscillation patterns contributing to the negative slope in WPE. And for the MGL propagation, it's the um, eastward propagation pattern contributing to the negative slope in the WPE. In summary, during the past century, both the ensemble substitutional forecast and the reanalysis data indicate there is an increase in MGL predictability. And further examining with the CSM2 model ensemble, we find such an increase in the MGL predictability is likely caused by global warming. And under more severe global warming, the MGL tends to be more predictable. And this is because the oscillation patterns and the organized eastward propagation pattern in MGL is occurring more and more frequently. Thank you. I'll stop here and take questions. Any questions for Danny? We've got about five minutes. Thanks. Um, I didn't fully understand the WP metric, but I was just wondering when you look at the Euro 20C reanalysis and you go further back in time, there's less observations, presumably, to constrain it. Would that, you're more heavily reliant on the underlying model, would that affect that metric? Mm, this is a very good question. So, so the question is whether or not like the uh, data quality of early stage would influence our result. Um, but what I want to show here is that um, during the later stage of the past century, we actually have more like re reliable observations. And if you take a look at the later stage, there's still this decreasing trend. And I feel like the data quality of the early stage will not influence our results. Jerry? That's really interesting. You said at the beginning that um, there's been a clear trend for the MGO to be moving faster out of the Indian Ocean. I was curious, could that be contributing to this increase in predictability such that once you get an MGO event started and the models are predicting it and it's staying longer with more time content, you have more persistence there? And that that may be where you're picking up the increase in predictability, the trend for increased predictability. Do you think that's something that's Yeah, that's actually a very great question. And actually we were doing some literature reviews to see like if the MGL initializing from different phases, they're having different predictability. Like um, in your comments, if that's the case, then it's like uh, like initializing from the Indian Ocean might be higher predictable, and initializing from the maritime continent might be less predictable. But in the current studies, like they don't have like same conclusions using different models. So maybe that would be a great question to investigate in the future. Ah, and also, like for your comment, um, so if the MGL is becoming more, cons more persistent over the maritime continent, uh, from a mathematical perspective, it actually won't like directly making the permutation, weighted permutation value smaller and making the MGL more predictable. 
So there might be something else, like what we said, the more regular patterns that is going on here for MGO. Thank you. Higher predictability of the MJO if that's related to a more regular periodicity of El Nino? Great question. I believe, like, maybe the next talk, Dylan's talk, might have some info on your question. Great segue into Dylan and Maya's talk. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dylan Amaya. I'm a research scientist at the NOAA Physical Sciences Laboratory just up the road. And just keeping up with the theme that Danny started here, thinking about um, future changes in seasonal climate predictability. Um, very similar ideas to what Danny has um, posed here, but we're going to be thinking about this problem more broadly, um, thinking about global forecasts on seasonal timescales of things like surface temperature, precipitation, upper atmospheric circulation, and um, one phenomenological approach thinking about INSO. Um, and the reason why we want to think about future changes to seasonal climate predictability is because of how important um, INSO is to seasonal forecast skill. It is by far the main source of uh, deterministic seasonal forecast skill for most things in the climate system. This is just one example of that. This is showing you um, global average forecast skill as measured by this SETI metric. It's not important that you understand what it is, um, but it's showing you forecast skill for marine heat waves um, across the globe at three and a half month lead. And basically higher values mean higher skill and what you can see is that you get all this skill during large El Nino and to some extent some um, large La Nina events. And this is again true not just for things like marine heat waves but precipitation, surface temperature, upper atmospheric circulation, etc. Um, and if we think about what INSO might be doing in the future, uh, most climate models project that there are going to be some significant changes to the characteristics of INSO and its teleconnections, um, the way it's going to interact with the rest of the climate system. And so this is just one example of that. This is showing ensemble mean DJF Nina 3.4 standard deviation in 30 year windows. And this is coming from five uh, climate large ensembles with at least um, 30 ensemble members. And the observations are there in black. And basically what you'll see is that going out to 2100, all the models have very different ideas for what the future of ENSO variability looks like. Some models are increasing, some models are decreasing, MPI stays about the same. Um, but should ENSO change, should that hammer to the cli climate system change, it's reasonable to wonder if seasonal climate predictability, if those deterministic forecast skill relationships that we've built in the historical period, if those are going to hold moving into the future. And so that's something that we want to test. And one way that you could test that is um, through methods similar to what Danny just presented. Um, but the approach that we're going to take is actually based on the model analog framework. So for those that are unfamiliar, um, basically model analogs say that if two states in the climate system are very close to each other, they can be called each other's analog. And this is a very old idea. It goes back to the 60s with Ed Lorenz. Um, basically what happens is you, you find um, some period in the past, say in the observations, that looks like today, and then you look at the evolution of that past period, and that's your forecast for today. Um, this idea has broadened to include climate model simulations where you can take today, find a, uh, a period, an analog in, say, a long pre-industrial control simulation, look at the evolution of that, and that's your forecast. Um, but again, these are all sort of fixed. There's, these are, are time radiative forced, forced fixed periods of time, and they don't really tell you anything about how predictability may change over the course of the historical period or into the future because you're not allowing for time varying changes in radiative forcing. So um, some, an offshoot of this technique is the perfect model analog technique. And this idea is you use a model to predict a model. Um, and when you do this, you can actually use things like large ensembles to use a portion of a large ensemble to predict the other independent portion of a large ensemble, allowing you to look at time varying predictability with radiative forcing changes underneath. Um, and they're called perfect because the resulting forecasts have no unconditional or conditional biases because they're drawn from the same distribution of variability that the model produces. 
Um, and what's really cool about this is that it, it, because they're perfect, because they don't have biases, the, predict, the forecast skill that you're getting is kind of an upper limit to predictability in the climate system. It's basically the, the maximum amount of forecast skill that you could ever hope for that most dynamical initialized forecast systems don't achieve because they have biases uh, in the model or there's observational uncertainties, et cetera. Um, so the goal that we're gonna be doing here is to assess time varying predictability using perfect model analogs from large ensembles. And I'm, I'm gonna spend just a second sort of stepping through the uh, method of how we do this because I think it's important. Um, basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw analogs based on um, SST patterns. And so the way we do this is for a given large ensemble, we take a 30 year period of interest, say 1921 and 1950, we extract sea surface temperatures in that 30 year period for our, all large ensemble members, remove the seasonal cycle, we remove the ensemble mean, and this is important because otherwise you're just gonna predict the trend, which is not helpful. You wanna see how well you can predict the variability and how that might change. Um, we arbitrarily take the first ensemble member and we treat it as truth. That's the observations. And we want to um, see how well the other remaining ensemble members can predict those observations. So we construct a data library using the remaining ensemble members to draw analogs from. So we're gonna lump all the Januaries from say the other 39 members of CSM1, and that's our data library that we're gonna draw analogs out of. So we would initialize a forecast with a global sea surface temperature pattern uh, of anomalies. Um, and we, we keep the subsequent 24 months as our forecast target. That's the thing that we're gonna try and predict. Using our data library, we can then match this observed state to all the other say Januaries in our data library. And we can find the 10 best analogs, the 10 closest matches based on global RMSE and you can see the, these um, 10 other matches on the right. And they're all independent from one another because they're all coming from different ensemble members within the large ensemble, which is very helpful. Um, so then we can repeat this process, um, steps one through seven, by, by treating each remaining ensemble member as the truth. We basically just loop through and take turns which ensemble member is, is our observations, drawing analogs from the remaining um, ensemble members. Um, and then, so for CSM1, for example, we have 40 ensemble members. We're getting 10 forecast members. Um, over 12 months, 28 years, so we end up with 134,000 forecasts for a, a given 30-year period. So then you can repeat all of these steps for a future period, calculate the predictability of both time of both epochs, and then basically take the difference and see how well you've done um, or how things have changed. So we're going to apply this method to five large ensembles: CSM1, CSM2, Spear, ESM2M, and MPI. As you can see, they all have a varying number of, of ensemble members, but something north of 30, uh, 30 members. And we've chosen these models because they sample sort of the, the range of futures that might happen with INSO, uh, whether there's an increase, a decrease, or about staying the same. Um, and specifically, we're gonna, we're gonna mostly focus today on CSM1, ESM2, and MPI because they have those, that, that range of uncertainty, an increase, a decrease, and about staying the same. Uh, but I'll, I will also show some results for CSM2 and GFDL SPEAR as well. So all the data has been regraded onto a common grid, two and a half degrees by two and a half degrees. We're gonna look at the change in predictability from 1920 to 2100 in each of the models, and we'll evaluate skill based on anomaly correlation coefficient and a probabilistic metric called reliability, which I'll step through here in a second. All right, so let's see how well the analogs do. Um, this is gonna show you the ensemble mean, there it is, ensemble mean um, anomaly correlation co uh, coefficient, so the ensemble mean skill at zero month lead in CSM1 for the epoch 19, or 1921 to 1950. And so this is telling you how good of a match our analogs are at initialization. And you gotta remember that we're drawing analogs from just SST, so we're getting most of our skill over the ocean, but I'm showing you the, um, the forecast skill for surface temperature over land as well. And so that's the beautiful thing about analogs is that you're not running a model, right? You're just picking a climate state based on something. I'm picking a climate state based on SST. And then I can look at the forecast of any variable I want without having to integrate the model. So it's very cheap computationally. Um, so you can look at the zero month lead out to 24 months. And you can see that as you go forward in time, the correlation goes down. So the forecast skill gets worse as you get further out, which makes sense. But you can play this game again for the future. And then you can take the difference. And you can see how forecast predictability is changing in this model. And so for CSM1, surface temperature forecast skill increases nearly everywhere, especially in the tropics and especially at long leads. Uh, but a very important caveat here is that this is just a single model. And we already saw that in these different models, ENSO is doing something different for each of the models. So it's important to uh, compare across these different model ensembles. Um, and so what we're seeing here is the change in forecast skill for surface temperature between CSM1 MPI in the middle and GFTL ESM2M on the right. 
And what you can see is they all give very different ideas for what the future of climate predictability will look like. But even though they're giving some sort of different answers, so it looks like there's a large, lot, lot of amount of uncertainty, uh, I guess I'm going to make the argument that they're all internally consistent and there's something to be learned here. So just um, as a reminder, these are their Nino 3.4 standard deviation trends. CSM1 had an increase in the basically leveling off, MPI was basically flat the whole time, and ESM2M was flat and then a decrease. Uh, and so what I'm going to make an argument here is that forecast skill is going to go as ENSO goes. If a, if a model's forecast skill increases, it's because there's a bigger hammer to the climate system because their ENSO is increasing, and I'll show some details of that. Um, but this isn't just true for surface temperature. We can look at other metrics, things like precipitation. Um, so I'll just show you these difference maps for precipitation in each of these three models. Um, same idea, um, same sign of change, mostly focusing on the tropics, but you can also see some significant changes um, in mid-latitudes, particularly along the U.S. West Coast for things like CSM, um, particularly at longer leads. Uh, so that was a deterministic forecast skill metric. Uh, we can also look at a uh, probabilistic forecast skill metric. This is called forecast reliability. Um, <clears throat> basically what it does is it takes a reliability diagram, which are used all the time to test how well or how useful a forecasting system is. And it just basically takes um, forecast probability bins, telling you um, how often your forecast is sending ensemble members into a target tercile. In this case, we're going to think about like the upper tercile of temperature. And then it looks at the observed frequency of that actually happening, and it tries to draw a line through them. So in a perfect forecast, it would be a one-to-one, -one where basically your forecast probability is always matching the observations. And these dots, these little dots, would be falling on a one-to-one -one line. But very rarely are you ever perfect. So you can separate how perfect your forecast reliability is um, based on how well they match basically the one-to-one -one line, but also these other positive areas that are related to Briar's skill score. It's not super important that we understand every aspect of this, but the useful component of this is that it's very interpretable. You can separate these into categories to decide how useful your forecast system is for decision making. So these are categories based on the reliability diagram for perfect, very useful, marginally useful, not useful, and dangerously use useless forecasts. So we can see how the global forecast system is going to change based on these categories. So for things like um, surface temperature in the upper tercile, this is CSM1 showing you the global area fraction um, of, uh, of, of surface temperature being in a given category for the upper tercile. So um, the blues are for the past period, the oranges are for the future period. And basically what you'll see is that there's a shift towards higher reliability categories in CSM1 as a function of lead, where you're getting um, more fours, more, th more threes and more fours, depending on which lead you're looking at. So basically your forecasts are becoming more reliable in CSM1. Um, looking at the other models again though, you can see that for things like MPI, the reliability category distribution doesn't really shift all that much, which is consistent with the, the number, deterministic forecast skill metric. And for GFDL ESM2M, you can see that there's a shift in the distribution from blue to orange towards um, uh, lower reliability categories. So your forecasts are actively getting less useful for decision making. And again, this is true if we think about um, things like precipitation in the lower tercile. So if you're interested in precipitation, like drought extremes, basically. Um, very similar story. Okay, so um, one of the things that we might want to consider forecasting is things like INSO, right? We want to think about um, phenomenological forecasts like INSO forecast skills. So now we can look at um, anomaly correlation coefficients of um, INSO forecast skill as a function of lead time on the y-axis and initialization month on the x-axis. And this is going to be for all of the five models. And this is the, um, the base period here. And so what this is a typical sort of lead initialization dependent um, forecast skill matrix where you have higher skill in the winter time, um, boreal winter time for ENSO, and when we tend to be, a, uh, be able to predict ENSO the best. Uh, and what we're going to see here is that this, these are going to vary as you go forward in time. So we can look at changes in forecast skill in um, different 30-year epochs. This is just going to show the delta, uh, delta ACC for the next 30-year epoch, so it's the second column minus the first. And then we can continue out to 2100, and you can see the diversity of model responses depending on which model you're looking at. Um, and we can get a better sense for how monotonic these uh, responses are or whether there's some up and downs. Uh, and what we'll see is that a lot of these models, even though, again, there's a, a large spread in the answer, they're all doing something internally consistent. And again, just to remind you, high resolution pictures take time to load. There it is. Um, these are their Nino 3.4 standard deviation projections. And each of them are doing something sensible. CSM1 is basically an increase throughout with some flattening. And you see that similar change in forecast skill. CSM2 
has a mid, mid 21st century peak in Nino 3.4 variability and a decrease. And you see a similar peak in mid 21st century uh, uh, predictability changes and then a decrease. ESM2M is basically flat until the 2040s and then a decrease. MPI is basically flat throughout. So it's all sort of following in a, a time evolving sense. And one final way that we can quantify that are through these um, constellation plots, which we'll load someday. I see a rainbow spinning thing. There it is. Um, and this isn't just true for INSO, this is true for the globe. So this is um, globally averaged surface temperature anomaly co correlation coefficient for each of the models in different 30 year epochs. So each year on the YAC on this color bar here is telling you um, the end year of a 30 year epoch in which we're calculating the forecast skill. And on the x-axis is the Nino 3.4 standard deviation. Each different shape is a different model. And the shading of the shape is telling you where you are as a function of time. So maybe just orient to orient, you look at CSM1, which is the circle. And you can see that at the earliest period to the later period, you're seeing as Nino 3.4 standard deviation is increasing as a function of time, you get a global increase in ACC. Um, maybe more interestingly, CSM2, you can see this inflection point where you have an increasing, uh, increasing relationship between Nino 3.4 standard deviation and global ACC until about the 2040s, and then it starts to decrease. It completely U-shapes on you. And that's consistent across the other models. So why is this happening? Um, you can calculate basically a signal to noise ratio in your different forecasts and um, make a very similar plot. And you can see that um, Nino 3.4 standard deviation is related to the global average signal to noise in these forecasts. So if you have a stronger INSO, it's a bigger hammer to the climate system, and you have a better um, signal to noise ratio where you're able to capture, you're able to make a better forecast because you have something to latch on to. And this isn't just true for six months lead, it's true for um, all the leads that we looked at here um, out to 24 months. Um, so I'm gonna stop here. Um, go through a summary. And so and its teleconnections are projected to change in the future, even if the nature of those changes are very uncertain across the models. Uh, a perfect model analog forecast technique um, drawn from large ensembles suggests that seasonal climate predictability will also change in the future. But the sign and intensity of that predi those predictability changes, whether that's measured by deterministic or probabilistic metrics, um, are related to the sign and intensity of those INSO variability changes. Stronger INSO leads to a higher signal to noise, which helps lead to a higher predictability. Um, so if you take away nothing, just remember this last quote here, forecast skill goes as in so it goes. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. So it's perfect for that model, right? Um, yeah, the model has biases relative to the real world, but the, the upper predictability limit will vary from model to model, sure. Yes. And I don't know if online is able to hear questions. I could barely hear Dr. Sarah Okay, go ahead, Danny. Goes as ANSO forecast, ANSO goes. I like to say like seasonal forecast go goes as ANSO goes, because like um, in your CSM2 results, actually the ANSO scale is not like monotonically increasing. And like compared to CSM1 ANSO mm -hmm. forecast scale, like the increase is not that large and there's even like the dropping of the forecast scale in the later stage. So like maybe the sub signal forecast scale won't follow the ANSO. That could be true. I guess I'm making the argument that anything that, that cares about ENSO will have its predictability changed in a predictable way. So anything that on any time scale that ENSO is, is messing with, that forecast scale goes as ENSO goes. So mostly focusing on seasonal time scales, but yes, we didn't look at subseasonal in this case, or decadal for that matter. Question. Um, so for the reliability metric, you're using your member one truth to get the temporal uh, frequency distribution. Is that correct? But that could, I mean, depending on where, will that take you outside of your, your window, your historical window? I guess, sorry, I guess I don't understand the question. Yeah, the question is, I guess, I can follow up with you just how you're doing this reliability computation in analog. Um, so we, we, 
we basically treat every 30 year epoch as a quasi equilibrated equilibrated run so we have 1200 years in our in our equilibrated run for csm1 um, and we treat uh, the first member as the truth and then we're basically lumping all the other forecasts into one long time series and we're trying to figure out you know uh, in a given probabilistic bin how many how many times do you get a, an observed forecast in that long time series um, I, I can draw it out for you, but maybe it's better off on, offline. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Good. Sure. It's real interesting. I was, I was sitting here thinking that you know one of the big questions still is you know, why do these models behave differently in the future, right? So I was wondering if you thought about applying your analog technique maybe to pre-industrial control runs and take time periods over 20 years when uh, EU 3.4 standard deviation is decreasing increasing in each model and then try to do the same thing for observation see if you can draw any conclusions about and maybe not look just at SST maybe look at subsurface uh, temperatures I think that's one of the explanations right is the stratification is different in different models and that affects the answer amplitude so this is just kind of a comment if you thought of applying this method in, in that way to get it at how these why these models are different in terms of their future behavior yeah it's a, a good question and not something I had immediately thought of although it makes me think of some previous work that has looked at natural decadal variability in ENSO prediction, and they've done something similar, drawing analogs from a control run um, over different decadal epochs where ENSO variance is naturally higher or lower. And basically, you see huge decadal swings in ENSO predictability related to natural fluctuations and what its ENSO variability is doing. Um, so the extent to which uh, we think everything here is anthropogenically forced is the extent to which we think that 100 ensemble members is enough to quantify the force response, which we think is enough. Um, but it is something other folks have thought about. So I'm happy to send you papers as well. Thanks. Thank you all. Appreciate it. This is, this is one talk. Can you help me with that one? Seems like I cannot share either this time. Can you see the see my slides well? And it, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes, perfect. Hear you. Go ahead, Lan Tao. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Lan Tao San. I'm a research scientist at Colorado State University. Uh, it's my honor today to talk about uh, some work that we did recently on North America uh, precipitation monthly prediction. Uh, this collaborative uh, project bring colleagues uh, from uh, NCAR, NOAA, and Colorado State University. And our, our aim is to uh, understand the source of the predictive skill uh, at different uh, time scales and from different initial conditions. And this talk uh, comprises five sections with two main analysis in section three and section four. And before we dive into any results, uh, just to give you a really quick contact, uh, NOAA established this uh, precipitation prediction grand challenge to uh, advance more accurate uh, uh, precipitation forecast at a sub seasonal to seasonal time scale. The sub seasonal forecast, including the monthly precipitation prediction that we will discuss today, uh, differs from the uh, weather forecast, which is uh, largely relies on uh, initialized uh, atmosphere condition, uh, and also differs from the climate predictions, which is primarily driven by a lower boundary forcing. So how to bridge these two realms to accurately predict the precipitation at a sub scale uh, pose a really big challenge. So a uh, climate prediction center is uh, conducting this uh, monthly forecast for temperature and precipitation uh, since 1995. They issue 
uh, two forecasts every month. The first one issued at the beginning of each month. The second one uh, is uh, issued in the middle of the prior month. Uh, we normally call it a 0.5 month lead. The red panel just give you an idea of the precipitation uh, predictive skill uh, for this uh, 0.5 month lead forecast. And uh, last year, we published a paper uh, at weather and forecasting uh, and look at this monthly precipitation forecast uh, in which we emphasized this uh, seasonal and the original variations of the monthly precipitation scale. And we also identified this substantial impact of ANSO uh, on monthly precipitation scale at a lead time of uh, 0.5 months. Um, as uh, you know, Dylan just mentioned that uh, you know, as ANSO goes, the the prediction, you know, the skill goes. So uh, the the main goal of this work is to uh, expand our previous analysis of uh, North American monthly precipitation prediction. And we will uh, have two main goals. The first one is to examine the separate skill components of monthly precipitation skill uh, at a sub-seasonal and the seasonal time scale. And the second one is to uh, investigate the impact of atmospheric, uh, oceanic, and uh, land initial conditions on monthly precipitation scale. And to do that, we are using these uh, sub-seasonal reforecast uh, with CSM2. And this is a 11-member uh, reforecast spanning 1999 to 2020. Uh, with the forecast up to 45 days and initialized uh, every week uh, on Monday. And the initialization process uh, follows the previous uh, decadal prediction system. The atmosphere is initialized using the uh, CFS V2 reanalysis. Uh, the land using the CRM5 uh, spin up with CFS V2 and the ocean sea ice uh, initialized using so-called uh, GRA55 do data. Uh, similarly, we uh, evaluate the scale metrics using this commonly used uh, anomaly correlation coefficient, or ACC, uh, for the uh, monthly precipitation uh, at a zero day lead, uh, which is uh, week one to week four average, and the 14 day lead, which is uh, uh, week three to week six average, I came to the uh, CPC's uh, monthly forecast. So now let's first take a quick look at the uh, precipitation monthly scale uh, at a zero day lead on top and the four, 14 day lead uh, on the bottom across uh, four different seasons. Uh, you can clearly see this uh, uh, seasonal and uh, regional variations of the uh, precipitation scale. And uh, we have uh, a lot of description in our previous paper, so uh, I will not uh, talk about the details. Uh, in today's talk, uh, we will focus only on the DGF season uh, and use it as an example to explore uh, the contributions from the uh, sub-seasonal and the seasonal component as well as from different initial conditions. So let's do let's go to the first analysis. Uh, we try to separate the uh, seasonal and subseasonal component. Uh, to do that, we have uh, adopted the method from a recent paper uh, by Arcadia at our uh, 2020, and uh, by first. Uh, make a separation for the total forecast anomaly into a seasonal and the sub-seasonal signal. So what we did is we first calculate the weekly forecast anomaly time series from 1999 to 2020. Then we apply a, a 17 weekly running mean to get the a seasonal component of the anomaly. So note that a 17 weekly running mean is uh, equivalent to a 120 day running mean. So we can get the seasonal component. Then we consider the remain anomaly to be the 
uh, sub-signal component. And to give you a little more ideas about this, so this time series shows you the uh, Nino 3.4 average uh, weekly precipitation anomaly uh, from the CESM2. And the gray line is for the total anomaly while the uh, red line and blue line represent the uh, seasonal and sub seasonal component respectively. So because this is a uh, Nino 3.4 average precipitation anomaly, uh, so it's largely reflect the ANSO signal. So look at, for example, 2015-16, uh, this strong El Nino years, we see a significant positive anomalies. Uh, and this uh, strong positive anomalies, this gray line, uh, can be largely explained by the red line, which is the seasonal component, while the blue line, the sub-seasonal component, can also be important at times. So after we separate this, we first look at the, uh, the, the variance of the precipitation anomaly over this DGF season. Uh, the left columns gives you the total precipitation, and the right three columns shows you the uh, sub-seasonal component, seasonal component, and the covariance of the sub-seasonal and the seasonal component. Again, the top panel is for the zero day lead and the bottom is for the 14 day lead. We can see at zero day lead, uh, this precipitation variance is largely explained by the sub seasonal component. While at the 14 day lead, the sub seasonal components and the seasonal component uh, becomes comparable uh, to each other then uh, we can uh, make a separation to the uh, total precipitation skill uh, using the formula we derived here. Uh, the ACC season is the seasonal skill and the ACC subseason is the subseasonal skill. And you can see that for both, uh, they are divided by some terms related to this R, M, R, O, this, uh, this R represent the uh, ratio of the variance between the seasonal and the sub-seasonal component, where the M is for the model and O is for the observations. So when the R term is, uh, when the R is large, then we can see that uh, this, uh, this predictive skill will be dominated by the seasonal component. When the R is small, becomes you know when it's close to zero, the sub component will dominate the predictive skill. Then let's look at the results. So the, again, the, the the left column shows you the total precipitation skill which you have seen in the previous slides, and the right three columns shows you the uh, sub component of the skill. A seasonal component of the skill and a very small residual term. So we can clearly see that at zero daily, the predictive skill is dominated by the sub seasonal component, while at 14 day lead, the bottom panel of the skill is dominated by the seasonal uh, time skill. So to look at this further, we have uh, average the skill over the North American land, and then plot this uh, scale as a function of lead time. So we can see that initially at zero day lead, this uh, precipitation scale uh, in black is uh, largely explained by its sub component uh, shown in blue. And uh, as it goes with time, this blue line decreases uh, more than the red line. Uh, and by day eight to day nine uh, in advance, the, uh, the contributions from the seasonal and the sub components becomes comparable. Then later the uh, seasonal components of the skill becomes more important than the sub component. Then uh, let's go to the second analysis in which we will try to uh, investigate the different initial conditions. It's uh, inspired by uh, this schematic graph 
which shows the uh, different physical processes in determining the predictability at a different time scale. And to look at this further, uh, NCAR has conducted this unique set of uh, initialized, idealized initialized reforecast. And the table lists uh, list the uh, experiment that has been conducted. Uh, and the standard, standard forecast is the one that we just look at. And in addition to that, uh, we can also initialize uh, one or two uh, of three components to climatology for the reforecast. And so that from these experiments, uh, we can derive the uh, contributions from uh, atmosphere initial condition, from the ocean ice initial condition, or from land initial condition to the uh, total variance or to the total predictive skill. For example, if we look at this so-called climate all in which all the initial condition has been set to climatology, uh, we will get this uh, total variance due to internal variability. Well, if we look at this standard forecast, which will give us the internal variability uh, plus the contributions from atmosphere, ocean, and the land initial conditions, and similarly for other experiments. And from them, we can uh, separate the total variance uh, into the uh, atmosphere initial condition, uh, ocean initial condition, land initial condition, and the uh, internal variability. And uh, again, this is the top is zero day lead and the bottom is 14 day lead. You can see that the uh, at the zero day lead, uh, the largest term is from the atmosphere initial condition uh, followed by the internal variability. Uh, while at the 14 day lead, the internal variability plays a uh, largest rule and the atmosphere initial condition and the ocean initial condition uh, make similar uh, contribution to the total variance. And we can do similar thing for the uh, precipitation predictive monthly scale. And this is the uh, separation of the scale into contributions from uh, different initial conditions. And for the zero day lead, you can see that the uh, almost all the predictive skill can be explained by the atmosphere initial conditions. Well, at the 14 day lead, uh, both atmosphere initial condition and ocean initial condition uh, make, you know, be important for the predictive skill. And the other thing worth mentioning is that if you look at this ocean initial condition uh, contributed predictive skill, the pattern is uh, somewhat similar to the uh, seasonal component of the predictive skill. Uh, that we have seen in the previous slides. And to look at this further, we again, we have averaged the predictive skill uh, into the, uh, over the North American land. And again, uh, plot this uh, uh, skill as a function of lead time. And uh, at zero day lead, uh, without a doubt that the skill mostly comes from the uh, atmosphere initial conditions, then uh, it becomes smaller with time. And uh, if we look at the ocean initial condition contribution uh, from zero day lead to 14 day lead, it actually increase a little bit. And uh, at, like, uh, at a 14 day lead, the contribution uh, to the scale from the atmosphere initial condition and the ocean initial condition are uh, roughly similar. And this uh, different, uh, these two time series are kind of similar to the uh, previous uh, schematic graph that we, we just uh, saw. And uh, this is the last slide, just a quick summary for the results. So we firstly, we found that seasonal and sub seasonal scale uh, display very distinct spatial patterns and the different uh, relative magnitudes at a zero day lead and a 14 day lead. 
And uh, the other one is that at zero they lead the atmosphere initial condition predominantly influence monthly precipitation, while at the 14 day lead both atmosphere and ocean initial condition contribute comparably, uh, but with uh, spatial very different spatial variations. So that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. We've got a few minutes for questions. Can I ask a question from the web? Yep, go ahead. Hi. Uh, conventionally, I think you need a correlation coefficient of more than 0.6 to make the forecast useful. So you're talking about very low correlation coefficients. Are any of these actually useful for forecasts? Yeah, that's that's a good point. I think uh, a big, you know, like uh, a big issue for the subseasonal forecast is that it normally has indeed a low skill. So uh, the reason is that this subseasonal forecast is kind of conditional. That's why you know it's important to understand the predictive skill, the source of the predictive skill so that we can know that, you know, and which conditions we can expect the skill to be higher. So in this case, for example, uh, the, 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 the skill pattern we found uh, has a lot of connection to the ENSO. So the skill pattern resembles the ENSO teleconnections. Uh, so in other words, uh, during the ENSO active years, uh, we can expect the, the higher skill. I'm not sure it will, the average will be over 0 0.5, 0 0.6, but at least in some regions, we can expect the skill to be higher. I think, uh, yeah, definitely we need more work to, you know, one is to understand the source of the skill. And secondly, to consider, you know, more work to improve the skill, including those like machine learning technique or other ways. So, thanks. Okay, we've got a couple questions in the room and then we'll break. Hi, thanks, thanks for the talk. Um, I have a quick question. It's not, I guess it's not surprising that the um, atmospheric skill and the ocean skill play such a strong role, you know, even if, as you get out to 14 days um, with the weekly predictance. I'm surprised the land is essentially doesn't show up at all. And I actually wonder if you're entirely confident that the, um, I mean, we know it's going to be low, but are you entirely confident that the land initializations actually are of a good quality or of a good enough quality to be able to impart skill given the way these experiments were initialized? Thank you for the question. I think it's a, it's a really nice question. Firstly, I want to say that uh, so far, I haven't really looked at the, you know, the land initialization and, you know, how, uh, why, it, it's why the contributions from the land initial condition is so low. Um, I, I talked with Yaga and ex, other experts a little bit. Uh, so it's possible that, uh, you know, CESM may underestimate the uh, ocean and atmosphere coupling, but we definitely need more work to understand that. And the other thing uh, I was told is that this, um, the, the land processes uh, on the atmosphere is probably larger for the temperature. Um, for the precipitation, it's probably a little smaller. And uh, the other thing is like, uh, it may depend on the season. For the summer season, uh, the, the impact might be a little larger. So uh, one thing I do see is that, you know, here I only show the winter, but I also look at the other seasons. Uh, this, for example, the JGA season, when I look at that, I do find a little bit uh, a green bars, which shows the uh, contributions from the land initial condition. And when I look at the spatial pattern, it's over the northern greater plains. So it's possible that uh, uh, over the summer season, over northern greater plain, we can detect 
uh, some contributions from the land initial condition. But uh, I also think, you know, we need more work to, to understand this, including, you know, more comprehensive evaluation of this uh, land atmosphere coupling in the CESM, CESM model. Thank you. Okay, one last question. Thank you. Uh, mine is technical question. If I uh, remember it correctly, you applied 17 weeks running mean to separate the sub-seasonal from the seasonal component. How did you apply in the 46 days sub-ex forecast uh, methodology or did I miss anything? I I'm sorry, can you repeat uh, the last sentence? Yeah, so how did you apply that 17 weeks running mean to the sub-ex forecast? Because oh. sub-ex forecast is only for six weeks. So did you take the previous uh, what, 11 weeks from the observation? That, that that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, I, I'm I'm so glad that you raised this question because uh, it's it's really easy to get get confusion here. Uh, what I'm showing here is the uh, weekly um, precipitation anomaly. For example, in the in this bottom figure, so it's week one, which means it's like a, a day one to day seven average. As we know that uh, the CESM2 reforecast is conducted uh, once per week. So uh, then week one to week seven, oh, I'm sorry, day one to day seven average will give us like a one week average. And if we like uh, put all reforecast together, we can get a, a continuous, continuous weekly uh, time series from 1999 uh, to 2020. And similarly, you know, we can have like a one time series for week one forecast, a one time series for week two forecast, and so on. So it's not like a week one, week two together, it's separate. Hopefully that answers your question. If not, I can uh, share with you uh, more details offline. Thanks, Lan Tao. And let's thank all our speakers again. We'll meet back at 3 30.
a slightly different perspective on a topic that I think has come up recently at CSM meetings, uh, mainly moving into actionable science work, um, which it's it, it can be difficult to envision and there's a lot of nuances when thinking about how a GCM or, or system model moves into and relates to an actionable science context. And so I'm going to try to kind of map out what actionable science is and then point to um, some of the practices that we should pay attention to that are important because in an actual science context, there are moral implications to getting it wrong. Um, and so we need to be extra careful that we're providing reliable information and that the instruments that we're using to generate that information are credible in the ways that they need to be credible um, in terms of answering these actionable questions. Okay, so I'm actually gonna start off with my main message. My main message is that epistemic risk and hazard and epistemic risk, which I'll unpack a little bit what that looks like in the context of climate modeling and modeling more generally here in a moment, but epistemic risk is that risk of getting it wrong. Okay, providing misleading information, inaccurate information, irrelevant information in response to a scientific inquiry. And there are hazards attached to that risk when that risk is actually realized. And so my claim is that this form of risk and managing those risks and those hazards in terms of having greater transparency, translation, and explicit and systematic communication about the adequacy for purpose of our models, of the simulations and experimental designs, and then the generated data is how the modeling community generally can contribute to actionable science and also climate justice. I will not go into the climate justice piece um, due to time constraints here, but some of that is actually mapped out on a poster that we have upstairs explaining what the um, task force related to climate justice is, if anybody is curious. Okay, so let me start out with kind of a conceptual landscape, if you will, of actionable science, because you've probably heard what this is, and the most basic definition that we have for actionable science that we can take from the literature is that it's use inspired research. It's providing information or research that is tailored towards users, or it's the providing of research or information for use in decision making context. What I've done is I've tried to kind of break down what this concept is a little bit more, and I see that there's two ways in which we can talk about actionable science and research. The first is we can talk about actionable science products, which would be things like data, possibly simulations. And then we can talk about the process. In other words, what we have to do in order to actually generate those things that are fit for use in actionable context. I'm here gonna focus on the product and more specifically on one aspect of those products, mainly that they have to be useful. In the literature, you see a lot of people say that actionable science products or products that are being used or information to be used in the decision making space needs to be useful, usable. Those are often used interchangeably. I like to actually divide them up because I think that usefulness is something that we use to describe the quality of the information and the knowledge. So it is the epistemic, if you will, and epistemic just means related to knowledge. Um, it's my fancy philosophy word um, that I can't help but to always use. Um, but usefulness is just the quality of knowledge, okay? Use, usability, um, which has often gotten a lot more attention in the actionable science literature, especially in the last decade, is the way that we need to take information kind of in its raw form and somehow translate it so that it's fit for use in a specified context, right? Where the context is the institutional context, the socio-political context, the cultural context. And there's been a lot of attention to the usability of information. How do we make it meaningful for our users? How is it appropriate? How does it have consequentiality? Meaning that how is it such that when we give them this information, they might decide something differently than if they didn't have the information at all, right? So that it actually has consequences in decision-making context. I don't actually care about that right now, I apologize. I care about the quality of knowledge. Now, I'm gonna take a step back because what I care about in thinking about the quality of 
generate those products and that knowledge. Here, Earth system models, uh, general circulation models, are the main thing that I'm talking about, although this, I think, has extension to hydrological models, ecological models, um, integrated assessment modeling. So it extends beyond just the context in which I'm going to present this problem. Um, but this is my perception of what a model is. It is a representation, but a perspective in terms of how it represents its target system. Okay, I think with GCMs, we can probably see this and other models of complex systems where we provide a perspective that's an appropriate perspective for answering a certain set of questions that the model was developed for. Because in modeling and representing a complex system, we have to make difficult decisions about what we're going to represent and how we're going to represent things that relate to why we're going about representing the system in the first place. And here, we're oversimplifying, we're simplifying, we're idealizing, we're obscuring, and we're even possibly omitting features of the target system when we're making decisions about how we're going to develop our representation. Okay, And the representational perspective of a model is a function of the interests, aims, and priorities of the research and the development of communities. And this also extends to decisions made about how you're going to configure the model, what your experimental setup is going to look like, um, those various features also. Purposes of GCMs, um, I'm going to go through this really quick, but right, GCMs are this kind of unique type of modeling system where unlike hydrology or socio-ecological modeling, we never are building models from the ground up to respond to a specific set of purposes. We just can't do that because of the breadth, right? Um, and the complexity of the system that we're actually trying to provide a representation of. So there's this long history of development and GCMs have largely been purposed to look at how the global emergent features of the system change under a variety of different forcings, and then also how you have energy exchanges or different relationships that might change um, between those emergent features, but also between the main components of the Earth system, which right we have as components of our models as well. Um, GCMs are increasingly, however, being applied to new purposes. Right? We have increases in resolution, we have increases in complexity, we have more comprehensive representations of parameter, uh, parameterizations or processes that are being parameterized in our models. And so there is this, this um, compelling force, if you will, within the community to apply these models to more and more problems, um, which is fine, it's just we need to make sure that that especially when we're working in an actual science space and we're providing information from these models for use in a decision-making context, that we are vetting the models um, in a really comprehensive, thorough manner. Um, because as I will show, the tendency to rely on historical empirical adequacy, does my model match up with observations, um, can leave us getting, as I think Aaron, um, the first speaker in the session said wonderfully, um, good answers for the wrong reasons. All right, so I'm going to turn back to epistemic risk and show you how all this fits together. So epistemic risk is very basically the risk of getting it wrong, okay? And specifically getting it wrong with respect to decisions that are made through the course of scientific inquiry. So in model building, in just basic in laboratory hypothesis testing, right? We make a series of decisions. We endorse assumptions, right? We make decisions about the approaches. We make decisions about the amount of evidence that is suitable for providing us with confidence in the rejection or the acceptance of our hypothesis. Um, and there's always a risk that when we're making that decision, it's not the appropriate decision for our end purposes, okay? And when that decision actually, like, is wrong, is inappropriate for our end purposes, a hazard is introduced, and it can lead to downstream harms, okay? Um, in model development, in model application specifically, there's what's known as representational risk, which is a specific kind of risk that comes about when we decide how or, um, sorry, what or how we're gonna represent certain features of the system that our model is targeting, and those decisions turn out to be inadequate for the ultimate purposes to which the model is going to be applied. Um, so the hazard is introduced when we make a decision about 
right, idealizing something or obscuring something because we have one set of purposes. Um, and that decision about what or how to represent something isn't doing the work that it needs to do to get us a reliable answer to our question. Um, it's inadequate for the model's ultimate purposes. There's also a risk that comes about if we're in a situation like we're often in, in global climate modeling, where we are taking or making choices about which models to apply to answer our questions. Um, this is known as um, frenetic risks, but um, this is essentially a risk that arises when you make a decision about what model you to use to collect um, statistical information um, to answer the questions that we might have. Um, and this is the main take home when we're working in the context of global climate modeling or earth system modeling, is that the presence of risk in the introduction of hazards is amplified and becomes especially salient or important when our models are repurposed, which is essentially kind of a little bit of all that we're doing in global climate modeling, because given the historical development, the model is inevitably going to contain artifactual representational decision things. Um, I can explain that a little bit later, probably better. Um, but um, from past decisions made about what the model was originally purposed for or purposed for 10 years ago, um, and we need to make sure that those are not going to interfere and cause representational risk when we reapply our model for various things. Um, so this is the ethical dimensions of using models in an actionable science space. Our model is inadequate in terms of its representational features for answering certain questions because we've repurposed it and we haven't done a comprehensive adequacy for purpose evaluation. Then we've introduced risks and in actionable context, this can unfortunately lead to a variety of different harms, such as maladaptation, malintervention, because there might be high degrees of inaccuracy, irrelevance, misleading, or largely incomplete results that we provide as answers or information that is used in answering these actionable questions. Okay, so I'm gonna give two quick examples um, of why we need to be doing this. So one example is a study of CMIP-5 models. The study was only recently published in 2021. A group at GLISA, which is the Great Lakes um, Integrated Science um, Center, um, looked at whether or not there was representational, like basic representational reliability in CMIP-5 models to allow for there to be downscaling from CMIP-5 models um, in the Great Lakes region. And they found that most CMIP-5 models do not simulate the Great Lakes in a way that captures their impact on the regional climate, um, which is a credibility issue for their projections about future climate in that region. And what they did is they actually looked through the extensive documentation of the CMIP-5 models to see, do they have representation of lakes in terms of three-dimensionality? So that you can capture the lake atmosphere land interactions that necessitate, or, or drivers rather, um, of the climate regimes um, in that area. They found that about a third of them do have three-dimensional lakes as part of um, the model features. But they found that some of them either didn't document how they represent lakes in the model documentation that, that is available um, publicly, or they had one-dimensional lakes or ocean grid cells where lakes ought to be. And then I'd say that that's probably about a third in red. They don't even represent lakes at all. Um, so if you are somebody from a Great Lakes region or a region where lakes make a really big difference for the climate, um, regional climate impacts, um, there's a lot of models that you really ought not be using, even if they're part of a large ensemble um, like CMIP. Another one, and this one I think really goes towards um, why we can't rely on historical empirical adequacy only when we're evaluating our models and thinking about their potential for um, use in decision-making context. So this is a Lerner paper from 2019 where what they did is they looked at models um, ability to provide reliable average runoff for um, various river basins. And what I want to point out here is model number nine, um, which is a, a pretty significant outlier there on what would be um, your left-hand side. So model number nine, which is the, the um, 
what's being shown up here um, is, is not the, the average runoff. Um, but model number nine, when you look at the average for Upper Colorado, it does really well. It's like middle of the pack. It's pretty consistent with observations. So if you're doing this analysis and you're like, I want one that does something good with average runoff, you might choose model number nine. But when they looked under the hood at changes to runoff via temperature and precipitation, they found that model number nine does like a really crap job at both of those. And why the average looks good is because of compensating errors. And what's more, and this is really crazy to me, but it's doing something that is physically unrealistic with respect to changes in temperature. It is having increased runoff with increase in temperature, which is inconsistent with our best, um, our best supported theory about what actually happens. Um, in runoff and high temperatures. So this is what I'm gonna kind of end with because I wanna leave a minute or two for questions. Um, but at the very least, I think we need to have um, explicit guidance about the representational limitations of our models. And what I mean here is that we need to not only say that they look good with respect to this set of observations and stuff, but we really need to be looking at the representational adequacy of the models where we need to be seeing if they have minimal representational adequacy. Do they contain the physical features that are important um, for determining or that have some kind of causal determination in relation to the phenomena of interest? Are they simulating processes correctly? And are, getting, are they getting the dynamics right? Um, so representational adequacy is something that we wanna look at under the hood of the model, we want to look at the calculation or the representation of processes, but we also want to look at those emergent structures and determine whether or not they're changing in a way that is consistent with physical theory into the future. And what does this mean for practice? Well, unfortunately, it means um, more work might need to be done um, because it's that translation piece between model developers um, and the people that apply the models and those end users that we kind of need to fill the gap or bridge that um, so we can start with having something like guidance documents so an analogy to this would be the climate data guide we can have a climate model or climate simulation guide um, that provides information about based on studies that that people like the ones in this group have done the model is adequate for answering these sorts of questions but don't use the model to do this sort of thing um decision and purpose transparency this is especially important when we're making decisions about scenarios experimental design and stuff because a lot of times those decisions are for certain purposes and that risk can be introduced when we repurpose those simulations or that experimental design or the data from that um, to do something differently. And we can employ translators um, and people that can translate a lot of the, the representational adequacy stuff to a qualitative form that is accessible to those downstream users who, if that hazard exists, it might cause harm for them. And then if you're curious, if we really wanna try and promote justice, we can, we can really revise and shift our practices and engage in kind of extensive co-production um, but I'll leave that for another talk. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Are there any questions? Jerry, go ahead. Yeah, everything you said is really important, I think. Um, but it's really difficult, too, as you know. In fact, I was amazed that that study on the Great Lakes was able to find out how the Great Lakes were even represented in models at that level of detail. Five years. It yeah. took them five years to do that. And this is, we've been down this road in a number of phases of CMIP where we've tried to get modeling groups to fill out some kind of a form to say, okay, what's in your model? Get model documentation. And there was a whole working group to come up with a form to fill, for modeling groups to fill out. And it turned out to be such an onerous task to fill out this form. It was like, Somebody calculated, somebody at GFDL tried to fill it out, and they calculated it took them 40 hours to fill out this form with all the details of, okay, what's in your convective conversation? What's in this? What's in that? And so it turned out most modeling groups just didn't do it, or they filled out part of it. And so this model documentation step is a really key one, but it's a really difficult one to get modeling groups to cooperate because they'll say, okay, it's in our papers, just look at our papers. But a lot of times it isn't in the papers, like even the Great Lakes thing. I didn't know how you figured that out. But that's, this is a real big issue, right? So I think this is a real good point you made. 
the other one about downstream problems, I was at a meeting once in Australia with a bunch of stakeholders. There was like sheep farmers and wheat farmers and cattle people. And, and their point was, uh, you know, the benefit they get from a good prediction uh, can be far outweighed by the harm they get from a bad prediction. And so they, they said, we'd rather know nothing than make a decision that may be wrong based on your prediction. So the, the, the comeback to that was, well, what can you do with probabilistic predictions? So if we say that there's a the model shows a 60% chance that you're going to have decreased precipitation over this time period, what what's your threshold for action? Does it have to be 80%? Does it have to be 90? Can it be 50? Can it be, and, and so then they start thinking, well, we don't really know. You know, so we say, well, all, the best we'll ever be able to do is to give you probabilistic information, right? And so that that translation step and how users use that kind of information, I think that's another really important uh, point that you made. So I think you know, it's, it's really tough problems, but they're really important. Yeah, thank you. And I'll just say that, that these are incredibly challenging. And I know that the CMIP community and other communities have been trying to figure out what to do about this. Um, and there's no easy answers. Um, but I don't think that because it's a hard problem, we shouldn't try to make progress. Um, OK, thank you. All right, we're going to move on to the next talk by Saravana. And for those of you in the back, there's plenty of room in the front if you want to come up and have a seat. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be back here at NCAR to give a talk. Uh, I, I didn't realize they accepted abstract and philosophy of modeling because I'm, I have an interest in that. And now that it is possible, next time you might see me submitting one. But what I usually do is I sneak in a slide on the philosophy into my regular talk, which is what I'm going to do today. Um, so yesterday there was a discussion about of what people want from models, and there was somebody who said that they want high resolution local prediction. That, that's what they want. But what they really want is trustworthy high resolution local predictions. They, they assume it's trustworthy, but they're not often articulated. But then, if you've got models, how do you make it trustworthy? Or, um, first of all, I would say you need large ensemble. If you can't do a large ensemble, don't provide a prediction to anybody. I think it's, it's irresponsible. It's a pretty strong statement, but that's what it is. And you need multiple models. And a good example is Dylan's talk. He showed ENSO going up, going down, going in the middle. And if you take one model, even if you do a large ensemble and say ENSO is going to, go, going to go up and somebody goes downstream and uses it, that's not responsible either. And then you need high resolution to eliminate biases. And my talk's about high resolution, and um, I'll justify what I'm doing, but I'm putting the cart before the horse because I, I'm doing research and I want to know what, what high resolution does. That's important, but if it's going to be used by somebody, we need those first two things in place before you give it to them. And people forget that. They, they say, high resolution, let's give it to people. You shouldn't do that. Okay. But it's still fun to do high resolution research. And at some point, it will trickle down. So I'm putting the, I'm talking about the cart and the horses, the large ensembles and the multi-models. So uh, I'm, before I get to the advertise talk, I wanted to advertise some uh, IHES runs done by NCAR and Texas A&M. Um, these are some recent results, which I was very impressed. Uh, in my 30 years in career in modeling, these are the best pictures I've seen. I'll show that in a moment. Uh, so in IHES, we did run a 25-kilometer atmosphere, 10-kilometer model, and you can compare it to the 100-kilometer. And people show these all the time, and it looks good. But is that really useful? So these are results that, these are not my slides. These are from Ping Chang's group. Um, they looked at the 99 percentile rainfall in DJF, and the left is observations. The middle is the high-res model and the right is the low risk model and i've never seen correspondence between observations and and they uh, and models especially for something like extreme precip that's very noisy and this doesn't work in summer i don't have the summer slide it looks pretty bad in the summer but for whatever reason the bioclinic driven large-scale rainfall is really converging at this resolution i can't see how you'll do better given that even the no data is noisy and so, as I said, this is one of the best pictures I've seen uh, in, in um, climate presentation. I asked, asked the postdoc to check if he got the 
things right, but he did check and it looks bad in the summer. That's proof that it's not just copying data from somewhere else. Uh, if you look at globally, uh, that's top two observations, NOAA CPC and trim of rainfall. And again, this is 99% general rainfall. And you can see bottom, uh, the left is 100 kilometer model and the right is 25 kilometers. And there's an amazing qualitative difference between, the two, between these two. And there's something I didn't expect. When you go to high resolution, some things get better and some things get worse and sort of it's a mixed bag. But for this particular quantity, uh, it seems to be doing really well. And this is actually a very important quantity. Extreme rainfall is one of the things that insurance companies want to know, for example. So there's something happening here, especially in wintertime rainfall, that's worth paying attention to. So that's it from the IHES and Ping Chang's results. Uh, I'm going to go to, oh, sorry, there's one more. This is, so you can use this model to predict uh, the future. Again, cautions is one model, and it's a three-member ensemble. It's pretty small, but this gives you a flavor of uh, what you can see. And so that with a very good prediction of current extremes, and this is what you can expect for future uh, towards the century's end, and you get this increase in extreme rainfall. But I think the correspondence in the present makes this prediction more credible than some other model that may not have this good correspondence. And so you don't need K scale to get, I, mean, I would say with a picture like this, it reached convergence for this particular quantity. I don't see how K scale would do better than what I showed you. Many, there are many other things that could do better, but not that one. And so this shows the, uh, the PDF of that, and, and the red is at the bottom, the red is the future, and the blue is the present. And you can see the, the model is getting the PDF quite well as well. And these are some things which we looked at only recently. That's why uh, I found these pictures in the last six months or so. Pink couldn't be here, so that's why I'm showing it for him. Back to my talk. Um, so this is about looking at a sort of unusual quantity, but something that's going to be useful in the net zero future. That's People, people look at geopotentials and various other things and climate sensitivity. But this is something that's going to be useful in the future and actually it's useful now. Uh, this is something that happened on September 22nd last year. State of California sent out a text saying stop using power because they're going to run out of power. And apparently this saved the state from rolling blackouts because there's more renewable energy and there's less fossil fuels and renewable, renewable energy is more unreliable. So, so they had to rely on a text message to save themselves. This is Texas forecast for the coming week. You see up there, June 16th, it's gonna get pretty close to capacity. And this is pretty early in the season for Texas. So again, we're getting close to the limits where we, we might run out of power. And this is something which may become worse in the future. And so you have to prepare for it. You may need batteries, but you need quantitative information to plan for the future and models can help you do that. that. That's sort of the main topic of my talk. So wind and solar power are intrinsically variable, uh, but they're vulnerable to synoptic events. And you can get, an, actually the, uh, the smoke event in the Northeast, it really cuts solar power, which is unexpected. So all of those things can happen when you have renewable sources. So what I'm going to look at is how these uh, reductions in renewable power relate to weather patterns. So instead of regressing against the NSO index, I'm going to regress against the solar wind power index. And this is follows up a paper by, um, um, was published recently, which looks at the meteorology and climatology of historical weekly wind and solar power resource droughts. They call them droughts for some reason. This is from the power community. Uh, it's just a week in which the average wind or solar power is in the first percentile. That's low. And you can also look at compound wind and solar where both fail in that particular week. And these are pretty qualitative and we use simple formulas for the wind power and solar power. So these are not practically applicable, but they give you a sensitivity study of what might happen. So weather forecast models have high precision, high spatial resolution, and they can predict most of these events like heat waves quite well. Uh, how well can we do with climate models? Because if you're looking at the future, climate models need to do that well. And how will these change in the future? And first, we'll verify how well models can do in the present for something like this. So what we're going to do is use the CSM high resolution, uh, low resolution runs done at IHES, and compare it to ERA-5 observations. So this shows the power supply and power demand in top and bottom. And the, and the x-axis is the week, so the 52 weeks in the year, and the middle is summer. And the black dots are wind power droughts, and the magenta is solar power droughts, and the blue diamonds are combined, wind and solar droughts. 
And often there's a complementarity between wind and solar. In the summer, you have a lot of solar and you have less wind. In the winter, you have more windiness, pyroclinic phenomena, but you get less sun and it sort of uh, compensates to some extent. And so the wind, uh, wind power droughts tend to occur in the summer and the solar power droughts tend to occur in the winter. And then you can see the power curves below and they're more peaked. So the summer power demand peaks in the middle of summer and the winter heating demand peaks in the winter. But these two have to match or we have to bring in reserves of fossil fuel or batteries or fossil fuel, fuel plants that you turn on as needed or geothermal or something like that or nuclear has to come in. So what are the weather patterns that are predict these droughts? And what you see on the top, uh, first we pick an index, and here we're looking at Western North America, WNA. And so you average over the box and you look at an index of uh, wind power and what is the synoptic pattern that precedes that. And what you see is that tripolar pattern that precedes wind droughts. And if you look at solar droughts in the next panel, the middle panel, you get a low pressure system uh, in that region. And you tend to expect low pressure systems with solar droughts because you want cloudiness. A high, high pressure system tend to be clear. And so that's something you expect. And the previous study I showed was looking at that in the data. What we'll do is to go beyond data and, and look at models. So what you see below is the same thing done to era five. And the models, oh, sorry, bottom is, so all of these are uh, data still. And the bottom is the compound routes. And what you see is for the compound routes, it tends to be dominated by the pattern in the wind routes, the tripole pattern. So that's in the Western North America. And now we look at Texas, that's where we are. And again, we look at power supply, you get this uh, seasonal cycle, and then you get the wind and solar power droughts. And what you can see is, uh, um, again, so these are the solar power droughts, and these are the, so that's sort of black, the wind droughts, and these are solar power droughts. And again, you see the matching to the power supply below. So these are in the data, and next we're going to look at how well a uh, model simulates that. Uh, so, so these are uh, um, the wind patterns that precede the Texas wind droughts. Uh, again, you see it's a dipolar pattern, but this is further upstream than what we saw in uh, uh, the Western North America. And if you look at the solar droughts, we don't get a low pressure pattern in Texas when this is happening. Yeah, again, so the intuition that you'd expect low pressure be coincident with solar drafts doesn't seem to hold as far as Texas is concerned. And again, one thing we see is that the compound droughts tend to be dominated by the wind droughts patterns. So if you are forecasting weather and if you forecast these patterns, then if you're dependent on renewable energy, you might want to get your reserves ready. So let's look at models now. Uh, first, the top is era five that we discussed earlier. The next is the CESM high resolution. That's the 0.25 degrees atmosphere and uh, 10 kilometer ocean. And the bottom is the low resolution. Actually, in this case, what you see is the high res and low res look quite similar, but they have biases. Uh, if you look at week 30, for example, 30, 35, um, the models tend to be flat, whereas um, the data tend to show a trough near uh, week 30, 35. So the models are biases, and the biases seem to be similar in both high res and low res. And what we can do is to do a bias correction. So just remove the bias in the wind and solar um, insulation. And when you remove the bias on the right, you can see the correspondence between uh, observation models really high. So a simple bias correction is able to fix the errors that we see in the wind and solar um, power prediction in the models. So let's do uh, look at the future of uh, wind and solar power in Western North America. So on the top is the historic that we already saw. At the bottom is the future prediction of wind and solar power droughts. And what we see in Western North America is wind and solar droughts have increased in the future. And the demand, which we haven't shown here, is actually higher because the cooling degree days in summer, which is a measure of how much uh, air conditioning you might need in the summer is much higher. And so there's going to be big challenges for the energy transition to wind and solar power in, in Western North America. Again, this is one model. It's a pretty small ensemble. So for the conclusion to be robust, we need to repeat it with, you know, with different models and with a larger ensemble. And we can also look at 
wind and solar power with Texas. The top is the historic, and the um, sec uh, bottom is the future predicted using uh, CSM runs. We actually see decreased wind and solar power droughts in Texas. So it's different from Western North America. And it turns out that the stress on the uh, energy system during cooling degree, cooling degree days is gonna be a little higher in the future, but not as big as in Western North America. I guess, I guess one interpretation is Texas is already hot. It's not gonna get a whole lot hotter. Uh, but and so Texas is actually doing really well with renewable energy, which is not what you might think. I think it overtook California recently because uh, there's money in Texas for in wind energy and, and solar energy. So the projection for Texas based on this one model is that things won't get that bad. Actually, they may actually get better in, uh, in, uh, in this respect. So the basic summary of my talk is that the spatial structural relationship between power droughts and weather uh, varies geographically. Simple intuition like low pressure systems and, and solar droughts doesn't seem to hold. We need to do more analysis to figure out what the exact dynamical relation, relationship is. But this is something which power companies will probably use in the future, or even recently in the near future, to plan for the reserves. A higher resolution may not automatically improve things. I just showed you previously an example where high resolution made a dramatic difference, but in this case, it didn't make a whole lot of difference. But the bias correction did, uh, and it's important. So how do you do the bias correction in the future? We just did the same bias correction in the future, which is cheating. But we need to figure out how to reduce the biases so we can have credible project projections of the future. And in Western North America, there could be big challenges as the droughts increase and the energy demand increases. And in Texas, the projections based on this limited um, model set is that it, that's not going to be the case. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Go ahead. Okay, so you mentioned wanting to uh, fix the biases in the model so that you won't have to bias correct. Yeah. Um, in weather forecasting models, the models have known biases and it's very standard to correct those biases before you do the final product. As long as you know that the biases in the model don't change in the future, don't don't you think it would be fine to keep using those same? Yeah, your, your, your answer, conditional answer is correct, but we don't know that they won't change in the future. Yeah. That, that only models can tell us that. So that's a problem. If, if, if you assume linearity in the system, that's true, but there is nonlinearity in the climate system. So, so we need to remove the biases without having to do this bias correction. But the forecasting, we, climate is stationary in a one-year time scale, so you can do that. But in a 30 year time scale, it's not, it's not stationary. That's why we worry about it. Any other questions? Go ahead, Isla. I uh, was wondering how much variance is explained by the large scale? Is there scope for just kind of statistically downscaling based on large scale patterns and whatever is related to that in the observations uh, rather than high resolution? I didn't understand the question. Could you? So you showed the large scale patterns and how they relate to the yeah, that, that Yeah, that the um, precursor to these droughts, yeah. The so previous. Do, we, do we really need high resolution or do, do we just need to get these large scale patterns and then kind of statistically relate them? Oh, in this case, I think we don't because we're talking about very large scale patterns. We may need it uh, for the small scale ground level winds. That's where we, I think that's where the problem is in the ground level winds, but upper level. 500 millibar patterns, I think the coastal resolution model is fine. It, I, I'm guessing it's probably fine. I guess, do we have enough information in the observations to know what the low level winds are that relate to those large scale patterns so we can just kind of miss that, don't need to simulate them in the model? For the present climate, yes. Yeah. For the future, we need the model, right? Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Our next speaker is going to be Steve Yeager. All right, thanks. So um, let me give another talk uh, of work coming out of the project formerly known as IHESP. Um, so I'd like to thank um, all of these co-authors from uh, Texas A&M and NCAR, in particular Ping Chang and Gokan, for contributing to this work. 
what we're doing in this study is a direct comparison of high res and low res decadal prediction systems. So we've um, probably all heard about the CSM decadal prediction large ensemble. It's kind of uh, outlined here on the, the right side, this low res version of our decadal prediction system using CESM. We used CESM 1.1 with the component model components listed there all at nominal one degree resolution. <clears throat> used RCP 8.5 future forcing. It was initialized using full field initialization, um, at least in the ocean and sea ice. It used this BOSI initialization method, forced ocean sea ice simulation. Um, so sort of OMIP one-ish uh, simulation. Uh, we did not initialize the atmosphere and land, however, in DPLE, we just took it from, uh, we took restarts from the uninitialized CSM large ensemble. We did 64 hindcasts initialized each November 1st, and we ran those out 122 months. So this is the decadal time scale. And we ran a 40 member ensemble, hence the DPLE. And it was a very expensive experiment that we completed back around 2017. Um, and we're gonna compare it to this new high res decadal prediction system. So the HRDP uses a slightly different version of the CSM model 1.3. Um, it also uses a spectral element cam um, and um, otherwise similar component models as in DPLE, but with horizontal resolution changed from one degree to 10th degree in the ocean and sea ice and quarter degree in the atmosphere and land. The, the experimental setup is very similar to DPLE. We're using a uh, FOSI method to initialize the ocean and sea ice, but now we're using a high res FOSI. So there could be some differences in the ocean and sea ice initial conditions that um, could be impactful. We're also initializing the atmosphere and land, um, which we did not do in DPLE, but I think the, the skill differences that I'm gonna be showing are not related to these differences in how we initialize atmosphere and land. And of course, we uh, could not afford to run uh, the extensive set of uh, samples that we ran with DPLE. So we, we initialized every other year from 1976 to 2016. Um, so that's 21 start dates. Uh, we ran only five years, so 62 months, rather than uh, full decadal uh, hindcasts and ensemble size of 10. Uh, and, and this experiment is much more expensive. It's 100 times more expensive than running um, the low res fully coupled model. And so here's, here's the main result. This is forecast year one through five uh, anomaly correlation coefficient. This is for annual means. All fields here remapped to five by five uh, grid and verified against the observational data listed there. Um, on the far right, I'm showing the skill difference for surface air temperature, precipitation, and sea level pressure, and I'm only plotting that difference where it's significant. So what you see here in the upper right is um, this big increase in skill in the eastern, uh, southeastern tropical Pacific, and then throughout the southern ocean in surface air temperature. In uh, annual precipitation, you see this um, big increase again in the eastern tropical Pacific, which is a region where you might uh, expect there would be some um, global ramifications of being able to predict uh, convective precipitation more skillfully. And then for sea level pressure, there's sort of this uh, global uh, increased skill with some areas of degradation as well. And, and just to quantify that, that statement about overall skill improvement, here's, here's a table. <coughs> the top figures, the top numbers here show the percentage of the global um, um, surface area where HRDP 10 member ACC is significantly greater than or less than DPLE. So um, for surface air temperature, 26% of global area is, is significantly more skillful than DPLE, 23% is less skillful. And then below that is the, um, the average change in uh, ACC in these areas of, of uh, significant difference. And so um, even though the SAT percentages are pretty similar, you can see that the, the, the net improvement 
where it's more skillful is, is quite a bit larger. And you can kind of get that sense by eye that um, there's overall skill improvement despite these areas of blue. So the argument we're gonna uh, make in this study is that the enhanced global skill is related to an improved Southern Ocean evolution via a Southern Ocean to tropical Pacific teleconnection, in particular, kind of this relation between the Eastern uh, Pacific sector of the Southern Ocean and the Southeast tropical Pacific. Before I get to that, I wanna just um, show you briefly a, a similar skill comparison but um, for detrended fields. So this gives us um, a suggestion that a lot of these um, significant improvements are um, maybe reflecting more skillful prediction of internal variability rather than just an improved response to external forcing. Um, so th these areas of skill improvement like the um, Eastern Tropical Pacific and Eastern uh, Pacific sector of the Southern Ocean are resilient to detrending, suggesting that they're um, may be related to internal variations. And um, Ping has a graduate student who's done a more sophisticated removal of the forced signal and, and um, the skill comparison shows a, a similar, um, similar pattern. Also, just to break it down by season, we can see that uh, in austral winter, this um, improvement in the Southern Ocean is more pronounced, suggestive of a stronger teleconnection in the tropical Pacific, and then for, um, for DJFM, we see this um, possible relation between this in improvement in tropical precipitation and then this significant enhancement in precipitation over the west coast of the continental US. In addition to um, overall improved skill, I just was showing the uh, anomaly correlation skill differences. We also see improved signal to noise in the high resolution system, which is of great interest because um, um, there's a signal to noise paradox that's been identified in seasonal to decadal climate predictions. And uh, I'm not gonna um, get into too much uh, detail on this. Um, the uh, Scaife and Smith paper is, is a good one to check out if, if you're not familiar with it. But the metric that um, is used to characterize this paradox is the ratio of predictable components. It's the anomaly correlation coefficient when you verify against observations divided by the signal to total uh, variance fraction of your um, of your hindcast ensemble. And if this is greater than one, then it means that you're predicting the observations better than you're able to predict your model, which is, a, which is uh, why they call it a paradox. And to show improvement in signal to noise, I'm, I'm showing you these uh, global um, histograms or, or um, joint PDFs of um, ACC on the y-axis and RPC on the x-axis. And then the, the shading here gives you the percentage area of the globe characterized by these, by these skill score combinations. And so what I want you to uh, focus on is, is areas where ACC is greater than 0.5, so that's above this dashed line. And we can just focus on sea level pressure. You can see with a 10-member DPLE, we've got um, a certain amount of um, a global area that's uh, greater than that has an ACC greater than 0.5 and we can increase that when we uh, go to a 40 member ensemble so we add more ensemble members and we increase that area where we've got um, high skill greater than 0.5 but that comes at the expense of a lower signal to total a signal to total is given by the the um, slope uh, of any given point. And you can see that the slope has gotten lower. So we've got lower signal to total when we add more ensemble members because we've got a, a larger total in the denominator here. And that pushes your RPC values out into this territory greater than one. So this is sort of emblematic of the signal to noise paradox. We can, we can get better skill with a larger ensemble size, but it comes at the expense of, of this um, high RPC. And I'm also showing that here on the right, which is just the sum of um, area greater than uh, ACC uh, 0 0.5. And you can compare here the, the blue and the red curve. So blue is 10 member, red is 40 member. And you can see that you, you increase the area, but it, you shift this PDF over to the right into our high, higher RPC territory. And now, now I'm showing you the result from um, 10 member HRDP. So now, um, it's the same ensemble size as DPLE 10, 
and we get a much bigger area of high scale, but it, it doesn't seem to uh, give us the same signal to noise problems uh, that we get when we just try to enhance skill by in increasing ensemble size with a low resolution system. And that's again shown here uh, in this summary plot at the right where um, the high res is in black, so much greater area of high skill, but still with RPC near one. And so conclusion here is that high resolution enhances skill more than a quadrupling of ensemble size and apparently without introducing widespread signal to noise paradox. All right, so what I've shown you so far is that we've, we've got globally enhanced skill, we've got improved signal to noise characteristics in this high resolution system. I want to put this in a mechanistic uh, context um, by considering some of the recent literature that's linked Southern Ocean processes to the tropical Pacific. And I'm just going to choose this paper by um, Rob Wills that illustrates some key points. So what, what they show in Wills et al. is that the um, observed SST trend over the um, recent decades uh, shows this enhanced warming in the Western Pacific and, um, and uh, relative cooling in the Eastern Pacific. But the multi-model mean from CMIP models shows the reverse. It shows enhanced warming in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. And uh, you see similar deficiencies in, uh, in terms of the sea level pressure trend, which shows this um, weakening of the Aleutian low um, uh, and, and other features that are not captured in the multi model mean from CMIP 5 and 6. And so what uh, Wills et al. point out uh, uh, that other authors have also pointed out is that in observations, there's this enhanced Western Pacific warming, Eastern Pacific cooling, a strengthened Walker circulation, and Southern Ocean cooling. Whereas in uh, cement um, five and six miles, you get Southern Ocean warming. And so there's a suggestion of this uh, relation between this, def this deficiency in, in getting the Southern Ocean uh, um, response to external forcing and, and getting the tropical Pacific gradients right. And it doesn't appear to be um, explained by internal variability. So this is what is shown in this plot on the right. Um, there's a small chance uh, based on looking at large ensembles from a number of models that um, this can be explained um, due to internal variability. So now if we look at um, our forecasted trends, so this is a forecast year one through five uh, trend map analysis. The top row is observations, so just kind of replicating the wills at all result. In HRDP, we're able to forecast um, this muted warming in the Southern Ocean and this correct um, trend in the tropical Pacific uh, temperature gradient, uh, but we're not able to do so in 10 member DPLE. The Southern Ocean warms and we get this relative warming in the Eastern Pacific. And then you see similar improvements uh, in the sea level pressure trends with this Aleutian low um, weakening much better represented uh, in HRDP 10 than in DPLE. And so just to dig into that a bit more, here I'm showing you um, regional time series of surface temperature. We can start over here on the right. Uh, this is the Western Pacific minus the Eastern Pacific. So these two boxes, black is the observations, blue is DPLE 10. It shows this, this um, weakening of the um, west to east temperature gradient, whereas HRDP is correctly getting this intensification of the Western to uh, Eastern Pacific temperature gradient. In the southeastern tropical Pacific, DPLE 10 is showing the spurious warming after about 2000, whereas HRDP 10 is more stable and actually shows signs of some decadal skill uh, in this region. And then if we go down to the Southern Ocean, we see that DPLE 10 is also showing this, this very spurious warming that is not simulated in HRDP 10. And so our argument is that the spurious uh, warming of the eastern tropical Pacific and low res is emanating from the southern ocean, the spurious warming in the southern ocean driving a spurious warming in the eastern tropical Pacific that's ameliorated in high resolution. And uh, that causal argument is supported by this uh, sequence of uh, ACC maps and skill difference maps. This is showing now by forecast year one, two, three, out to five. And what you see is that um, in forecast year one, um, there's no real improvement in the tropical Pacific in high resolution, although there is improvement in the Southern Ocean. And you see that in forecast year two as well with the Southern Ocean 
scale um, much improved in high resolution, but not the tropics. And then forecast year three is where you see this improvement in the Southern Ocean sort of communicated to the uh, Eastern Tropical Pacific related to um, the low res system here, losing skill in the Eastern Pacific sector of the Southern Ocean and hence losing skill in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. So it seems like the, the, the Tropical Pacific skill improvements derive from the Southern Ocean skill improvements and not the other way around. So um, understanding this mechanistically is, is still a work in progress. And I just wanna um, show some speculative thoughts at this point. Um, we initialized both of these from forced ocean sea ice simulations. Both of these fossies are forced with the observed SAM trend in the Southern Ocean that I'm plotting here. And yet these fossies have very different responses in terms of the uh, ocean overturning in the Southern Ocean. So here's the low res fossi, the contours of the time mean overturning in density space, this negative cell here is the Antarctic bottom water cell, and here's the upwelling of circumpolar deep water. And the, the, the colors show then the 30-year um, trend in response to SAM. So what you see in low res is this intensification of the Antarctic bottom water cell that you don't see in high res. Instead, in high res, you see uh, a, an, a, an intensification and poleward expansion of this upwelling cell. So very different responses in the ocean component, depending on whether you parameterize your Southern Ocean eddies or whether you resolve them explicitly. And that has impacts on the heat transport response in the ocean. You can just focus on the bottom panels here showing the trend over this time period in the low res fossi, the total trend is to, is to transport more heat in the ocean towards the pole, whereas in high res, the, the opposite trend uh, is found. So there's a reduction of poleward heat transport in high res that's opposite that in low res. And that has implications for sea ice. So in FOSI, high res FOSI is able to simulate this increase in Antarctic sea ice extent, uh, just comparing black and dashed black here, whereas the low res FOSI fails at getting that increase in Antarctic sea ice extent. And then that improvement in the FOSI translates into some skill at forecasting this uh, upward trend in Antarctic sea ice extent, at least in the first uh, couple of forecast years. All right, and just finally, it, there's some indications, there's a recent paper using a um, robust diagnostic technique that the, the observed trend in the Southern Ocean looks like this, and that uh, bears a, a pretty close resemblance to what we're getting in high res, but not in low res. So to summarize, um, we did this direct comparison of high res, low res decayal prediction systems. Uh, it seems that there's overall skill improvement for surface air temperature precipitation and sea level pressure, although results vary from region to region. Um, overall, there's, there seems to be improvement both in skill and signal to noise characteristics. And to first order, this improved realism in high res appears to be related to uh, improved Southern Ocean evolution that probably partly forced and partly internal and associated teleconnections to the tropical Eastern Pacific. Um, and, and this uh, decayal prediction result, I think offers a new line of evidence in support of a hypothesized role of the Southern Ocean as a global climate pacemaker. And that's been um, the topic of uh, several recent papers. Um, I've listed uh, some of them here. And, and then we speculate that the eddy resolving ocean model in high res is a key factor and that um, you get this improved ocean driven southern ocean cooling in high res that we're not getting in the eddy parameterized low res. But um, further investigation is needed to, to quantify the, the relative roles of other factors that could be contributing to improved performance, such as mesoscale ARC interaction, which is present in high res but absent in low res. Uh, possible mean state bias reductions, improved SST cloud feedbacks, uh, et cetera, um, all of which could also be um, playing a role. So with that, I'll stop and take questions. Thank you. Any questions for Steve? Jerry. So I guess the obvious question is, um, and maybe it's in some of these papers, what's the mechanism that's connecting the cooling in the Southern Ocean up into the tropical Pacific? Is it like a Pacific Realm mode kind of mechanism? 
some kind of West feedback that gets the cooling up or the, makes that connection? Or what do you think is actually making that connection? Um, I think, you know, the, there's mechanisms that are spelled out in, in the Chung and Dong at all papers that um, we're sort of leaning on. And um, I don't, I don't personally uh, know. I would um, ask Isla, who's our co-author and resident atmospheric uh, dynamics expert, what's going on. I guess I would ask Clara if she's, if she's here. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think it is what you said, but I, there's also a, yeah, evidence from Southern Ocean pacemakers that it matters. The Clyde feedbacks matter a lot because I think Southern Ocean pacemakers in CSM1 did not produce the signal, but there's a new paper forthcoming by Sarah Kang that uses CSM2 and does produce the signal. So I think it, it's what you said, but and I'll, yeah, the representation of the Clyde feedbacks, I think is important. Although this was CSM1, so I guess that's something to look into. Is that it could be even bigger in CSM2. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to move on to our next talk. So our next speaker is Emily Gordon. All right, um, perfect. So first of all, I'd like to um, thank the conveners for having me to speak. This is some work that I've been doing as part of my PhD with Libby Barnes at um, Colorado State University just up the road. So I've been looking at a, um, an interpretable neural network approach to identifying source of sources of predictability on decadal timescales. Um, and I've been looking in the CES Entry Large Ensemble for this. So just sort of to motivate with what sort of area that I'm thinking about is that when we're thinking in the future climate, so sort of in the next 30 years, when we're thinking about predictability on a decadal timescale, we're thinking about predictability from external forcing in the system and internal variability in the system. So what do I mean by this? Um, first of all, we know that um, anthropogenic climate change means that temperatures will continue to rise in the future. And so this actually gives us a measure of predictability about the, about the future because we can say, you know, in the next 10 years, it's a pro probably a pretty good estimation to say that it's going to be warmer. However, we also have internal climate variability, which modulates um, the amount of warming that we feel. So even to the extent that sometimes we can have regional cooling. And so when we're thinking about this, we're thinking about large scale patterns of variability, like the Pacific decadal oscillation or Pacific decadal variability, or Atlantic multi-decadal variability. And these have been shown to provide um, predictability on these decadal timescales. However, when we've been looking at these um, modes of variability, we are looking in the historical climate and the pre-industrial climate. So the question I'm interested in is in the near future, when we are having an, a, you know, an even um, larger signal from the anthropogenic climate change, will we be able to use um, these sort of modes of variability as sources of predictability? So here I'm plotting um, a single member of the uh, CES M2 Large Ensemble averaged over a 10 by 10 degree box in the North Pacific Ocean. I'm showing the annual mean SST in um, the blue curve, and then the ensemble mean or the forced response in the black line. Um, and so we can see that, you know, from this black line, yes, in the ensemble mean temperatures will increase, but we have quite a lot of variability about this mean. Um, and so, especially in this sort of near term, I've highlighted um, how with these decadal sea surface temperature trends, so 10 year trends on this single member, we can see that we will have periods of enhanced warming, but we will also have periods of cooling, um, even with this high anthropogenic forcing. So I wanna know, will we be, ever be able to predict these periods of you know, enhanced warming or cooling? So I'm gonna think about um, calculating these 10 year trends within this, um, 2020 to 2050, 2060 period, and then building a distribution of these trends and ranking them in tersiles. And we're going to want to predict um, whether our future uh, SST trend will, which tersile it's going to be in. So I'm thinking about a machine learning approach to this. And I want to be able to uh, attribute whether our prediction skill is coming from the forced response to climate change or from internal variability. So into this machine learning model, I'm uh, inputting information about the forced response and the internal variability of a single member. So for one prediction um, problem, we would have uh, information over our 15 year input period. So in this example, it would be information about the internal variability of a member from 2005 to 2020. 
and um, the forced response from 2005 to 2020, and then it would be predicting the uh, future SST trend from 2020 to 2030. And this prediction would be a simple classification of whether the future SST trend would be in the upper, middle, or lower third of this 2020 to 2050, 2060 um, distribution. Great. Okay. So I am going to go through a bit of methodology here. Um, if you're not interested in machine learning, then you can sort of tune out and I'll tell you when to come back in. But if you are, then great, stick with me. Okay. So we're going to connect each of our um, maps to a separate, separate neural network. So we're going to give our forced response map to a neural network and our internal variability map to a neural network and get it and get both of these networks to say, make your tercile prediction about the future. And then we're going to sum them and say the, the full prediction that we're going to take is the sum of the predictions from the two ne neural networks. And these are trained at the same time. So the neural networks have to learn to sort of cr uh, correctly weight their contributions to a uh, um, future prediction. And because I have lots of time, I am going to go through some example predictions because I think this is just really like super fun. OK, so. Here I'm showing a prediction where if we look at the top network, or I'm calling this the external forcing network or the EF network, this is predicting the upper tercile or the red node um, with a prediction of about 0 0.258. Um, the internal variability network is also putting all of its weight on the upper tercile node and together they are summing to uh, make this our full prediction. And then we use this thing called a softmax activation, which um, retains the relative ranks of our predictions. And it means that upper tercile is our winning prediction. Woohoo, good job network. Okay, here is a different prediction. In this case, the external forcing network is still predicting the upper tercile. However, this time the internal variability network is saying, no, I think this future prediction is gonna be in the lower tercile of our, um, of our distribution. And it's putting quite a lot of weight on this prediction. Um, and then when we find after we do the summation that the internal variability network contribution has sort of overcome the forced response contribution to the point where it is now the winning prediction. And so we can say that the internal variability information is the reason that our combined network is making um, the, uh, a correct prediction. And I'll just say that these two predictions I've shown are real predictions from my neural network making predictions um, this one is model year 2033 to 2042. So I mean, your network is able to use internal variability to make correct predictions in the near future in the CESM2 large ensemble. Cool. Okay, so I have used, uh, trained these neural networks for every sort of 10 by 10 degree box in the ocean. And then here I am showing the uh, accuracy of these neural networks between 2020 and 2050 and by design random chance is 33%. And so sort of darker colors are the places where our neural networks are more accurate. So we're seeing more accuracy in the North Atlantic, North Pacific and Southern Indian Oceans. And I'm sorry, this reference should be 2021. Um, but either way, we have um, our neural networks are making sensible predictions, which is a good sign that we can continue to sort of investigate what these um, sources of predictability are in our neural network. Cool, so I'm gonna go over a method for uh, attributing skill to internal variability in these networks. So first, I, this is the figure I showed before, where we've calculated the accuracy at each 10 by 10 location. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna test the sensitivity of our network to the internal variability input. So here I am keeping the information about the false response the same, but I'm scrambling the information that I give to the network about the internal variability and uh, input this as a new testing set into the neural networks. So for example, I could give it a neural network um, uh, external forcing map from 2020 to 2030, but just give it some garbage, but correctly distributed garbage, because that's important. Um, and say, still predict 2030 to 2040. And we can see how much the uh, information from internal variability mattered for a neural network to make the correct prediction. And then so do this everywhere and recalculate the accuracy of our neural networks on this scrambled data. And so that's what I'm showing here. The figure on the top left is our accuracy that we had before. And then on the bottom left, this is the accuracy on the shuffled internal variability data. And then the difference between these is the sort of model's uh, sensitivity or the model's dependence on internal variability. And anywhere that is um, 
is unstippled is a place where internal variability um, was uh, statistically significantly increased the neural network's accuracy. And so an interpretation of this um, center figure is that if the neural networks only use the force response for their predictions, this figure would be zeros everywhere because internal variability wouldn't have mattered. However, internal variability did matter because we have all of these red regions. And so a really fun key takeaway here is that internal variability significantly increases our neural network's accuracy above external forcing, so showing that it could be a source of um, predictability in um, the sort of near future period. Okay, so I have some more time, and so I'm really excited about some new stuff I've been doing. Um, looking at, you know, we've got these points, we're saying internal variability is important. The next question is, what, uh, what, what is leading to predictability from internal variability at these grid points? So what I'm gonna do is we take these grid points where internal variability is important for um, prediction, so the ones that are unstippled in this left figure, and then push our testing data through again, which means that we can get um, a sort of a time series or um, prediction outcome for each testing sample for every single grid point um, that where internal variability matters. And then we take these sort of timed, uh, time series of accuracy and we look and we k-means cluster them to see where prediction skill co-varies with input state. So I'm gonna maybe just sort of say that all again because I used a lot of words. So we have points on the globe where internal variability matters for predictability. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the prediction outcome for every single testing sample. And then we're gonna cluster the prediction outcomes to see which um, grid points are correct for the same internal variability state. Cool, okay. So um, what we get from our k-means clustering, and so I've done, done for those people who like clustering stuff, this, we found that six clusters was ideal using the elbowing and also silhouette score. And we find that we have sort of three obvious spatial regions that form these sort of prediction, uh, sort of coherent prediction clusters. So first of all, we have grid cells that resemble the PDO horseshoe um, and digging into the mechanisms behind this. I found that as you might ex expect, the predictability for these grid points is derived from the time scale of the PDO. We have this tropical Pacific ENSO cluster um, where the predictability is likely, I think, an aliasing of an interannual ENSO signal. Um, please, someone, if, if, if you have ideas about this, come and talk to me after. I'm not an ENSO expert, but I think this is what we're looking at for this one here. And then lastly, we have the North Atlantic subpolar gyre um, and predictability here is associated with the timescale of heat transport into the gyre from the subtropical Atlantic. Great, but we have these three other clusters, which um, are sort of, I haven't you know, quite figured out what's going on with these, but you know, we have this one cluster, which is sort of showing predictability, uh, sort of coherent predictability of around sort of Australia, New Zealand, and then around um, Northeast Atlantic Ocean. We have this sort of South Pacific to maybe Eastern Pacific and then coastal Indian Ocean cluster. And then we have this sort of subtropical cluster of um, subtropical Atlantic, subtropical North Pacific and subtropical Southern Indian Ocean. So I've got question marks next to all these because this is kind of interesting to me um, that we have these sort of clusters popping out um, where they sort of are predictable, these sort of remote basins are predictable at the same time. And I think this is a really sort of interesting avenue for some future work. Cool, so it's just some takeaways here. Um, decadal sea surface temperature trends can be predictable in the CESN2 large ensemble in the next 30 to 40 years. Um, internal variability is gonna to contribute to predictability of sea surface temperature trends, which is exciting. And lastly, predictability is associated with decadal scale processes in the North Atlantic and North Pacific oceans, which, you know, this is sort of what, what we've been saying for, for years, I think, but this is saying that in, in the next 30 years, this is we can still be possibly using this information for predictability. Um, and I'll finish there. Thank you. Are there any questions?
Jerry's got a question. Just out of curiosity. So you have this nice connection between the North Pacific and Tropical Pacific, and you think that the Tropical Pacific is some kind of modulation of ENSO variability, but why would you think that that's not connected to this PDO kind of stuff that's going on in the North Pacific? Yeah, so that's a that's a good question. So the the I use sort of a, a k-means clustering algorithm to make these clusters. So um, individually within the cluster, I think for sure there could be some PDO influence on um, on the predictability in those. Um, uh, the sort of analysis I've done on the ENSO clusters is to look at what is basically happening in all these boxes when they're all predictable. Um, and it does seem to be that what these, I guess what these boxes have in common is that it's um, predictability in ENSO, but that, yeah, that's definitely not to say that there would be possibly predictability from the PDO as well. Um, this figure here is showing the, um, on the right is the annual mean uh, NINO 3.4 index for sort of the best, most correct predictions in this cluster. And you sort of see this like um, sort of increasing El Nino like pattern here, which suddenly at year zero of our prediction immediately turns into a La Nina and then grows for the next 10 years. So I think this that's, yeah, like a, an aliasing of the ENSO signal. If people are interested, they can ask me about what I think it is. <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain. One more question. Yeah, so um, each, yeah, for each grid point, it gets the, the global map of sea surface temperature to make its prediction. All right, thank you. So we're going to move on to our last speaker, Evan Meeker. Hi everyone, thanks for sticking around to the end of the session. And I just wanna say that uh, all the talks so far have been incredible. So I hope I can uh, live up to, to the expectations that have been set here. Um, my name is Evan Meeker and I'm working with Elizabeth Maroon at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'd also like to thank Daniel Vimont, Luann Thompson and Steven Yeager for their contributions to this. And I'll be talking about the predictability of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, uh, looking at CESM Smile. So, Quickly, just what is the PDO? Um, I've taken a couple quotes from the Newman et al. paper here. Uh, so it was first introduced by Mantua et al. in 1997 and is the leading empirical orthogonal function of North Pacific sea surface temperature. And on the right, you can see the pattern. I, you've already seen it a couple of times, but it's this horseshoe pattern with positive anomalies along the coast and negative anomalies in the Central Pacific. The other thing I'd like to point out is that the PDO is a, defined as a statistical mode and it's not necessarily one uh, mode of oscillation, but rather a number of different physical processes. And uh, what's been found is that these processes can include random atmospheric forcing, cell connections from the tropical Pacific, specifically uh, involving ENSO, as well as uh, Rosby wave, oceanic Rosby waves and shifts in the, the uh, basin wide ocean gyre. So I'll be studying the PDO using uh, the seasonal to multi year large ensemble or smile prediction system. Uh, from Jaeger et al. 2022. And uh, this prediction system is a set of 24 month high cast simulations initialized quarterly from 1970 to 2019. Uh, each initialization is a 20 millimeter ensemble initialized with JRA 55 atmospheric forcing onto a forest ocean sea ice or FOSSI model. I'm drift correcting using a standard uh, 30 year drift climatology. I'll be assessing the prediction skill using anomaly correlation coefficient, with the, which we've seen a couple times already. Um, and I'll also be uh, performing simplified predictions of the PDO using extended first order autoregressive or AR1 models. And I'll, I'll say more on that later. 
So I'm sure everyone perfectly remembers my presentation from last year, uh, but just in case anyone's a little bit fuzzy, I'll give everyone a reminder. So I was looking at a very persistent marine heat wave in the Northeast Pacific, which has been nicknamed the blob. Um, and I was looking at whether or not that's predictable within the SMILE system. And what we found is that the peak magnitude of the blob in 2014 was not predictable by any member of SMILE initialized in 2013. Um, and the, the magnitude wasn't predicted and the pattern, was, the pattern of SST anomalies was also not predicted well. And in fact, at a year out, it was predicted worse than any other year in these 50 year starts. And when you go look at the spatial maps, you can see why. So on the right here, we have our, um, our observations or uh, our FOSI, which is a stand-in for our observations. And on the left, we have the ensemble mean of the November 2013 initialization. And on the right, you can see this evolution from uh, warm anomalies in the Central Pacific to about a year off. They've, they've moved along the coast and you have these cold anomalies replacing them. Uh, however, in the, in the prediction, we have the warm anomalies initialized correctly, but then really the prediction is just a continuation of these anomalies and maybe a slow drop of the magnitude. And when I was looking at this, it really looks to me like a pattern of the PDO that is being predicted here. And so that kind of led to a shift in this question of why doesn't the SMILE predict the spatial evolution of the blob can be rephrased as why doesn't SMILE predict a change in the sign of the PDO. For the rest of this talk, I'll focus more on the general case of that question and so I'll be asking, how skillful is the predictability of the PDO in SMILE? How do SMILE predictions perform compared to simpler models? And what are the sources and limitations of PDO predictability? So starting with the first question, to look at how the PDO performs in SMILE, first you have to calculate it in SMILE. And I'm showing here the uh, first EOF of sea surface temperatures um, on the bottom in observations and on the top in the FOSI PDO. And I just wanted to show this uh, to show that despite the fact that I'll be using the, the FOSI model, uh, we have a very high correlation uh, in the PDO index as well as the spatial pattern of the PDO between the observations. So we think this is a, a good estimation to use. So now that we've calculated the PDO index in uh, the FOSI, we need to calculate it in these hindcasts. But the problem is that the hindcasts are only 24 months long, which doesn't give us enough time to calculate the EOF on this, uh, for this pattern that has a relevant time scale that's much longer. So the solution is pretty simple and I wanted to show it here. And it's just to project the EOF that we ca calculated from the FOSI onto the Heinkast anomalies. And so here E is just your uh, eigenvector or your EOF and you project it onto our predictions, um, which gives you a uh, like pr principal component-esque time series that's only 24 months long, but it, it represents uh, it represents the PDO. And the nice thing about this is that you can take out the model drift before uh, doing this calculation so that all you're left with is the anomalies. And so how do we do? Uh, so here I'm showing the ensemble mean prediction for every initialization. Uh, I like to call this my spaghetti plot. And what we see is that uh, largely the PDO is following, or the PDO predicted in SMILE is following the sign of the PDO uh, in the observations. One exception to that, and I'll point out uh, related to what I was talking about the marine heat wave earlier, is that in 2013, 2014, we don't see a prediction of the change in sign of the PDO uh, even after the PDO is shifted. So even in the 2014, we, we see a, a decay wave from it. But for the most part, we're doing a good job. And like I said, we're, we're going to focus on the general case. So when we, when we shift our perspective and do anomaly correlation, uh, we see that in general, the PDO has a, a slow decorrelation with increasing lead months um, and uh, some seasonality, which I will uh, split these up to kind of point out. So there's a couple of interesting things that we see in the different initializations. Uh, the first one I point, want to point out is a increase in the rate of decorrelation uh, specifically from February to May. And it shows up more, most strongly in the February initializations, but in the February, August, and November start times, you see this uh, increase in decorrelation specifically during the boreal spring season. In contrast, you see a low rate of decorrelation between the months of May and November. And, and regardless of, again, regardless of whether or not you're, you're initializing in February or May, 
or August or November, you see during the same times of year, these increases or decreases in correlation are occurring. And so to answer the first question, uh, the, the PDO, uh, the predictability of PDO and SMILE is generally skillful with ACC values above 0 0.5 for leads up to 13 months and significant out to 24 months. Uh, there's also a seasonal dependence on the decorrelation rate, uh, faster in February to May and slower in May to November. So moving on to questions two and three, I'll be using the uh, AR1 models to, to look into this. So my, I, I'm going to compare to the SMILE predictions of the PDO. I'm going to do about as simple of a model of the PDO as you can get, which is just at the initialization date, I have a value for the PDO, and I'm going to take some regression coefficient times the PDO, and that's going to be my PDO at the next time step. And I'll keep doing that for 24 time steps, and that's going to be my prediction of the PDO. In the very simple case, uh, we're not going to have any other forcings, and so this is a, a deterministic prediction in which you just have an exponential decay towards the mean state. So how does this really simple uh, model of the PDO compared to our full smile predictions? Uh, pretty well, actually. And we see that generally you have the same, um, you have the same trend in anomaly correlation throughout the months. Uh, and you miss some of the seasonality here, but for the most part, the, the very simple case of the PDO is matching the Full smile prediction, which tells us that a lot of the predictability of the PDO in smile is just coming from the memory of the system. I also performed some uh, Monte Carlo analysis of this simple case to test whether or not uh, by adding noise you could get an increase in correlation. And we see that the deterministic uh, case tends to perform towards the top of that spread of members. And I performed this for all of my tests, but I will not show it in the future because this is the case for all of these tests. Okay, so I wanted to test, now, now that we've tested the memory of the system, I wanted to test uh, one of the other major sources of predictability uh, that's been shown to be in these systems, and that's El Nino. And the way that I did that is, again, very simple. I took my, my memory uh, model from the previous slide, and all I've done is I've added uh, some regression with the value of Nino 3.4 to it. And I do two different tests here. The first one, I will use the values of, ne of Nino 3.4 that are predicted by SMILE. So I will show the PDO at the initial time step and just the memory of that, but ENSO at every single time step that's predicted. And the second case I'll show is what I would call a perfect ENSO case. So the actual observed values of ENSO. So if we somehow manage to perfectly predict ENSO, how well would we do in predicting the PDO with this very simple model? So first we'll look at the model when we include SMILE ENSO. And what you can see is that we uh, retain a lot more of the seasonality uh, that, the, that the simple uh, AR1 process did not capture. And in fact, for the first year of this model, we're doing as well with my very simple case uh, as with the full, um, the full SMILE prediction of the PDO. And what that's telling you, what, when these ACC values are the same, it's telling you that pretty much all of the information of the value of the PDO is coming either from the memory of the system itself or from El Nino. And you start to see a drop off in the second year. And there, uh, there are a number of other processes, like I said earlier, uh, including uh, gyre shifts or Rosby waves in the ocean that, that could lead to more predictability uh, in the second year, as well as just uh, increasing error in our forecast of ENSO itself. In contrast, when I use the observed ENSO, what we see is that there's almost no change in the first year. So our ACC values are still matching what we're predicting for the PDO using SMILE. And in the second year, we see an increase. So there's a, it, it declines to around an ACC of 0.5 and then kind of levels off for that second year there. And the way that I'm interpreting this is that for the first year of this prediction, all of your information is coming from the, the memory of the system and the prediction of ENSO. And that we're predicting ENSO well enough that we are, even if we could perfectly predict uh, what's going on in the tropical Pacific, we wouldn't improve our prediction of the, of the PDO any farther. However, in the second year, you could kind of see this as an upper bound of predictability. Um, and you could think, 
I don't think that ENSO is always predictable out to two years, but there are some cases in which it is predictable. And in these cases, you might expect this to be how well you do in the PDO. Or just if you manage to improve our predictability uh, in future versions, say with the high res models or, or some more complicated process, you might be able to improve this prediction. So once again, just putting it all together, what we see is that the, uh, the PDO prediction is in SMILE for the first year is dominated by the memory of the system itself. Uh, so just that initial state of the PDO, as well as the information that you get from the tropical Pacific through El Nino. Um, in the second year, we see that our prediction lies somewhere between our uh, smile ENSO linear prediction and our perfect ENSO linear prediction, uh, and that you could think of that as an upper bound. So just one more time to reiterate, uh, how do smile predictions perform compared to simpler models? We see that smile scale is equal to or greater than AR1 prediction scale. Uh, in the AR1 plus ENSO model, we see that it performs as well as and captures the seasonality of smile prediction in the first year. And finally, the smile PDO predictions underperform a hypothetical perfect ENSO prediction. And what are the sources and limitations of predictability? The smile PDO prediction skill is dominated by memory and ENSO forcing in the first year, and improvements in ENSO prediction skill and or can condition dependent predictability could improve smile PDO skill in the second year. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions for Evan? Microphone, please. Um, this is a very good slide for my question. I'm actually comparing the two cases, AR1 plus ENSO and versus AR1. To me, it looks like for February and maybe also other months, adding this ENSO, predicted ENSO value to your model made things worse. So the memory, the initial conditions has more predictability than the case when you add ENSO. Yeah. How I'm, do you interpret that? I'm glad you asked and I noticed that as well. And so again, what what we're showing here is the, the memory of the system plus the, the Nino value that is predicted within SMILE. And so what I think is going on here, it has something to do with the predictability of ENSO itself. Um, and especially when you see these lines cross each other, it tends to be in those same times where I talked about that faster decorrelation rate. And so in the springtime, which uh, has been described in the literature as a spring predictability barrier, uh, we see that there is a quick decline in the predictability of El Nino. And I think that is, uh, that is causing this lack of, or that decrease in predictability of the PDO. Um, and you actually see that the pure memory case, especially in the, the February start, there, there are a number of months in the second year where if all you know is the PDO at the first time step, you actually do better than SMILE. Um, and it doesn't happen very often, but this is the one case where you do see it. Thanks, Evan, great talk. Um, you might've said, and maybe you could just reiterate if you did, but you showed at one point that um, your PDO time series wasn't predicted well for the 2014 transition associated with the blob. Yeah. Any ideas as to why SMILE particularly sucked then? So I do have some ideas and I, I haven't had the chance to go test this yet, but this is something I want to look into. And uh, what I would actually point out is there's a, there's a second time where the value of the PDO shifts relatively quickly. And that's uh, in the late 1990s. And this is associated with a very strong El Nino event that occurred around that time. And we see that in this case, the PDO, uh, even though the PDO is shifting relatively quickly here as well, the prediction follows that much better than it does in the other case. And the difference between the large climate state in these two scenarios is that in the 2013 to 2014 case, this large marine heat wave preceded a strong El Nino event versus in the 1990s, the, the change in sign of the PDO follows this very strong El Nino. So I think, again, it has to do with where this predictability is coming from. If you have a, a strong signal in the tropical Pacific that then translates up to the North Pacific, you'll have a better predictability versus something that might be caused by uh, internal variability or noisy atmospheric forcing uh, that then goes down into the tropical Pacific. All right, thank you very much, Evan. And let's give a round of applause for all of the speakers that we had today.
So we just have a few minutes left for questions. As at 5.15, all these rooms are gonna start getting transformed towards the evening sessions. So I think Steve had a couple of discussion items, so I'm gonna pass it over to him. Um, could I get some help? <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, we need you back, yeah, I, or Paul. <laughs> I don't really have anything. I, I, I was just going to go back to um, what I showed at the beginning, which is our list of uh, proposed simulations for uh, the Earth System Prediction Working Group and, and just get feedback from the working group um, as to what, what we should be spending our allocation on. So I guess one question would be, what are the group's priorities if we could reallocate some time from, from some simulations to another, if there are any specific simulations people would like to see done first or done that were not on the original list and the list is coming. Yeah, so we don't have to go through um, all of this in detail, but um, I guess the, the main takeaway is that um, we've got roughly um, 17 million core hours uh, uh, yet to spend in, in, our, in our year one. And um, some of that is earmarked, as I said, for extending the CSM2 to cable prediction, which uh, is a pretty expensive um extension at eight million core hours um but um i think we have we we put down some things in our in our um csl proposal that i'm not sure going to get done in particular this p9 the, this um, volcanic readiness exercise um that was going to be part of dcpp is is not going to be performed that's only half million core hours I'm not sure about the um, P3 land all but one initialization method. Do you know anything about that, Yaga? Yeah, that's the experiment Sanjeev proposed. Sanjeev, do you want to uh, say anything about that? Would you want to see that done, or would you rather see some other simulations with change, like land coupling strength, to get it at the issue of why are we not getting predictability from land? You can come up here too, as well as in the back. with respect to the uh, already the S2S uh, we are finding uh, yeah less impact of the land initialization so if, if there is a version of the model which so stronger land atmosphere coupling and if you can replace uh, uh, that model here then yeah that will help us to better understand why why we are not getting the impact of the land initialization. Okay, so basically there would be a proposal to rerun at least a portion of the S2S rehindcast suite with a changed um, land atmosphere coupling parameter, which we would need to get some guidance from someone in the land group, what exactly to set that to. Because right now, at least from Sanjeev's work, the soil moisture is predicting better when we initialize uh, realistically. But uh, if we initialize with climatology, our temperature and precipitation scale are just slightly better, which something is wrong in that system, so. Um, so I, I talked a little bit about this at the winter working group meeting, but I'll continue to beat this drum while I have a platform. Um, for some of these experiments, that all of these look really exciting, but um, I don't know if you're already planning to do so, but it would be great to get community involvement in deciding what out, what variables to output for these simulations. Um, I'm specifically thinking about the ocean because of a lot of um, forecasting systems don't output all of the ocean variables that we need to calculate some important parameters, things like upwelling, 
um, in a forecasting system. So it's, it's often we want to forecast things in the ocean, but we don't have behind cast systems to evaluate how well we can predict those things in the first place. Um, so I guess I would just encourage community involvement when deciding what output to save for some of these future runs that haven't been set yet. Um, so that's just a comment. And then I had a question. Um, we had seen some presentations throughout the day, um, and I'm kind of losing track on what which working groups were which at this point. Um, but are there plans for some higher resolution, um, either S2S or seasonal forecasting systems around? Speci I'm specifically thinking around CONUS um, because of that disconnect that we often get between um, the kinds of forecasts we get for the ocean and the resolutions at which we get them where we might get a seasonal forecast in the ocean that's at one degree, but really people that want to use these things want them at like a 10th degree, because that's the, the resolution that they're actually making decisions on. So I'll, I'll leave it there and open it for other comments. All right, so we'll put on the list getting, and I was seeing a lot of nods while you were talking about the output, so we'll make sure to collect that. Uh, regarding the high resolution. Yeah, so, I mean, a couple reactions. So there is a, um, uh, one of the funded, I guess, the funded SEMA proposals um, that was going to be led by Nick Davis was was designed to do just what you said, which is have a regionally refined CONUS prediction experiment, um, just case studies because it's too expensive to rerun the full set of S2S to compare to Yaga's suite. Um, I think that's still going to happen. I'm not really sure because Nick is leaving NCAR. Yeah, so we're looking into new co-leads, so perhaps either Andreas Prine or Judith Berner may be interested in jumping in, taking a greater role. But just to give you an idea, that project was just doing a couple of case studies, I believe five members times maybe two perturbation, that's already 20 million core hours. So just to give you a perspective, if we were in, those are just running like two or three dates. So that's where the high resolution is very much in our interest, but the computing is prohibitive. So. I guess through SEMA, we're going to start going towards it, but long way towards high resolution as to west forecasts. Yeah, and then the HRDP that I talked about, um, I think will be um, becoming available this year. Um, at least this initial set of start dates, it's, it's going to be expanded as Gokhan mentioned in his talk, but um, there should be um, Heincast shared this year, but I think the data distribution solution uh, has yet to be worked out for that. All right, so on that note, uh, Paul is telling me know that it's 5.15 and we're gonna have two evening sessions here. So one is uh, Gokhan just walked in, he's gonna lead the industry panel and then I'm gonna tell, uh, we're gonna have a session for the geoengineering simulations and a reception for everybody at 6.30. Uh, if you'd like to brainstorm with Steve, Steve is not going anywhere. He can hang out for a little longer <laughs> here or <laughs> elsewhere with some drinks. Uh, so if you have any additional comments, go talk to Steve. Um, and we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Bye.